You're listening to The Oath of the Vayuputras by Amish. To the late Dr. Manoj Vyas, my father-in-law, great men never die. They live on in the hearts of their followers. Har Har Mahadev, all of us are Mahadevs, all of us are gods. For his most magnificent temple, finest mosque and greatest church exist within our souls. The Shiva Trilogy Shiva, the Mahadev, the god of gods, destroyer of evil, passionate lover, fierce warrior, consummate dancer, charismatic leader, all-powerful yet incorruptible, quick of wit and of temper. No foreigner who came to India, be he conqueror, merchant, scholar, ruler, traveler, believed that such a great man could ever have existed in reality. They assumed he must have been a mythical god, a fantasy conjured within the realms of human imagination. And over time, sadly, this belief became our received wisdom. But what if we are wrong? What if Lord Shiva was not simply a figment of a rich imagination, but a person of flesh and blood like you and me? A man who rose to become godlike as the result of his karma. That is the premise of the Shiva trilogy, which attempts to interpret the rich mythological heritage of ancient India, blending fiction with historical fact. The Immortals of Meluha was the first book in a trilogy that chronicles the journey of this extraordinary hero. The story was continued in the second book, The Secret of the Nagas, and it will all end in the book that you are holding, The Oath of the Vayuputras. This is a fictional series that is a tribute to my god. I found him after spending many years in the wilderness of atheism. I hope you will find your god as well. It doesn't matter in what form we find him, so long as we do find him eventually. Whether he comes to us as Shiva, or Vishnu, or Shakti Ma, or Allah, or Jesus Christ, or Buddha, or any other of his myriad forms, he wants to help us. Let us allow him to do so. Yad yad karma karomi tatadhakalam shambho tavardharam My Lord Shambho, my Lord Shiva, every act of mine is a prayer in your honor. Acknowledgements I hadn't imagined I would ever become an author. The life that I live now, a life spent in pursuits like writing, praying, reading, debating and traveling, actually feels surreal at times. There are many who have made this dream possible, and I'd like to thank them. My Lord Shiva, my God, for bringing me back to a spiritual life. It is the biggest high possible. Neil, my son, a rejuvenating elixir, who would regularly come and ask me while I was obsessively writing this book. Dad, aapka ho gaya kya? Preeti, my wife. Bhavna, my sister. Himanshu, my brother-in-law. Anish and Ashish, my brothers. Donetta, my sister-in-law. They have worked so closely with me that many times I feel that it isn't just my book, but a joint project, which just happens to have my name on it. The rest of my family, Usha, Vinay, Mita, Sharnaz, Smita, Anuj and Ruta, for always being there for me. Sharvani Pandit, my editor. She has battled severe health troubles without asking for any sympathy. And despite the trying times she went through, she helped me fulfill my karma. I am lucky to have her. Rashmi Pusalkar, the designer of this book's cover. She's been a partner from the first book. In my humble opinion, she's one of the best book cover designers in Indian publishing. Gautam Padmanabhan, Satish Sundaram, Anushri Banerjee, Paul Vinay Kumar, Vipin Vijay, Renuka Chatterjee, Deepti Talwar, Krishna Kumar Nair and the fantastic team at Westland, my publishers. They have shown commitment and understanding that very few publishers show towards their authors. Anuj Bahari, my agent, a typical large-hearted boisterous Punjabi, a man brought to me by fate to help me achieve my dreams. Sangram Survey, Shalini Ayer and the team at Think Why Not, the advertising and digital marketing agency for the book. I have worked with many advertising agencies in my career including some of the biggest multinationals. Think Why Not ranks right up there amongst the best. Chandan Kauli, the photographer for the cover. 
He did a brilliant job as always. Also, Atul Pargahongar for fabricating the bow and arrow. Vinay Salonke for the makeup. Ketan Karande, the model. Jafet Batista for the concept art for the background. The Little Red Zombies team and Shing Lei Chua for support on 3D elements and scene setup. Sagar Pusalkar and team for the post-processing work on the images. Julian Dubois for coordinating production. I hope you like the cover they have created. I loved it. Omendu Prakash, Biju Gopal and Swapnil Patil for my photograph that has been printed in this book. Their composition was exceptional. The model regrettably left a lot to be desired. Chandramali Upadhyay, Shukantla Upadhyay and Vaid Shri Upadhyay from Benares. Santanu Ghoshroy and Sweta Basu Ghoshroy from Singapore for their hospitality while I wrote this book. Mohan Vijayan, a friend whose advice on media matters is something I always treasure. Rajesh Lalwani and the Blogworks team, a digital agency which works with my publisher for their strong support in an area I don't understand too well. Anuja Chaudhary and the Wizpeak team, the PR agency of my publisher for the effective campaigns they've implemented. Dr. Ramiya Karanjia for his immense help in understanding the philosophies of Zoroastrianism. Purnima, an old friend, for her impeccable legal advice. Caleb, a new friend, for working with me on my film deals. And last, but certainly not least, you, the reader. Thank you from the depths of my being for the support you've given to the first two books of the Shiva trilogy. I hope I can give you a sense of completion with this concluding book. Chapter 1 The Return of a Friend Before the beginning, blood dribbled into the water, creating unhurried ripples which expanded slowly to the edges of the cistern. Shiva bent over the container as he watched the rippling water distort his reflection. He dipped his hands in the water and splashed some on his face, washing off the blood and gore. Recently appointed chief of the Gunas, he was in a mountain village far from the comforts of the Mansarovar Lake. It had taken his tribe three weeks to get there, despite the punishing pace he had set. The cold was bone-chilling, but Shiva didn't even notice. Not because of the heat that emanated from the Pakriti huts that were being gutted by gigantic flames, but because of the fire that burned within. Shiva wiped his eyes and stared at his reflection in the water. Raw fury gripped him. Yahya, the Pakriti chieftain, had escaped. Shiva controlled his breathing, still recovering from the exhaustion of combat. He thought he saw his uncle, Manubhu's bloodied body in the water. Shiva reached out below the surface of the water with his hand. Uncle! The mirage vanished. Shiva squeezed his eyes shut. The macabre moment when he had found his uncle's body replayed in his mind. Manubhu had gone to discuss a peace treaty with Yakya, hoping the Pakritis and Gunas would end their incessant warmongering. When he hadn't returned at the appointed time, Shiva had sent out a search party. Manubhu's mutilated body, along with those of his bodyguards, had been found next to a goat trail on the way to the Pakriti village. A message had been written in blood on a rock next to where Manubhu had breathed his last. Shiva, forgive them. Forget them. Your only true enemy is evil. All that his uncle wanted was peace. And this is how they repaid him. Where's Yahya? Badra's scream broke Shiva's chain of thoughts. Shiva turned. The entire Pakriti village was up in flames. Some thirty dead bodies lay strewn across the clearing, brutally hacked by the enraged Gunas seeking vengeance for their former chief's death. Five Pakriti men knelt on the ground, tied together, a continuous rope binding their wrists and feet. Both ends of the rope had been hammered into the ground. The fierce Bhadra, bloodied sword in hand, led the twenty Guna guards. It was impossible for the Pakritis to escape. At a distance, another contingent of Guna warriors guarded the shackled Pakriti women and children, unharmed thus far. The Gunas never killed or even hurt women and children. Never. Where is Yakya? repeated Bhadra, pointing his sword menacingly at a Pakrati. We don't know, 
the pakrit answered i swear we don't know badra dug his sword point into the man's chest drawing blood answer and you shall have mercy all we want is yakya he will pay for killing monabu we didn't kill monabu i swear on all the mountain gods we didn't kill him badra kicked the pakrit hard don't lie to me you stinking asshole of a yak shiva turned away as his eyes scanned the forests beyond the clearing he closed his eyes he could still hear his uncle monabu's words echo in his ears anger is your enemy control it control it shiva took deep breaths as he tried to slow down his furiously pounding heart if you kill us yakya will come back and kill all of you screamed a pakrati at the end of the rope line you will never know peace we shall have the final vengeance shut up kaina shouted another pakrati before turning to bhadra release us we had nothing to do with it but the pakrati seemed to have come unhinged shiva shouted kaina shiva turned you should be ashamed to call monabhu your uncle roared kaina shut up kaina screamed all the other pakratis but kaina was beyond caring his intense loathing for the gunas had made him abandon his instinct for self-preservation that coward he spat monabhu bleated like a goat as we shoved his intestines and his peace treaty down his throat shiva's eyes widened as the rage bubbling under the surface broke through screaming at the top of his lungs he drew his sword and charged without breaking a step he swung viciously as he neared the pakrathis beheading kaina in one mighty blow the severed head smashed into the pakrathi beside him before ricocheting off to the distance shiva screamed bhadra they needed the pakrathis alive if they were to find yakya but bhadra was too disciplined a tribesman to state the obvious besides at that moment shiva didn't care he swirled smoothly swinging his sword again and again decapitating the next pakrathi and the next it was only a matter of moments before five beheaded pakrathi bodies lay in the mud their hearts still pumping blood out of their gaping necks making it pool around the bodies almost as though they lay in a lake of blood shiva breathed heavily as he stared at the dead his uncle's voice ringing loudly in his head anger is your enemy control it control it i have been waiting for you my friend said the teacher he was smiling his eyes moist i told you i would go anywhere for you even to patal lok if it would help you how often had shiva replayed these words uttered by the man who stood before him but he had never fully understood the reference to the land of the demons now it all fell into place the beard had been shaved replaced by a pencil thin mustache the broad shoulders and barrel chest were much better defined the man must be getting regular exercise the janehu the holy thread of brahmin identity was loosely slung over newly developed muscles the head remained shaven but the tuft of hair at the back of the head appeared longer and neater the deep set eyes had the same serenity that had drawn shiva to him earlier it was his long lost friend his comrade in arms his brother brahaspati it took you a very long time to find me brahaspati stepped close and embraced shiva have been waiting for you shiva hesitated for a moment before joyously embracing brahaspati allowing his emotions to take over but no sooner had he regained his composure than doubts started creeping into his mind braspati created the illusion of his death he allied with the nagas he destroyed his life's purpose the great mount mandar he was the suryavanshi mol my brother lied to me shiva stepped back silently he felt sati's hand on his shoulder in silent commiseration braspati turned to his students children could you please excuse us the students immediately rose and left the only people left in the room were shiva braspati sati ganesh and kali braspati stared at his friend waiting for the questions he could sense the hurt and anger in shiva's eyes why he asked i thought i would spare you the dreadful personal fate 
that is the inheritance of the Mahadevs. I try to do your task. One cannot fight evil and not have its claws leave terrible scars upon one's soul. I wanted to protect you. Shiva's eyes narrowed. Were you fighting evil all by yourself for more than five years? Evil is never in a rush, reasoned Brahaspati. It creeps up slowly. It doesn't hide, but confronts you in broad daylight. It gives decades of warnings, even centuries at times. Time is never the problem when you battle evil. The problem is the will to fight it. You say that you've been waiting for me, and yet you hid all traces of yourself. Why? I always trusted you, Shiva, said Brahaspati, but I could not trust all those who were around you. They would have prevented me from accomplishing my mission. I might even have been assassinated had they learned about my plans. My mission, I admit, prevailed over my love for you. It was only when you parted ways with them that I could meet you safely. That's a lie. You wanted to meet me because you needed me for the success of your mission. Because you now know you cannot accomplish it by yourself. Braspati smiled wanly. It was never meant to be my mission, great Nilkant. It was always yours. Shiva looked at Braspati, expressionless. You are partially right, said Braspati. I wanted to meet you. No, I needed to meet you. Because I have failed. Coin of good and evil is flipping over and India needs the Nilkant. It needs you, Shiva. Otherwise, evil will destroy this beautiful land of ours. Shiva, while continuing to stare non-committedly at Braspati, asked, The coin is flipping over, you say? Braspati nodded. Shiva remembered Lord Manu's words. Good and evil are two sides of the same coin. The Nilkant's eyes widened. The key question isn't, what is evil? The key question is, when does good become evil? When does the coin flip? Braspati continued to watch Shiva keenly. Lord Manu's rules were explicit. He could not suggest anything. The Mahadev had to discover and decide for himself. Shiva took a deep breath and ran his hand over his blue throat. It still felt intolerably cold. It seemed as if the journey would have to end where it had begun. What is the greatest good, the good that created this age? The answer was obvious, and therefore the greatest evil was exactly the same thing once it began to disturb the balance. Shiva looked at Braspati. Tell me why... Braspati remained silent, waiting. The question had to be more specific. Tell me why you think the Somras has tipped over from the greatest good to the greatest evil. Bits and pieces of the wreckage had been dutifully brought by the soldiers for examination by Parvateshwar and Bhagirath, who squatted at a distance. Shiva had asked the Meluhan general and the Ayodhyan prince to investigate the wreckage. They had been tasked with determining the antecedents of the men who had attacked their convoy on the way to Panchavati. Parvateshwar and Bhagirath had stayed behind with a hundred soldiers while the rest of Shiva's convoy had carried on to Panchavati. Parvateshwar glanced at Bhagirath and then turned back to the wooden planks. Slowly but surely, his worst fears were coming true. He turned to look at the hundred Suryavanshi soldiers who stood at a respectable distance as they had been instructed. He was relieved. It was best if they did not see what had been revealed. The rivets on the planks were clearly Meluhan. I hope Lord Ram has mercy on your soul, Emperor Daksh. He shook his head and sighed. Bhagirath turned towards Parvateshwar, frowning. What happened? Parvateshwar looked at Bhagirath, anger writ large on his face. Meluha has been let down. Its fair name has been tarnished forever. Tarnished by the one sworn to protect it. Bhagirath kept quiet. These ships were sent by Emperor Daksh, Parvadeshwar said softly. Bhagirath moved closer, his eyes showing disbelief. What? Why do you say that? These rivets are clearly Meluhan. These ships were built in my land. Bhagirath narrowed his eyes. 
she had noticed something completely different and was stunned by the general statement. Parvateshwar, look at the wood. Look at the casing around the edges. Parvateshwar frowned. He did not recognize the casing. It improves waterproofing in the joints, said Bhagirath. Parvateshwar looked at his brother-in-law, curious. This technology is from Ayodhya. Lord Ram be merciful. Yes, it looks like Emperor Daksh and my weakling father have formed an alliance against the Nilkant. Brigu, Daksh and Dilipa were in the Maluhan Emperor's private chambers in Devagiri. Dilipa and Brigu had arrived the previous day. Do you think they have succeeded in their mission, my lord? asked Dilipa. Daksha seemed remote and disinterested. He felt the intense pain of separation from his beloved daughter Sati. The terrible event at Kashi more than a year ago still haunted him. He had lost his child and with it all the love he ever felt in his heart. A few months ago, Priko had hatched a plan to assassinate the Nilkant along with his entire convoy en route to Panchavati. They had sent five ships up the Godavari River to first attack Shiva's convoy and then move on to destroy Panjavati as well. There were to be no survivors who would bear witness to what actually took place. Attacking an unprepared enemy was not unethical. In one fell swoop, all those inimical to them would be destroyed. But it was possible only if Daksh and Dilipa joined hands as they together had the means as well as the technology. The people of India would be told that the ghastly Nagas had lured the simple and trusting Nilkant to their city and assassinated him. Knowing the significance of simplicity in propaganda, Brigu had come up with a new title for Shiva, Bholenath, the simple one, the one who was easily misled. Laying the blame on the treachery of the Nagas and the simplicity of the Nilkant would mean that Daksh and Dilipa would be spared the backlash and the hatred for the Nagas would be strengthened manifold. Brigo glanced at Daksh briefly and then turned his attention back to Dilipa. The Saptrishi Uttradhikari seemed to place his trust in Dilipa more than the Meluhan now. They should have succeeded. We'll soon receive reports from the commander. Dilipa's face twitched. He took a deep breath to calm his nerves. I hope it is never revealed that we did this. The wrath of my people would be terrible. Killing the Nilkant with this subterfuge. Brigo interrupted Dilipa, his voice calm. He was not the Nilkant. He was an imposter. The Vayu Putra Council did not create him. It did not even recognize him. Dilipa frowned. He had always heard rumors, but had never really been sure as to whether the Vayu Putras the legendary tribe left behind by the previous Mahadev, Lord Rudra, actually existed. Then how did his throat turn blue? asked Dilipa. Brigu looked at Daksh and shook his head in exasperation. I don't know. It is a mystery. I knew the Vayuputra council had obviously not created a Nilkant, for they are still debating whether evil has arisen. Therefore, I did not object to the Emperor of Melua persisting with his search for the Nilkant. I knew there was no possibility of a Nilkant actually being discovered. Dilipa looked stunned. Imagine my surprise when this endeavor actually led them to an apparent Nilkant. But a blue throat did not mean that he was capable of being the savior. He had not been trained. He had not been educated for his task. He had not been appointed for it by the Vayuputra council. But Emperor Daksh felt he could control this simple tribal from Tibet and achieve his ambitions for Meluha. I made a mistake in trusting His Highness. Dilipa looked at Daksh, who did not respond to the barb. The Swadvipan Emperor turned back towards the great sage. In any case, evil will be destroyed when the Nagas are destroyed. Brigo frowned. Who oh, said the Nagas are evil? Tiripa looked at Brigo, nonplussed. Then what are you saying, my lord, that the Nagas can be our allies? 
Brigo smiled. The distance between evil and good is a vast expanse in which many can exist without being either, Your Highness. Dilipa nodded politely, not quite understanding Brigo's intellectual abstractions. Wisely, though, he kept his counsel. But the Nagas are on the wrong side, continued Brigo. Do you know why? Dilipa shook his head, thoroughly confused. Because they are against the great good. They are against the finest invention of Lord Brahma, the one that is the source of our country's greatness. This invention must be protected at all costs. Dilipa nodded in affirmation. Once again, he didn't understand Priku's words, but he knew better than to argue with the formidable Maharishi. He needed the medicines that Brigu provided. They kept him healthy and alive. We will continue to fight for India, said Brigu. I will not let anyone destroy the good that is at the heart of our land's greatness. Chapter 2. What is Evil? That the Somras has been the greatest good of our age is pretty obvious, said Braspati. It has shaped our age. Hence, it is equally obvious that someday it will become the greatest evil. The key question is, when will the transformation occur? Shiva, Sati, Kali and Ganesh were still in Braspati's classroom in Panchavati. Braspati had declared a holiday for the rest of the day so that their conversation could continue uninterrupted. The legendary five banyan trees, after which Panchavati had been named, were clearly visible from the classroom window. As far as I'm concerned, the Somras was evil the moment it was invented, spat out Kali. Shiva frowned at Kali and turned to Braspati. Go on. Any great invention has both positive and negative effects. As long as the positive outweighs the negative, one can safely continue to use it. The Somras created our way of life and has allowed us to live longer in healthy bodies. It has enabled great men to keep contributing towards the welfare of society longer than was ever possible in the past. At first, the Somras was restricted to Brahmins who were expected to use the longer, healthier life, almost a second life, for the benefit of society at large. Shiva nodded. He had heard this story from Daksh many years ago. Later, Lord Ram decreed that the benefits of the Somras should be available to all. Why should Brahmins have special privileges? Thereafter, the Somras was administered to the entire populace, resulting in huge progress in society as a whole. I know all about this, said Shiva. But when did the negative effects start becoming obvious? The first sign was the Nagas, said Praspati. There have always been Nagas in India, but they were usually Brahmins. For example, Ravan, Lord Ram's greatest foe, was a Naga and a Brahmin. Ravan was a Brahmin? asked a shocked Sati. Yes, he was, answered Kali, for every Naga knew his story. The son of a great sage, Vishrava. He was a benevolent ruler, a brilliant scholar, a fierce warrior and a staunch devotee of Lord Rudra. He had some faults, no doubt, but he wasn't evil personified as the people of the Sapt Sindhu would have us believe. In that case, do you people think less of Lord Ram? asked Sati. Of course not. Lord Ram was one of the greatest emperors ever. We worship him as the seventh Vishnu. His ideas, philosophies and laws are the foundation of the Naga way of life. His reign, Ram Rajya, will always be celebrated across India as the perfect way to run an empire. But you should know that it is believed by some that even Lord Ram did not see Ravan as pure evil. He respected his enemy. Sometimes there can be good people on both sides of a war. Shiva raised his hand to silence them and turned his attention back towards the Meluhan chief scientist. Praspati. So the Nagas, though small in number initially, were usually Brahmins, Praspati continued. But then, the Somras was used only by the Brahmins until then. Today, the connection seems obvious, but it didn't seem so at the time. 
The Somras created the Nagas? asked Shiva. Yes, this was discovered only a few centuries ago by the Nagas. I learnt it from them. We didn't discover it, said Kali. The Vayuputra council told us. The Vayuputra council? asked Shiva. Yes, continued Kali. The previous Mahadev, Lord Rudra, left behind a tribe called the Vayuputras. They live beyond the western borders in a land called Pareha, the land of the fairies. I know that, said Shiva, recalling one of his conversations with a Vasudev Pandit. But I hadn't heard of the council. Well, somebody needs to administer the tribe, and the Vayuputras are ruled by their council, which is headed by their chief, who is respected as a god. He is called Mitra. He is advised by the council of six wise people, collectively called the Amartya Shpand. The council controls the twin missions of the Vayuputras. Firstly, to help the next Vishnu whenever he appears. And secondly, have one of the Vayuputras trained and ready to become the next Mahadev when the time comes. Shiva raised his eyebrows. You obviously broke that rule, Shiva, said Kali. I'm sure the Vayuputra council must have been quite shocked when you appeared out of the blue, because quite clearly they did not create you. You mean, this is a controlled process? I don't know, said Kali, but your friends will know a lot more. The Vasudevs? Yes. Shiva frowned, reached for Sati's hand and then asked Kali, So, how did you find out about the Sombras creating the Nagas? Did the Vayuputras approach you? Or did you find them? I did not find them. The Naga king Vasuki was approached by them a few centuries ago. They suddenly appeared out of nowhere, lugging huge hordes of gold and offered to pay us an annual compensation. King Vasuki very rightly refused to accept the compensation without an explanation. And he was told that the Nagas were born with deformities as a result of the Somras. The Somras randomly has this impact on a few babies when in the womb, if the parents have been consuming it for a long period. Not all babies. A vast majority of babies are born without deformities. But a few unfortunate ones, like me, are born Naga. Why? I call it dumb luck, said Kali. But King Vasuki believed that the deformities caused by the Somras were the Almighty's way of punishing those souls who had committed sins in their previous births. Therefore, he accepted the pathetic explanation of the Vayuputra council along with their compensation. Mossi rejected the terms of the agreement with the Vayuputras the moment she ascended the throne, said Ganesh, referring to his aunt Kali. Why? I'm sure the gold could have been put to good use by your people, exclaimed Shiva. Kali laughed coldly. That gold was a mere palliative. Not for us, but for the Vayuputras. Its only purpose was to make them feel less guilty for the carnage being wrought upon us by the great invention that they protected. Shiva nodded, understanding her anger. He turned to Braspati. But how exactly is a Somras responsible for this? Braspati explained. We used to believe that the Somras blessed one with a long life by removing poisonous oxidants from one's body. But that is not the only way it works. Shiva and Sati leaned closer. It also operates at a more fundamental level. Our body is made up of millions of tiny living units called cells. These are the building blocks of life. Yes, I've heard of this from one of your scientists in Meluha, said Shiva. Then you'd know that these cells are the tiniest living beings. They combine to form organs, limbs and in fact the entire body. Right. These cells have the ability to divide and grow and each division is like a fresh birth. One old unhealthy cell magically transforms into two new healthy cells. As long as they keep dividing, they remain healthy. So your journey begins in your mother's womb as a single cell. That cell keeps dividing and growing till it eventually forms your entire body. Yes, said Sati, who had learnt all of this in the Meluha Gurukul. Obviously, said Braspati, this division and growth has to end sometime, otherwise one's body would keep growing continuously with pretty disastrous consequences. 
So the Almighty put a limit on the number of times a cell can divide. After that, the cell simply stops dividing further and thus, in effect, becomes old and unhealthy. And do these old cells make one's body age and thus eventually die? asked Shiva. Yes, every cell reaches its limit on the number of divisions at some point or the other. As more and more cells in the body hit that limit, one grows old and finally dies. Does the Somras remove this limit on division? Yes. Therefore, your cells keep dividing while remaining healthy. In most people, this continued division is regulated. But in a few, some cells lose control over their division process and keep growing at an exponential pace. This is cancer, isn't it? asked Sati. Yes, said Braspati. This cancer can sometimes lead to a painful death. But there are times when these cells continue to grow and appear as deformities, like extra arms or a very long nose. How polite and scientific, said a livid Kali. But one cannot even begin to imagine the physical pain and torture that we undergo as children when these outgrowths occur. Sati stretched out and held her sister's hand. Nagas are born with small outgrowths, which don't seem like much initially, but are actually harbingers of years of torture, continued Kali. It almost feels like a demon has taken over your body, and he's bursting out from within, slowly, over many years, causing soul-crushing pain that becomes your constant companion. Our bodies get twisted beyond recognition, so that by adolescence, when further growth finally stops, we're stuck with what Braspati politely calls deformities. I call it the wages of sins that we didn't even commit. We pay for the sins others commit by consuming the Somras. Shiva looked at the Naga queen with a sad smile. Kali's anger was justified. And the Nagas have suffered this for centuries? asked Shiva. Yes, said Braspati. As the number of people consuming the Somras grew, so did the number of Nagas. One will find that most of the Nagas are from Melua, for that is where the Somras is used most extensively. And what is the Vayuputra Council's view on this? I'm not sure, but from whatever little I know, the Vayuputra Council apparently believes that the Somras continues to create good in most areas where it's used. The suffering of the Nagas is collateral damage and has to be tolerated for the larger good. Bullshit! snorted Kali. Shiva could appreciate Kali's rage, but he was also aware of the enormous benefits of Somras over several millennia. On balance, was it still good? He turned to Braspati. Are there any other reasons for believing the Somras is evil? Consider this. We Maluhans choose to believe that the Saraswati is dying because of some devious Chandravanshi conspiracy. This is not true. We are actually killing our mother river all by ourselves. We use massive amounts of Saraswati waters to manufacture the Somras. It helps stabilize the mixture during processing. It is also used to churn the crushed branches of the Sanjeevani tree. I have conducted many experiments to see if water from any other source can be used, but it just doesn't do the trick. Does it really require that much water? Yes, Shiva. When Somras was being made for just a few thousand, the amount of Saraswati water used didn't matter. But when we started mass producing Somras for 8 million people, the dynamics changed. The water started getting depleted slowly by the giant manufacturing facility at Mount Mandar. The Saraswati has already stopped reaching the Western Sea. It now ends its journey in an inland delta, south of Rajasthan. The desertification of the land to the south of this delta is already complete. It's a matter of time before the entire river is completely destroyed. Can you imagine the impact on Meluha? On India? Saraswati is the mother of our entire Sapt-Sindhu civilization, said Sati, speaking of the land of the seven rivers. Yes, even our preeminent scripture, the Rig Veda, sings paeans to the Saraswati. It's not only the cradle, but also the lifeblood of our civilization. What will happen to our future generations without this great river? The Vedic way of life itself is at risk. What we are doing is taking away the lifeblood of our future progeny so that our present generation can revel in the luxury 
of living for two hundred years or more. Would it be so terrible if we live for only a hundred years instead? Shiva nodded. He could see the terrible side effects and the ecological destruction caused by the Somras. But he still couldn't see it as evil. An evil which left only one option, a Dharma Yud or a holy war to destroy it. What else? asked Shiva. The destruction of the Saraswati seems a small price to pay when compared to another, even more insidious impact of the Somras. Which is? The plague of Branka? asked a surprised Shiva. What does that have to do with the Somras? Branga had been suffering continuous plagues for many years, which had killed innumerable people, especially children. The primary relief thus far had been the medicine procured from the Nagas, or else exotic medicines extracted after killing the sacred peacock, leading to the Brangas being ostracized even in peace-loving cities like Kashi. Everything, said Braspati. The Somras is not only difficult to manufacture, but it also generates large amounts of toxic waste, a problem we have never truly tackled. It cannot be disposed of on land because it can poison entire districts through groundwater contamination. It cannot be discharged into the sea. The Somras waste reacts with salt water to disintegrate in a dangerously rapid and explosive manner. A thought entered Shiva's mind. Did Braspati accompany me to Karachapa for the first time to pick up seawater? Was that used to destroy Mount Mandar? Braspati continued. What seemed to work was fresh river water. When used to wash the Somras waste, over a period of several years, fresh water appeared to reduce its toxic strength. This was proven with some experiments at Mount Mandar. It seemed to work especially well with cold water. Ice was even better. Obviously, we could not use the rivers of India to wash the Somras waste in large quantities. We could have ended up poisoning our own people. Therefore, many decades ago, a plan was hatched to use the high mountain rivers in Tibet. They flow through uninhabited lands and their waters are almost ice cold. They would therefore work perfectly to clean out the Somras waste. There's a river high up in the Himalayas called Sangpo where Maluha decided to set up a giant waste treatment facility. Are you telling me that the Maluhans have come to my land before? Yes, in secret. But how can such large consignments be hidden? You've seen the quantity of Somras powder required to feed an entire city for a year. Ten small pouches are all it takes. It is converted into the Somras drink at designated temples across Maluha when mixed with water and other ingredients. So, even the waste amount is not huge. No, it isn't. It's a small quantity, making it easy to transport. But even that small quantity packs in a huge amount of poison. Hmm. So this waste facility was set up in Tibet? Yes. It was established in a completely desolate area along the Sangpo. The river flowed east, so it would go to relatively unpopulated lands away from India. Therefore, our land would not suffer from the harmful effects of the Somras. Shiva frowned. But what about the lands further ahead that the Sangpo flowed into? The eastern lands that lie beyond Swadweep? What about the Tibetan land around Sangpo itself? Wouldn't they have suffered due to the toxic waste? They may have, said Braspati. But that was considered acceptable collateral damage. The Maluhans kept track of the people living along the Sangpo. There were no outbreaks of disease, no sudden deformities. The icy river waters seemed to be working at keeping the toxins inactive. The Vayuputra Council was given these reports. Apparently, the council also sent scientists into the sparsely populated lands of Burma, which is to the east of Swadeep. It was believed the Sangpo flowed into those lands and became the main Burmese river, the Irrawaddy. Once again, there was no evidence of a sudden rise in diseases. Hence, it was concluded that we had found a way to rid ourselves of the Somras waste without harming anyone. When it was discovered that Sangpo means purifier in the local Tibetan tongue, it was considered a sign, a divine message, a solution had been found. This came down to the scientists of Mount Mandar as received wisdom as well.
What does this have to do with the Brangas? Well, you see, the upper regions of the Brahmaputra have never been mapped properly. It was simply assumed that the river comes from the east because it flows west into Branga. The Nagas, with the help of Parshuram, finally mapped the upper course of the Brahmaputra. It falls at almost calamitous speeds from the giant heights of the Himalayas into the plains of Branga through gorges that are sheer walls almost 2,000 meters high. 2,000 meters! gasped Shiva. You can well imagine that it is almost impossible to navigate a river course such as the Brahmaputra's. But Parshuram succeeded and led the Nagas along that path. Parshuram, of course, did not realize the significance of the discovery of the river's course. Queen Kali and Lord Ganesh did. Did you go up to the Brahmaputra as well? asked Shiva. Where does the river come from? Is it connected to the Sangpo in any way? Praswati smiled sadly. It is the Sangpo. What? The Sangpo flows east only for the duration of its course in Tibet. At the eastern extremities of the Himalayas, it takes a sharp turn, almost reversing its flow. It then starts moving southwest and crashes through massive gorges before emerging near Branga as the Brahmaputra. By the holy lake, said Shiva, the Brangas are being poisoned by the Somras waste. Exactly. The cold waters of the Sangpo dilute the poisonous impact to a degree. However, as the river enters India in the form of the Brahmaputra, the rising temperature reactivates the dormant toxin in the water. Though the Branga children also suffer from the same body-racking pain as the Nagas, they are free from deformities. Sadly, Branga also has a high incidence of cancer. Being highly populous, the number of deaths is simply unacceptable. Shiva began to connect the dots. Devadas told me the Branga plague peaks during the summer every year. That is the time when the ice melts faster in the Himalayas, making the poison flow out in larger quantities. Yes, said Braspati. That is exactly what happens. Obviously, since both the Nagas and Brangas are being poisoned by the same malevolence, our medicines work on the Brangas as well, Kali spoke up. So we send them our medicines to help ameliorate their suffering a little. Even though we told King Chandraketu how his kingdom was being poisoned, some Brangas prefer to believe that the plague strikes every year because of a curse that the Nagas have cast upon them. If only we were that powerful. But it appears that at least Chandraketu believes us. That is why he sends us men and gold regularly to stealthily attack Somra's manufacturing facilities, the root of all our problems. Evil should never be fought with subterfuge, Kali, said Shiva. It must be attacked openly. Kali was about to retort, but Shiva had turned back to Braspati. Why didn't you say something? Raise the issue in Meluha or with the Vayuputras. I did, said Braspati. I took up the matter with Emperor Daksh, but he doesn't really understand scientific things or involve himself with technical details. He turned to the one intellectual he trusts, the venerable royal priest, Rajguru Bhrigu. Lord Bhrigu seemed genuinely interested and took me to the Vayuputra council so I could present my case before them. But they were not at all supportive. This was where the issue was effectively killed. Nobody was willing to believe me about the source of the Brahmaputra. They also laughed when they heard that I was ostensibly listening to the Nagas. According to them, the Nagas were now ruled by an extremist harridan whose frustration with her own karma made everyone else the object of her ire. I'll take that as a compliment, said Kali. Shiva smiled at Kali before turning back to Braspati. But how did the Vayuputras rationalize what's happening in Branga? According to them, said Braspati, the Brangas were a rich but uncivilized lot with strange eating habits and disgusting customs. So the plague could have been caused by their bad practices and karma rather than the Somras. Remember, there is little sympathy for the Brangas amongst the Vayuputras because it is well known that they drink the blood of peacocks, a bird that is held holy by any follower of Lord Rudra. And you gave up? retorted Shiva. Shouldn't you have pressed on? Emperor Daksha is weak and can easily be influenced. He could have brought about changes in Meluha. 
the Vayuputra council does not govern your country. Well, there was a good reason for me to not persist with the argument. What reason? Tara, the woman I intended to marry, suddenly went missing, continued Braspati. The last time I saw her, she was in Pariha. On returning to Meluha, I received a letter from her, telling me that she was disappointed with my tirades against the Somras. I asked Lord Brigu to check with his friends in Pareha. I was told that she'd just disappeared. Shiva frowned. I know it sounds lame, said Braspati, but somewhere deep within, I do believe Tara was taken hostage. It was a message for me. Keep quiet or else. And you gave up, Shiva repeated. Why would you do that if you believed you were right? I didn't, continued Braspati defensively. But by then, I was losing credibility amongst the senior scientists of other realms. Had I made the issue any bigger within Meluha, I would have lost what little standing I have amongst the Surya Vanshis as well. I would have lost my ability to do anything at all. Though I knew I had to do something, I also realized that the strategy of open lobbying and debate had become counterproductive. There were too many vested interests tied into the Somras. Only the Vayuputra Council could have had the moral strength to stop it openly through the institution of the Nilkant. But they refused to believe that the Somras had turned evil. What happened thereafter? asked Shiva. I opted for silence, said Braspati, at least on the surface. But I had to do something. Maharishi Bhrigu was convinced there was nothing to fear from the Somras waste. So the manufacturing of Somras continued at the same frantic pace. The Saraswati kept getting prodigiously consumed. Somras waste was being generated in huge quantities. Since the empire now believed that cold fresh water had worked in disposing of the toxic waste, new plans were being drawn up to use other rivers. This time the idea was to use the upper reaches of either the Indus or the Ganga. Lord Ram, be merciful, whispered Shiva. Millions of lives would have been at risk. We were going to unleash toxic waste right through the heart of India. Almost as a message from the Paramatma, the ultimate soul. I was approached by Lord Ganesh around this time. He had formulated a plan, and I must admit his words made eminent sense. There could only be one possible solution. The destruction of Mount Mandar. Without Mount Mandar, there would be no Somras. And with the Somras gone, all these problems would disappear too. Shiva cast a quick look towards Sati. Whatever little doubts I may have had, said Braspati, disappeared when I was confronted with a new scenario. When it happened, I knew in my heart that it was time for the destruction of evil. What new scenario? asked Shiva. You appeared on the scene, answered Braspati. Even without the Vayuputra council's permission, Perhaps even without their knowledge, the Nilkant had appeared. It was a final sign for me. The time to destroy evil was upon us. Vishwadhumna quickly gave hand signals to his Branga soldiers. The hunting party went down on their knees. Karthik, who was right behind Vishwadhumna, whistled softly as his eyes lit up. Magnificent! Vishwadhyumna turned towards Karthik. While most of Shiva's convoy was settling itself into the visitor's camp outside Panchavati, a few hunting parties had been sent out to gather meat for the large entourage. Karthik, having proved himself as an accomplished hunter throughout the journey to Panchavati, was the natural leader of one of the groups. Vishwadhyumna had accompanied the son of the Nilgant. He intensely admired the fierce warrior skills of Karthik. It's a rhinoceros, my lord, said Vishwadumna softly. The rhinoceros was a massive animal, nearly four meters in length. It had bumpy brownish skin that hung over its body in multiple layers, suggestive of tough armor. Its most distinctive feature was its nasal horn, which stuck out like a fearsome offensive weapon to a height of nearly 50 centimeters. I know, whispered Karthik. They live around Kashi as well. They're nearly as big as a small elephant. These beasts have terrible eyesight, but they have a fantastic sense of smell and hearing. Vishwadhumna nodded at Karthik, impressed. 
What do you propose, my lord? The rhinoceros was a tricky beast to hunt. They were quiet animals who kept themselves, but if threatened, they could charge wildly. Few could survive a direct blow from their massive body and terrifying horn. Kartik reached over his shoulder and drew out the two swords sheathed on his back. In his left hand was a short twin blade, like the one his elder brother Ganesh favored. In his right was a heavier one with a curved blade, which was certainly not appropriate for thrusting. This weapon was perfect for swinging and slashing, a style of fighting Karthik excelled at. Karthik spoke softly. Fire arrows at its back. Make as much noise as you can. I want you to drive it forward. Vishwadumna's eyes filled with terror. That is not wise, my lord. This animal is huge. Too many soldiers charging in will cramp us. All it would need to do is swing its mighty horn and it would cause several casualties. But we can fire arrows to kill it from a distance. Karthik raised his eyebrows. Vishwadumna, you should know better. Do you really think our arrows can actually penetrate deep enough to cause serious damage? It's not the arrows, but the noise that you will create which will make it charge. Vishwadumna continued to stare, still unsure. Also, it's standing upwind and your positioning behind it would be perfect. Along with the noise, the stench of your soldiers will also drive the animal forward. It's a good thing they haven't bathed in two days, said Karthik, without any hint of a smile at the joke. Like all warriors, Vishwadumna admired humor in the face of danger. But he checked his smile, not sure if Karthik was joking. What will you do, my lord? Karthik whispered, I'll kill the beast. Seeing this, Karthik slowly edged forward, right onto the path that the bull would charge on when attacked by Vishwadumna's soldiers. The soldiers, meanwhile, moved upwind behind the rhinoceros. Having reached his position, Karthik whistled softly. Now! shouted Vishwadumna. A volley of arrows attacked the animal as the soldiers began to scream loudly. The rhinoceros raised its head, ears twitching as the arrows bounced harmlessly off its skin. As the soldiers drew closer, some of the missiles managed to penetrate enough to agitate the beast. The animal snorted mightily and stomped the dirt, radiating strength and power as light gleamed off its tiny black eyes. It lowered its head and charged, its feet thundering against the ground. Kartek was in position. The beast only had side vision and could not see straight ahead. Therefore, it was no surprise that it crashed into an overhanging branch in its path, which made it change its direction slightly. At which point, it saw Kartek standing to its right. The furious rhinoceros bellowed loudly, changed course back to the original path, and charged straight towards the diminutive son of Shiva. Kartek remained stationary and calm, with his eyes focused on the beast. His breathing was regular and deep. He knew that the rhinoceros couldn't see him since he stood straight ahead. The animal was running, guided by the memory of where it had seen Karthik last. Vishwadumna fired arrows into the animal rapidly, hoping to slow it down. But the thick hide of the beast ensured that the arrows did not make too much of a difference. It was running straight towards Karthik. Yet Karthik didn't move or flinch. Vishwadumna could see the boy warrior holding his swords lightly. That was completely wrong for a stabbing action, where the blade needs to be firmly held. The weapon would just fall out of his hands the moment he thrust forward. Just when it appeared that he was about to be trampled underfoot, Karthik bent low and, with lightning speed, rolled towards the left. As the rhinoceros continued running, he slashed out his left sword first, pressing the lever on the hilt as he swung. One of the twin blades extended out of the other, slicing through the front thigh of the beast, cutting through muscles and veins. As blood spurted rapidly, the animal's injured leg collapsed from under it, and it grunted, confused, trying to put weight on the appendage, now flopping uselessly against its belly. Admirably, it still continued its charge, its three good legs heaving against its bulk, as it struggled to turn and face its attacker. Karthik ran forward, following the movement of the animal, now circling in from behind the beast. He hacked brutally with his right hand, which held the killer curved sword. The blade sliced through the thigh of the hind leg, 
cutting down to the bone with its deep curvature and broad metal. With both its right legs incapacitated, the rhinoceros collapsed to the ground, rolling sideways as it tried to stand with only two good legs, writhing in pain. Its blood mixed with the dusty earth to make a dark red-brown mud that smeared across its body as it flailed against the ground, panting in fear. Karthik stood quietly at a short distance, watching the animal in its final throes. Vishwadham now watched from behind, his mouth agape. He had never seen an animal brought down with such skill and speed. Karthik approached the rhinoceros calmly. Even though immobilized, the beast reared its head menacingly at him, grunting and whining in a high-pitched squeal. Karthik maintained a safe distance as the other soldiers rapidly ran up to him. The son of the Nilkant bowed low to the animal. Forgive me, magnificent beast. I am only doing my duty. I will finish this soon. Suddenly, Karthik moved forward and stabbed hard, right through the folds of the rhinoceros's skin, plunging deep into the beast's heart, feeling the shudder go through its body, until at last it was still. My lord, a bird courier has just arrived with a message for your eyes only, said Kanakla, the Maluhan Prime Minister. That's why I brought it personally. Daksha occupied his private chambers, a worried Virini seated beside him. He took the letter from Kanakla and dismissed her. With a polite namaste towards her emperor and empress, Kanakla turned to leave. Glancing back, she glimpsed a rare intimate moment between them as they held each other's hands. The last few months had inured her to the strange goings-on in Maluha. Daksha's past betrayal of Sati during her first pregnancy had shocked her enormously. Kanakla had lost all respect for her emperor. She continued with her job because she remained loyal to Maluha. She had even stopped questioning the strange orders from her lord, like the one he'd given the previous day about making arrangements for Brigu and Dilipa to travel to the ruins of Mount Mandar. She could understand Maharishi Brigu's interest in going there, but what earthly reason could there be for the Sudipan emperor to go as well? Kanakla saw Daksha letting go of Virini's hand and breaking the seal of the letter as she shut the door quietly behind her. Daksha began to cry. Virini immediately reached over and snatched the letter from him. As she read through it quickly, Virini let out a deep sigh of relief as tears escaped from her eyes. She's safe. They're all safe. On the surface, the plan to assassinate the Nirgant worked towards the unique interests of all the three main conspirators, Maharishi Brigu, Emperor Daksha, and Emperor Dilipa. For Brigu, the greatest gain would be that the Sumras would not be targeted by the Nilkant. The faith of the people in the legend of the Nilkant was strong. If the Nilkant declared that the Somras was evil and decided to tow the Naga line, so would his followers. For Dilipa, it meant the killing of two birds with a single stone. Not only would he continue to receive the elixir from Brigu, but he'd also do away with Bhagirath, his heir and greatest threat. Daksha would be rid of the troublesome Nilkant and be able to blame all ills on the Nagas once again. The plan was perfect, except that Daksha could not countenance the killing of his daughter. He was willing to put everything on the line to ensure that Sati was left unharmed. Brigu and Dilipa had hoped that with the rupture in relations between Daksha and his daughter, the Maluhan Emperor would support this mission wholeheartedly. They were wrong. Daksha's love for Sati was deeper than his hatred for Shiva. Upon Virini's advice, Daksha had sent the Arishtanemi brigadier, Maya Shrenik, known for his blind loyalty to Maluha and deep devotion to the Nilkant, on a secret mission. Maya Shrenik was to accompany the five ships that had been sent to attack the Nilkant's convoy. Virini had covertly kept in touch with her daughter Kali through all these years of strife and had made Daksha aware of the river warning and defense system of the Nagas. All that had to be done was to get the alarm triggered in time. Maya Shrenik's mission was to ensure that the alarms went off. He was to escape and return to Meluha after that. The Arishtanemi brigadier, an acting general of the Meluhan army, had carried a homing pigeon with him to deliver the news of the subsequent battle to Daksha. The happy message for the Maluhan Emperor 
was that the progeny Daksh cared for, Sati and Karthik, were alive and safe. Virini looked at her husband. If only you would listen to me a bit more. Daksh breathed deeply. If Lord Bhrigu ever finds out, would you rather your children were dead? Daksh sighed. He would do anything to ensure Sati's safety. He shook his head. No, then thank the Paramatma that our plan worked and never breathe a word of this to anyone, ever. Daksh nodded. He took the letter from Virini and set it aflame, holding it by the edge for as long as possible to ensure that every part of it had charred beyond recognition. Chapter 3 The Kings Have Chosen Do you believe Braspati? asked Shiva. Night had fallen on the Panchvadi guest colony just outside the main city. Injured and fatigued, Shiva's entourage had retired to their quarters for a well-deserved rest. Sati and Shiva were in their chambers, having just returned from the city. They had not spoken to a soul about what they'd learned at the Panchvadi school. They had not even told the Suryavanshis that Braspati, their beloved chief scientist, was still alive. They were to meet him again the next day. Well, I don't think Braspati ji is lying, said Sati. I do remember that more than two decades ago, Lord Bhrigu had spent many months in Devagiri, which was highly unusual for the Raj Guru. He's a rare sight in Maluha, since he usually chooses to spend his time meditating in his Himalayan cave. Aren't Raj Gurus supposed to stay in the royal palace and guide the kings? Not someone like Lord Bhrigu. He helped my father get elected as emperor because he believed my father would be good for Miluha. Beyond that, Lord Bhrigu has had no interest in the day-to-day -day governance of Miluha. He is a simple man, rarely seen in the so-called powerful circles. So, he spent a lot of time in Devagiri. That may have been unusual, but what about the other things that Braspati said? Well, Lord Bhrigu, my father and Braspati ji were indeed away for many months. It had been announced as an important trade trip. But I can't imagine Lord Bhrigu or Braspati ji being interested in trade. Perhaps they were in Pareha at the time. And yes, the talented and lovely Taraji, who worked at Mount Mandar and had been sent to Pareha for a project, did disappear suddenly. It was announced that she had taken sannyas. Renouncing public life is very common in Maluha. But what Braspati ji revealed today was something else altogether. So, you believe Braspati speaks the truth? All I'm saying is that Braspati ji may believe this to be the truth. But is it actually so or is he mistaken? This decision of yours can change the course of history. What you do now will have repercussions for generations to come. It's a momentous occasion, a big battle. You have to be completely sure. I must speak with the Vasudevs. You must. But that is not all you wanted to say to me, is it? I think there is another aspect to be considered. What made Braspatiji disappear for over five years? What was he doing in Panchavati all this while? I feel this is an important question, perhaps linked to the backup manufacturing facility for the Somras that father had told me about. Yes, I didn't give it much importance then. But if the Somras is evil, that facility is the key. Actually, the Saraswati is the key. A manufacturing facility can always be rebuilt. But wherever it is built, it will always need the Saraswati waters. Kali told me at Chavar that her people attacked Maluhan temples and Brahmins only if they were directly harming the Nagas. Maybe those temples were production centers that used the powder from Mount Mandar to manufacture the Somra's drink for the locals. She also said that a final solution would emerge from the Saraswati, that the Nagas were working on it. I don't know what that cryptic statement meant. We need to find out. You did not tell me about your conversation with Kali. Shiva, this is the first honest conversation we are having about Kali and Ganesh since you met my son at Kashi. Shiva became quiet. I'm not blaming you, continued Sati. I understood your anger. You thought that Ganesh had killed Braspatiji. Now that the truth has emerged, you're willing to listen. 
Shiva smiled and embraced Sati. Are you sure? asked Sati. It was late the next morning, four hours into the second Prahar. Shiva sat with Sati at his side in his private chambers. Parvateshwar and Bhagirath stood in front, holding a plank. The Maluhan general and the Ayodhyan prince had just returned after surveying the destroyed battleships. Yes, my lord, the evidence is indisputable, said Bhagirath. Show me. Bhagirath stepped forward. The rivets on the planks are clearly Maluhan. Lord Parvateshwar has identified them. Parvateshwar nodded in agreement. And the casing, continued Bhagirath, that improves the waterproofing is clearly a Yodhyan. Are you suggesting that Emperor Daksh and Emperor Dilipa have formed an alliance against us? Shiva asked softly. They've used the best technologies available in both our lands. These ships have navigated through a lot of seawater. Judging by the mollusks on them, they needed the best to be able to make the journey quickly. Shiva breathed deeply, lost in thought. My lord, said Bhagirath, for all his faults, I cannot imagine my father would be capable of leading a conspiracy such as this. He simply does not have the capability. He's just a follower in this plot. You have to target him, of course, but don't make the mistake of thinking that he is the main conspirator. He's not. Sati leaned towards Shiva. Do you think my father can do this? Shiva shook his head. No, Emperor Daksh too is incapable of leading this conspiracy. Parvateshwar, still shamefaced at the dishonor brought upon his empire, said quietly, The Maluhan Code enjoins upon us to follow the rules, my lord. Our rules bid us to carry out our king's orders. In the hands of a lesser king, this can lead to a lot of wrong. Emperor Daksh may have issued the orders, Parvateshwar, said Shiva. But he didn't dream them up. There is a master who has brought the royalty of Maluha and Swadweep together. Someone who also managed to procure the feared Devi Astras. Heaven alone knows if he has any more divine weapons. It was a brilliant plan. By Lord Ram's grace, we were saved by the skin of our teeth. It cannot be Emperor Daksh or Emperor Dilipa. This is someone of far greater importance, intelligence and resource and one who is clever enough to conceal his identity. Return to Meluha? asked Veerbhadra. Veerbhadra and Kritika were in Shiva's private chambers. Kali and Sati were also present. Yes, Bhadra, said Shiva. It was the Meluhans and the Ayodhyans who attacked us together. Are you sure Meluha is involved? asked Veerbhadra. Parvateshwar himself has confirmed it. And now you are worried about our people. Yes, said Shiva. I'm worried the Gunas will be arrested and held hostage as leverage over us. Before they do so, I want you to slip into Maluha quietly and take our people to Kashi. I will meet you there. My scouts will guide Kritika and you through a secret route, said Kali. Using our fastest horses and speediest boats, my people can get you close to Maika in two weeks. After that, you're on your own. Meluha is safe country to travel in, said Kritika. We can hire fast horses up to the mouth of the Saraswati. After that, we can travel on boats plying on the river. It's an easy route. With luck, we will reach Devagiri in another two weeks. The Gunas are in a small village not far from there. Perfect, said Shiva. Time is of the essence. Go now. Yes, Shiva, said Veerbhadra as he turned to leave with his wife. And Bhadra, said Shiva. Veerbhadra and Kritika turned around. Don't try to be brave, said Shiva. If the Gunas have been arrested already, leave Meluha quickly and wait for me at Kashi. Veerbhadra's mother was with the Gunas. Shiva knew Veerbhadra would not abandon her to her fate so easily. Shiva, whispered Veerbhadra. Shiva got up and held Veerbhadra's shoulders. Bhadra, promise me. Veerbhadra remained quiet. If you try to release them by yourself, You'll be killed. You will be of no use to your mother if you are dead, Bhadra. Veerbhadra stayed silent. I promise you, nothing will happen to the Gunas. If you cannot get them out, I will. But do not do anything rash. Promise me. Veerbhadra placed his hand on Shiva's shoulder. There is something you aren't telling me. What have you discovered here? Why are you so afraid suddenly? Is there going to be a war? Is Meluha going to become our enemy? 
I'm not sure, Padra. I haven't made up my mind as yet. Then tell me what you do know. It was Shiva's turn to remain silent now. I'm going back to Meluha, Shiva. Had you asked me a month back, I would have said this would be the safest journey possible. A lot has changed since then. You have to tell me the truth. I deserve that. Shiva sat them down and revealed everything he had discovered during the course of the last few days. And you killed a rhino all by yourself? asked an impressed Anandmai. Her face fused with a broad smile. Yes, your highness, said Karthik, stoic and expressionless as usual. Anandmai, Ayurvedi and Karthik were settled comfortably on soft cushions in the dining room. Kshatriya in word and deed, Anandmai and Karthik partook of the delicious rhinoceros meat. The Brahmin Ayurvedi restricted herself to roti, dal and vegetables. Have you decided to stop smiling altogether? asked Anandamai. Or is this just temporary? Karthik looked up at Anandamai, a hint of a smile on his face. Smiling takes more effort than it's worth, your highness. Ayurvati shook her head. You're just a child, Karthik. Don't trouble yourself so much. You need to enjoy your childhood. Karthik turned to the Meluhan chief physician. My brother Ganesh is a great man, Ayurvati ji. He has so much to contribute to society, to the country. And yet, he was almost eaten alive by dumb beasts because he was trying to save me. Ayurvati reached across and patted Karthik. I will never be so helpless again, swore Karthik. I will not be the cause of my family's misery. The door swung open. Parvateshwar and Bhagirath walked in. Just by looking at them, Anandamai could tell that they had discovered what she feared. Was it Meluha? Ayurvati winced. She could not imagine her great country's name being dragged into a vile conspiracy like the attack on the Nilkant's convoy at the outskirts of Panchvati. And yet, after what she discovered of Emperor Daksha's perfidy during Sati's pregnancy at Maika, she would not be surprised if Meluhan ships had carried out this dastardly act. It's worse, sighed Bhagirath as he sat down. Parvateshwar sat next to Anandamai and held her hand. He looked at Ayurvati, his pained expression bearing witness to his stark misery. The general prized his country, his Maluha, as Lord Ram's ultimate legacy. It was the custodian of Ram Rajya. How could this great country's emperor have committed such a dastardly act such as this? Even worse? prompted Anandamai. Yes, it seems Swadeep is in on the conspiracy as well. Anandamai was stunned. What? It's either only Ayodhya or all of Swadeep. I cannot be sure if other kingdoms of Swadeep are following Ayodhya's lead. But Ayodhya is certainly involved. Anandamai looked at Parvateshwar. He nodded, confirming Bhagirath's words. Lord Rutra being merciful, said Anandamai. What is wrong with father? I for one am not surprised, said Bhagirath, barely able to conceal his contempt. He's weak and gets easily exploited. It doesn't take much for him to succumb. For once, Arandamai didn't rebuke her brother for denigrating their father. She looked at Parvateshwar. He seemed lost and unsure. Change was horrible for the Suryavanshis, for the people of the masculine used as they were to unchanging rules and stark predictability. Anandamai turned her husband's face towards herself and kissed him gently, reassuringly. She smiled warmly. He half smiled back. Karthik quietly put his plate down, washed his hands and walked out of the room. It was early afternoon as Karthik and Ganesh's steps led them around the five banyan trees from whose existence Panchavati derived its name. Non-Nagas were not allowed inside the inner city. In truth, many of them, Brangas included, refused to enter due to a strong superstition about the misfortune that would befall those who did. But the Nilkant's family did not believe in it. And anyway, nobody wanted to enforce an entry ban on them. Why have only Lord Ram's idols been depicted on these trees, Dada? Karthik asked his elder brother. You mean why have his wife, Lady Sita, and his brother, Lord Lakshman, not been shown? Not just them. Even his greatest devotee, Lord Hanuman, is missing. Ganesh and Karthik were admiring the beautiful idols of Lord Ram sculpted into the main trunk of each of the five banyans. The five tree idols showed the ancient king, respected as the seventh Vishnu, in the five different roles of his life known to all. A son, a husband, a brother, a father and a godly king. Each banyan trunk 
depicted him in a different form. In each form, in a manner that somehow appeared natural, the sculptors had made the idols look towards the temple of Lord Rudra and Lady Mohini at one corner of the square. Their idols, on the other hand, were placed in the front section of the temple, as opposed to the back as in most temples, with the effect that the two deities appeared to be looking at all five tree idols as well. It seemed as if the architects intended to show the great Mahadev and the noble seventh Vishnu being respectful to each other. It is in keeping with Bhumi Devi's instructions, answered Ganesh. I know his traditional depiction in the Sat Sindhu is always along with his three favorite people in the world, Lady Sita, Lord Lakshman and Lord Hanuman. But it was an order of Bhumi Devi, our founding goddess, that Lord Ram always be shown alone in Panjavati, especially at the five banyans. Why? I don't know. Perhaps you wanted us to always remember that great leaders like the Vishnus and the Mahadevs may have millions following them. But at the end of the day, they carry the burden of their mission alone. Like Baba? asked Karthik, referring to their father. Yes, like Baba. He is the one who stands between evil and India. If he fails, life in the subcontinent will be destroyed by evil. Baba will not fail. Ganesh smiled at Karthik's response. Do you know why? asked Karthik. Ganesh shook his head. No, why? Karthik clasped Ganesh's right hand and held it to his chest, like the brother warriors of yore. Because he is not alone. Ganesh smiled and embraced Karthik. They walked silently around the banyan trees, doing the holy parikrama of Lord Ram's idols. What is going on, Dada? asked Karthik as they continued their circumambulation. Ganesh frowned. Why have both the emperors allied against Baba? Ganesh breathed deeply. He never lied to Karthik. He considered his brother an adult and treated him as such. Because Baba threatens them, Karthik. They are the elite. They are addicted to the benefits they derive from evil. Baba's mission is to fight for the oppressed, to be the voice of the voiceless. It is obvious that the elite will want to stop him. What is the evil that Baba is fighting? How has it entrenched its claws so deeply? Ganesh took Karthik by the hand and made him sit at the foot of one of the banyans. This is for you alone, Karthik. You are not to tell anyone else, for it is Baba's right to decide when and how others are to be informed. Karthik nodded in response. Ganesh sat next to Karthik and explained to him about what Brahaspati and Shiva had discussed the previous day. What have you been doing these past five years, Brahaspati? asked Shiva. Sati and Shiva had joined the chief scientist to the Daga Queen's chambers. Brahaspati felt like he was being interrogated, but he could understand Shiva's need to get to the bottom of the issue. I was trying to find a permanent solution to the Somras problem answered Braspati. Permanent solution? Destroying Mount Mandar is a temporary solution. We know it will get rebuilt. The Nagas tell me the reconstruction has been surprisingly slow. It shouldn't have taken five years, not with Meluhan efficiency, but it's only a matter of time before it gets rebuilt. Shiva looked at Sati, but she didn't say anything. Once Mandar is back to full manufacturing capacity, the destruction of the Saraswati and the production of the toxic waste will begin in large measure once again. So we have to find a permanent solution. The best way to do that is to examine the Somras' ingredients. If we can somehow control that, we could possibly control the poisonous impact of the Somras waste. Many ingredients can be easily replaced, but two of them cannot. The first are the bark and branches of the Sanjeevni tree, and the second is the Saraswati water. We cannot control the availability of the Sanjeevni tree. Meluha has large plantations of it across its northern reaches. How many plantations can one destroy? Besides, trees can always be replanted. That brings us to the Saraswati. Can we somehow control its waters? Shiva remembered parts of a conversation with Daksha when he had first arrived in Devagiri. I was told by Emperor Daksha that the Chandravanshis did try to destroy the Saraswati more than a hundred years ago by taking one of its main tributaries, the Yamuna, away from it and redirecting its flow towards the Ganga. It didn't really make much sense to me, but the Meluhans seemed to believe it. Braspati sniggered. The Chandravanshi ruling class cannot even build roads in their own empire. How can anyone think that they would have the ability to change the course of a river? 
What happened a hundred years ago was an earthquake that changed the course of the Yamuna. The Maluhans subsequently defeated the Chandravanshis and the resultant treaty mandated that the early course of the Yamuna would become no man's land. And Maluhans do have the technology to change the course of rivers. They built giant embankments to block and change the course of the Yamuna to make it flow back into the Saraswati. So what was your plan? Destroy the Yamuna embankments? No, I had considered it, but that is impossible as well. They have many fail-safe options. It would take five brigades and months of open work to be able to destroy those embankments. We would obviously have had to work in secret with a small number of people. So, what was your plan? An alternative. We cannot take the Saraswati away. But could we make the Saraswati much less potent in the production of the Somras? Is it possible to add something to the Yamuna waters at its source, which would then flow into the Saraswati and control the amount of waste being produced? I thought that we had found one such ingredient. What? A bacterium which reacts with the Sanjeevni tree and makes it decay almost instantly. I thought the Sanjeevni tree was already unstable and decayed rapidly. Ayurvati had told me that the Naga medicine is created by mixing the crushed branches of another tree with the Sanjeevni bark to stabilize it. If the Sanjeevni is already unstable, why would it need bacteria to aid the decay? Wouldn't it just decay anyway? The Sanjeevni bark becomes unstable once stripped off the branch. The entire branch, if used, is not. The bark is easier for small-scale manufacture, but for manufacturing the Somras in large quantities, we have to use crushed branches. This is what we did at Mount Mandar. But it is a method known only to my scientists. So what you want to do is make the Sanjeevni branch also unstable. Yes, and I discovered that it was possible to do so with this bacterium. But it is only available in Mesopotamia. Is this what you picked up from Karachapa when you accompanied me on my initial travels through Meluha? You had said you were expecting a shipment from Mesopotamia. Yes, said Braspati, and it would have worked perfectly. The Somras cannot be made without both the Sanjeevni tree and the Saraswati water. The presence of bacteria in the Saraswati water would render useless the Sanjeevni tree at the beginning of the process itself. And in any case, without the Saraswati water, the Somras cannot be made. Without the power of the Sanjeevni, the Somras would not be as potent. It will not triple or quadruple one's lifespan, but only increase it by 20 or 30 years. However, it would also mean that there would be practically no production of Somras waste. By sacrificing some of the powers of the Somras, we would take away all the poison of the Somras waste. Furthermore, these bacteria also mix with water and then multiply prodigiously. All we needed to do was release it in the Yamuna and the rest would follow. Sounds perfect. Why didn't you? There's no free lunch, said Praspati. The bacteria came with its own problems. It is a mild toxin in itself. If we mix it in large quantities as would be required in the Saraswati, we could create a new set of diseases for all living beings, dependent not just on the Saraswati but also the Yamuna. We would have only replaced one problem with another. So, you were trying to see if the poisonous effect of the bacteria could be reduced or removed without disturbing its ability to destroy the Sanjeevni tree? Yes, secrecy was required. If those who support the Somras knew about these bacteria, they would try to kill it at its source. Had they known I was working on an experiment such as this, they would have had me assassinated. Aren't you afraid of being killed now? asked Shiva. A lot of Meluhans will be angry with you when they discover you weren't the victim but the perpetrator of the attack on Mount Mandar. Braspati breathed deeply. Earlier, it was important for me to remain alive since I alone could have done this research. But I have failed and the solution to the Somra's problem is not in my hands anymore. It's in your hands. It doesn't matter if I live any longer. Mount Mandar will be reconstructed. It's a matter of time and Somra's production will begin once again. You have to stop it, Shiva. For the sake of India, you have to stop the Somras. The reconstruction is a charade, Brahaspatiji, said Sati. It's to mislead enemies into thinking that it will take time to get Somras production back on track. To make them think that Meluha must be surviving on lower quantities of Somras. What? Is there another facility? asked Brahaspati as he looked quickly at Kali. But that cannot be true. It is, answered Sati. I was told by father himself. Apparently, 
It was built years ago, as a backup to Mount Mandar, just in case. Where? asked Kali. I don't know, replied Sati. Damn! exclaimed Kali, scowling darkly as she turned to Braspati. You had said that this was not possible. The churners needed materials from Egypt. They could not be built from Indian material. We have allies constantly watching those Egyptian mines. No material has gone to Meluha. Braspati's face turned white as the implications dawned on him. He held his head and muttered, Would Ram be merciful? How can they resort to this? Resort to what? asked Shiva. There's another way in which the Saraswati waters can be mixed with the crushed Sanjeevni branches, but it's considered wasteful and repugnant. Why? Firstly, it uses much larger quantities of the Saraswati water. Secondly, it needs animal or human skin cells. Excuse me? cried Shiva and Sati. It doesn't mean that one skins a live animal or human, said Braspati, as though reassuring them. What is needed is old and dead skin cells that we shed every minute that we are alive. The cells help the Saraswati waters to grate the Sanjeevni branches at molecular levels. The waters mixed with dead skin cells are simply poured over crushed branches placed in a chamber. This process does not require any churning. But, as you can imagine, it wastes a lot of water. Secondly, how would one find animals and humans who would come to a faraway facility and get into a pool of water above a chamber which contains crushed Sanjeevni branches? It is risky. Why? Dead skin cells of humans or animals are best shed while bathing. A human sheds between two and three kilograms every year. Bathing hastens the process. But why is this risky? Because Somra's production is inherently unstable. The skin cell route even more so. One doesn't want large populations anywhere close to a Somra's facility. If anything goes wrong, the resultant explosion can kill hundreds of thousands, even in the usual less risky churning process. We do not build Somra's production centers close to cities. Can you imagine what would happen if the riskier skin cell process was being conducted close to a city with a large number of humans ritually bathing above a Somra's production center? Shiva's face suddenly turned white. Public baths in Maluhan cities, he whispered. Exactly, said Braspati. Build a facility within a city below a public bath. One would have all the dead skin cells that one would need. And if something goes wrong, if an explosion takes place, Blame the Devi Astras or the Nagas, blame the Chandravanshis if you want, fumed Braspati. Having created so many evil spectres, you can take your pick. Something is wrong, said Brigu. He was surveying the destroyed remains of Mount Mandar with Diliba. The Somra's manufacturing facility looked nowhere near completion, though reconstruction was on. Diliba turned towards the sage. I agree, Maharishiji. It has been more than five years since the Nagas destroyed Mandar. It's ridiculous that the facility has still not been reconstructed. Brigo turned to Dilipa and waved his hand dismissively. Mount Mandar is not important anymore. It is only a symbol. I'm talking about the attack on Panchavati. Dilipa stared wide-eyed at the sage. Mount Mandar is not important? This means that the rumors are true. Another Somra's manufacturing facility does exist. I had given a whole kit of homing pigeons to the attackers, continued Brigu, not bothering with Dilipa's incredulous look. All of them had been trained to return to this site. The last pigeon came in two weeks back. Dilipa frowned. You can trust my man, my lord. He will not fail. Brigu had appointed an officer from Dilipa's army to lead the attack on Shiva's convoy at Panchavati. He did not trust Daksha's ability to detach himself from his love for his daughter. Of that I am sure, he has proven himself trustworthy, strictly complying with my instructions to send back a message every week. The fact that the updates have suddenly stopped means that he has either been captured or killed. I am sure a message is on its way. We needn't worry. Brigo turned sharply towards Dilipa. Is this how you govern your empire, great king? Is it any wonder that your son's claim to the throne appears legitimate? Dilipa's silence was telling. Brigo sighed. When you prepare for war, you should always hope for the best, but be ready for the worst. The last dispatch clearly stated that they were but six days' sail from Panchavati. Having received no word, 
I am compelled to assume the worst. The attack must have failed. Also, I should assume Shiva knows the identity of the attackers. Dilipa didn't speak, but kept staring at Brigu. He thought Brigu was overreacting. I am not overreacting, your highness, said Brigu. Dilipa was stunned. He hadn't uttered a word. Do not underestimate the issue, said Brigu. This is not about you or me. This is about the future of India. This is about protecting the greatest good. We cannot afford to fail. It is our duty to Lord Brahma, our duty to this great land of ours. Dilipa remained silent. The one thought kept reverberating in his mind. I am way out of my depth here. I have entangled myself with powers that are beyond mere emperors. Chapter 4 A Frog Homily The aroma of freshly cooked food emerged from Shiva's chambers as his family assembled for their evening meal. Sati's culinary skill and effort were evident in the feast she had lined up for what was practically their first meal together as a family. Shiva, Ganesh and Karthik waited for her to take a seat before they began the meal. In keeping with custom, the family of the Mahadev took some water from their glasses and sprinkled it around their plates, symbolically thanking Goddess Annapurna for her blessings in the form of food and nourishment. After this, they offered the first morsel of food to the gods. Breaking with age-old tradition though, Shiva always offered his first morsel to his wife. For him, she was divine. Sati reciprocated by offering her first morsel to Shiva. Thus, the meal began. Ganesh has got some mangoes for you today, said Sati, looking indulgently at Karthik. Karthik grinned. Yummy! Thanks, Dada! Ganesh smiled and patted Karthik on his back. You should smile a little more, Karthik, said Shiva. Life is not so grim. Karthik smiled at his father. I'll try, Baba. Looking at his other progeny, Shiva inhaled sharply. Ganesh? Yes, Baba, said Ganesh unsure of the response to his calling Shiva father. My son, whispered Shiva, I misjudged you. Ganesh's eyes moistened. Forgive me, said Shiva. No, Baba, exclaimed Ganesh, embarrassed. How can you ask me for forgiveness? You are my father. Braspati had told Shiva that he had made Ganesh take an oath of secrecy. Nobody was to know that the former Meluhan chief scientist was alive. Braspati did not trust anyone and wanted his experiments on the Mesopotamian bacteria to remain secret. Ganesh had kept his word even at the cost of almost losing his beloved mother and of grievously damaging his relationship with Shiva. You're a man of your word, said Shiva. You honored your promise to Braspati without sparing a thought for the price you would be paying. Ganesh remained silent. I'm proud of you, my son, said Shiva. Ganesh smiled. Sati looked at Shiva, Karthik, and then at Ganesh. Her world had come full circle. Life was as perfect as it could possibly be. She did not need anything else. She could live her life in Panchavati till the end of her days. But she knew that this was not to be. A war was coming. A battle that would require major sacrifices. She knew she had to savor these moments for as long as they lasted. What now, Baba? asked Karthik seriously. We're going to eat, laughed Shiva. And then, hopefully, we will go to sleep. No, no, smiled Karthik. You know what I mean. Are we going to proclaim the Somras as the ultimate evil? Are we going to declare war against all those who continue to use or protect the Somras? Shiva looked at Karthik thoughtfully. There has already been a lot of fighting, Karthik. We will not rush into anything. Shiva turned to Ganesh. I'm sorry, my son, but I need to know more. I have to know more. I understand, Baba. There are only two groups of people who know all there is to know about this. The Vasudevs and the Vayuputras. Yes. I'm not sure if the Vayuputra council will help me, but I know the Vasudevs will. I'll take you to Ujjain, Baba. You can speak to their chief directly. Where is Ujjain? It's up north, beyond the Narmada. 
Shiva considered it for a bit. That would be along the shorter route to Swadweep and Maluha, right? With the security of the Panchavati uppermost in her mind, Kali had led Shiva and his entourage from Kashi to Panchavati via an elaborate route which took a year to traverse. The party had first headed east through Swadweep, then south from Branga. They then moved west from Kalinga through the dangerous Dandak forests before they reached the headwaters of the Godavari where Panchavati lay. Shiva realized that there must be a shorter northern route to Maluha and Swadweep which was impossible to traverse without a Naga guide because of the impregnable forests that impeded the path. Yes, Baba, though Mossi is very secretive about this route, I know that she would be happy to share it with the three of you. I understand, said Sadi. The Nagas have many powerful enemies. Yes, Ma, said Ganesh, before turning to Shiva. But that is not the only reason. Let's be honest. Though the war has not yet begun, we already know that the most powerful emperors in the land are against us. Which side everyone takes, including those waiting in the Panchavati guesthouse colony, will become clear over the next few months. Panchavati is a safe haven. It's not wise to give away its secrets just as yet. Shiva nodded. Let me figure out what I should do with my convoy. There aren't too many kings in the Sapt Sindhu I can readily trust at this point of time. Once I've made up my mind, we can make plans to leave for Ajahn. Tate turned to Ganesh. Tata, there's one thing I simply don't understand. The Vayuputras are the tribe left behind by Lord Rudra. They helped the great seventh Vishnu, Lord Ram, complete his mission. So how is it that these good people do not see the evil that the Somras has become today? Ganesh smiled. I have a theory. Shiva and Sati looked up at Ganesh while continuing to eat. You've seen a frog, right? asked Ganesh. Yes, said Karthik. Interesting creatures, especially their tongues. Ganesh smiled. Apparently, an unknown Brahmin scientist had conducted some experiments on frogs a long time ago. He dropped a frog into a pot of boiling water. The frog immediately jumped out. He then placed a frog in a pot full of cold water. The frog settled down comfortably. The Brahmin then began raising the temperature of the water gradually over many hours. The frog kept adapting to the increasingly warm and then hot water till it finally died without making any attempt to escape. Shiva, Sati and Karthik listened in rapt tension. Naga students learn this story as a life lesson, said Ganesh. Often, our immediate reaction to a sudden crisis helps us save ourselves. Our response to gradual crisis that creeps up on us, on the other hand, may be so adaptive as to ultimately lead to self-destruction. Are you suggesting that the Vayuputras keep adapting to the incremental ill effects of the Somras? asked Karthik. That the bad news is not emerging rapidly enough? Perhaps, said Ganesh, for I refuse to believe that the Vayuputras, the people of Lord Rudra, would consciously choose to let evil live. The only explanation is that they genuinely believe the Somras is not evil. Interesting, said Shiva. And perhaps you are right too. Sati chipped in with a smile, almost as if to lighten the atmosphere. But do you really believe in the frog experiment? Ganesh smiled. It is such a popular story around here that I'd actually tried it when I was a child. Did you really boil a frog slowly to death? And it sat still all the while. Ganesh laughed. Ma, frogs don't sit still no matter what you do. Boiling water, cold water or lukewarm water, a frog always leaps out. The family of the Mahadev laughed heartily. Shiva and Sati were exiting the Panchavati Raja Sabha, having just met with the Naga nobility. Many of the nobles were in agreement with Queen Kali, who wanted to attack Maluha right away and destroy the evil Somras. But some, like Vasuki and Astik, wanted to avoid war. Vasuki and Astik genuinely want peace, but for the wrong reasons, said Shiva, shaking his head. They may be Naga nobility, but they believe that their own people deserve their cruel fate because they are being punished for their past life sins. This is nonsense. Sati, who believed in the concept of karma extending over many births, 
could not hold back her objection. Just because we don't understand something doesn't necessarily mean it's rubbish, Shiva. Come on, Sati. There is only this life, this moment. That is the only thing we can be sure of. Everything else is only theory. Then why were the Nagas born deformed? Why did I live as a Vikarma for so long? Surely, it must be because in some sense, we deserved it. We were paying for our past life sins. That's ridiculous. How can anyone be sure about past life sins? The Vikarma system, like every system that governs human lives, was created by us. You fought the Vikarma system and freed yourself. But I didn't free myself, Shiva. You did. It was your strength and all the Vikarmas, including me, was set free because that was your karma. So how does this work? asked Shiva disbelievingly. That the compounded totality of sins committed by all the Vikarma over their individual previous lives was nullified at the stroke of a quill when I struck down this law? On that fateful day, in a flash, several lifetimes of sins sullying every Vikarma soul were washed away? A day of divine pardon indeed. Shiva, are you mocking me? Do I ever do that, dear? asked Shiva, but his smile gave him away. Don't you see how illogical this entire concept is? How can one believe that an innocent child is born with sin? It's clear as daylight. A newborn child has done no wrong. He has done no right either. He's just been born. He could not have done anything. Perhaps not in this life, Shiva. But it's possible that the child committed a sin in a previous life. Perhaps the child's ancestors committed sins for which the child must be held accountable. Shiva was unconvinced. Don't you get it? It's a system designed to control people. It makes those who suffer or are oppressed blame themselves for their misery. Because you believe you are paying for sins committed either in your own previous lives or those committed by your ancestors or even community. Perhaps even the sins of the first man ever born. The system therefore propagates suffering as a form of atonement and at the same time does not allow one to question the wrongs done unto oneself. Then why do some people suffer? Why do some get far less than what they deserve? The same reason why there are others who get far more than what they deserve. It's completely random. Shiva gallantly reached out to help Sati mount her steed, but she reclined and gracefully slid onto the stallion. Her husband smiled. There was nothing he loved more than her intense sense of self-sufficiency and pride. Shiva leapt onto his own horse and with a quick spur matched Sati's pace. Really, Shiva, said Sati, looking towards him. Do you believe that the Paramatma plays dice with the universe? That we're all handed our fate randomly? The Nagas on the road recognized Shiva and bowed low in respect. They didn't believe in the legend of the Nilkant, but clearly their queen respected the Mahadev, and that made most Nagas believe in Shiva as well. He politely acknowledged every person, even as he replied to Sati without turning. I think the Paramatma does not interfere in our lives. He sets the rules by which the universe exists. Then, he does something very difficult. What? He leaves us alone. He lets things play out naturally. He lets his creations make decisions about their own lives. It's not easy being a witness when one has the power to rule. It takes a supreme god to be able to do that. He knows this is our world, our karma bhumi, said Shiva waving his hand all around as though pointing out the land of their karma. Don't you think this is difficult to accept? If people believe that their fate is completely random, it would leave them without any sense of understanding, purpose or motivation, or why they are where they are. On the contrary, this is an empowering thought. When you know that your fate is completely random, you have the freedom to commit yourself to any theory that will empower you. If you have been blessed with good fate, you can choose to believe it is God's kindness and ingrained humility within. But if you have been cursed with bad fate, you need to know that no great power is seeking to punish you. Your situation is, in fact, a result of completely random circumstances, an indiscriminate turn of the universe. Therefore, if you decide to challenge your destiny, 
your opponent would not be some judgmental Lord Almighty who is seeking to punish you. Your opponent would only be the limitations of your own mind. This will empower you to fight your fate. Sati shook her head. Sometimes you are too revolutionary. Shiva's eyes crinkled. Maybe that is itself a result of my past life sins. Laughing together, they cantered out of the city gates. Seeing the Panchavati guest colony in the distance, Shiva whispered gravely, But one man will have to account to his friends for his karma in this life. Braspatiji? Shiva nodded. What do you have in mind? I'd ask Braspati if he'd like to meet Parvateshwar and Ayurvati to explain to them as to how he is still alive. And he readily agreed. I would have expected nothing less from him. Are you all right? asked Anandamai. Parvateshwar and Anandamai were in their private room in the Panchavati guest house colony. I'm thoroughly confused, said Parvateshwar. The ruler of Meluha should represent the best there is in our way of life, truth, duty and honour. What does it say about us if our emperor is such a habitual lawbreaker? He broke the law when Sati's child was born. I know what Emperor Daksh did was patently wrong, but one could argue that he's just a father trying to protect his child, albeit in his own stupid manner. The fact that he did what was wrong is enough, Anandamai. He broke the law. And now he has broken one of Lord Rudra's laws by using the Devi Astras. How can Meluha, the finest land in the world, have an emperor like him? Isn't something wrong somewhere? Anandamai held her husband's hand. Your emperor was never any good. I could have told you that many years ago. But you don't need to blame all of Meluha for his misdeeds. That's not the way it works. A leader is not just a person who gives orders. He is also the one who symbolizes the society he leads. If the leader is corrupt, then the society must be corrupt too. Who feeds this nonsense to you, my love? A leader is just a human being like anyone else. He doesn't symbolize anything. Parvateshwa shook his head. There are some truths that cannot be challenged. A leader's karma impacts his entire land. He is supposed to be his people's icon. That is a universal truth. Anandamai bent towards him with a soft twinkle in her eyes. Parvateshwar, there is your truth and there is my truth. As for universal truth, it does not exist. Parvateshwar smiled as he brushed a stray strand of hair away from her face. You Chandravanshis are very good with words. Words can only be as good or as bad as the thoughts they convey. Parvateshwar's smile spread wider. So what is your thought on what I should do? My emperor's actions have put me in a situation where my god, the Nilkant, may declare war on my country. What do I do then? How do I know which side to pick? You should stick to your god, said Anandamai, without any hint of hesitation in her voice. But this is a hypothetical question, so don't worry too much about it. My lord, you called, said Ayurvati. She had been as surprised as Parvateshwar when the both of them had been summoned to Shiva's chambers. Since their arrival in Panchavati, Shiva had spent most of his time with the Nagas. Ayurvati was convinced that the Nagas were somehow complicit in the attack on Shiva's convoy. She also believed the Nilkant was perhaps investigating the roots of Naga treachery in Panchavati. Parvateshwar, Ayurvati, welcome, said Shiva. I called you here because it is time now for you to know the secret of the Nagas. Parvateshwar looked up, surprised. But why only the two of us, my lord? Because the both of you are Meluhans. I have reason to suspect that the attack on us at the Godavari is linked to many things. The plague in Branga, the plight of the Nagas, and the drying up of the Saraswati. Parvateshwar and Ayurvati were flummoxed. But I am certain about one thing, said Shiva. The attack is connected to the destruction of Mount Mandar. What? How? Only one man can explain it. One whom you believe is dead. Ayurvati and Parvateshwar spun around as they heard the door open. Braspati walked in quietly.
the Somras is evil? asked Anandamai incredulously. Is that what the Lord Nilkant thinks? Parvateshwar and Anandamai were in their chambers at the Panchvati guest colony. Bhagirath had just joined them. I'm not sure about what he thinks, said Parvateshwar, but Braspati seems to think so. But evil is supposed to be evil for everybody, said Bhagirath. Why should a Surya Vanshi turncoat decide what evil is? Why should we listen to him? Why should the Nilkant listen to him? Bhagirath, do you expect me to defend Braspati, the man who destroyed the soul of our empire? asked Parvateshwar. Just a minute, said Anandamai, raising her hand. Think this through. If the plague in Branga is linked to the Somras, if the slow depletion of the river Saraswati is linked to the Somras, if the birth of the Nagas is linked to the Somras, then isn't it fair to think that maybe it is evil? So what is the Nilkant planning to do? Does he want to ban the Somras? asked Bhagirath. I don't know, Bhagirath, snapped an irritated Parvateshwar, his world having turned upside down because of Daksha and now Braspati. You keep asking me questions, the answers to which I don't know. Anandamai placed a hand on Parvateshwar's shoulders. Perhaps the Nirkant is just as shocked as we are. He needs to think things over. He cannot afford to make hasty decisions. Well, he's made one already, said Parvateshwar. Bhagirath and Anandamai looked at Parvateshwar curiously. We are to leave for Sudweep once all have recovered from their injuries. The Lord has asked us to wait for him at Kashi till he decides his next move. He believes King Atitigva has not sold out to Ayodhya in the conspiracy to assassinate us on the Godavari. But if we go to Kashi, my father will get to know that we are alive, said Bhagirath. He will know his attack has failed. We have to keep quiet about it. We have to pretend that nothing happened, that we were not attacked at all, that we made an uneventful journey to Panchavati and back. Won't they wonder about their ships? The Lord says that's all right. Many things can happen during long sea and river voyages. They may believe their ships met with an accident before they could attack us. Bhagirath raised his eyebrows. My father may be stupid enough to believe that story, but he is not the leader. Whoever put together a conspiracy of this scale will certainly investigate what went wrong. But investigations take time, allowing the Nilkant to check whatever else it is that he needs to. The Lord is not coming with us? asked a surprised Anandamai. Parvateshwar shook his head. No. And the Lord has said we should let it be known that neither his family nor he is with us at Kashi. It should be publicized that he remains in Panchavati. The Lord believes that it will keep us safe as the attack was aimed at him. That can mean only one thing, said Bhagirath. He chooses to take Prahaspati at face value but wants to ascertain a few more things before he makes up his mind. Anandamai looked at her husband with concern in her eyes. She knew that a war was approaching. Perhaps the biggest war that India had ever seen. And in all probability, Meluha and Shiva would be on opposite sides. Which side would her husband choose? Whatever happens, said Anandamai, holding Parvateshwar's face, we must have faith in the Nilkant. Parvateshwar nodded silently. Shiva, Parshuram and Nandi were sitting on the banks of the Godavari. Shiva took a deep drag from the chillam as he looked towards the river, lost in thought. He let out a sigh as he turned to his friends. Are you sure, Parshuram? Yes, my lord, replied Parshuram. I can even take you to the uppermost point of the mighty Brahmaputra, where it is the Sangpo. But... I wouldn't recommend it, for fatalities can be high on that treacherous route. Shiva's silence provoked Parshuram to probe further. What is it about that river, my lord? He had been intrigued by the abnormal interest shown by the Nagas in the Brahmaputra's course as well. First the Nagas, now you. Why is everyone so interested in it? It may be the carrier of evil, Parshuram. Nandi looked up in surprise. Doesn't the Sangpo begin close to your own home in Tibet, my lord? Yes, Nandi, said Shiva. It seems evil has been closer than it initially appeared. Nandi remained quiet. He was one of the few 
who knew the ships that attacked Shiva's convoy were from Meluha. He knew what he had to do. If it came to a choice between Shiva and his country, he would choose Shiva. But it still hurt him immensely. He knew he might have to be part of an army that would attack his beloved motherland, Meluha. He hated his fate for having put him in such a situation. I think I know how to find the mastermind, my lord, said Bhagirath. He had sought an appointment with Shiva as soon as he had stepped out of Parvateshwar's chambers. He knew that his father had decided to oppose the Nilkant. It made sense, therefore, for Bhagirath to immediately prove his loyalty to Shiva. He didn't expect Shiva to lose. Regardless of the opinion of the kings, the people would be with the Nilkant. How? asked Shiva. You'd agree that my father hardly has the wherewithal to draw up such an elaborate plan. I'd say his selfish needs have made him succumb to the evil designs of another. Shiva edged forward, intrigued. You think he has been bribed? Your father is in no need of money. What can be a better bribe than life itself, my lord? Had you seen my father a few years back, you would have thought he was but a small step away from the cremation pyre. A life of debauchery and drink had wreaked havoc within his body. But today, he looks younger than I have ever known. The Somras? I don't think so. I know he tried the Somras in the past. It hadn't worked. Somebody is supplying him with superior medicines. Something that is otherwise unavailable to even a king. Shiva's eyes widened. Who could be more powerful, more knowledgeable than a king? Do you think a Maharishi is helping him? Bhagirath shook his head. No, my lord. I think a Maharishi is leading him. But who can that Maharishi be? I don't know. But when I go back to Ayodhya... Ayodhya? If we are to maintain that no ships attacked us on the Godavari, my lord, then what reason can there be for my not going back to Ayodhya? It will arouse suspicion. More importantly, I can only uncover the true identity of the master when I am in Ayodhya. Despite my father's best efforts, I still have eyes and ears in the impregnable city. Shiva considered this for a moment. He agreed with the train of thought. Moreover, now that Dilipa had chosen to align himself against Shiva, Bhagirath would be even more eager to prove his loyalty to him. Shiva nodded. All right, go to your Yodhya. But my lord, when the time comes, I hope Ayodhya and Swadweep will be shown some kindness. Kindness? We have not used the Somra successively, my lord. Only a few Chandravanshi nobles use it, and that too, sparingly. It is the Maluhans who have abused its usage. That is what has made evil rise. Therefore, it is only fair that when the Somras is banned, this ban be imposed only on Meluha. Swadweep has not benefited from the drink of the gods. I hope we will be allowed to use it. You didn't choose to use less Somras, Bhagirath, said Shiva. You just didn't have the opportunity to do so. If you had, the situation would have been very different. You know that just as much as I do. But Meluha, yes, Meluha has used more. So naturally, they will suffer more. But let me make one thing clear. If I decide the Somras is evil, then no one will use it. No one. Bhagirath kept silent. Is that clear? asked Shiva. Of course, my lord. Chapter 5 The Shorter Route A caravan of 500 people was moving up the northern path from Panchavati towards the Vasudev city of Ujjain. Shiva and his family were in the center, surrounded by half a brigade of joint Naga and Branga soldiers in standard defensive formations. Kali did not want to reveal this route to anyone from Shiva's original convoy, so none of them were included. Nandi and Parushram were the only exceptions. Braspati had been included for Shiva might need his advice in understanding what the Vasudevs had to say about the Somras. Whereas Shiva persisted in his quest and questions with Braspati, the old brotherly love that they had shared was missing. Parvateshwar, Ayurvati, Anandamai and Bhagirath, along with the original convoy, had stayed back at Panchavati. They were going to leave for Kashi in a few weeks, 
their eastern route going through the Dandak forest onwards through Branga. Vishwadyumna was to accompany them as a guide up to Branga. Ganesh, does Ujjain fall on the way from Panchvati to Maluha or do we take a detour? asked Shiva, goading his horse forward over the path built through the forest. It was fenced by two protective hedges. The inner layer comprised the harmless Nagavali creepers, while the outer one had poisonous vines to prevent wild animals from entering. Actually, Baba, Ujjain is on the way to Swadweep. It's to the northeast. Meluha lies to the northwest. Sati tried to get her bearings of Meluha and Maika at the dried mouth of the Saraswati. The Meluhan city of birds was not too far from the mouth of the Narmada. Does the Narmada serve as your waterway? One can sail west for Meluha and east for Ujjain and Swadweep. Yes, Ma, answered Ganesh. Shiva turned to his son. Have you ever been to Maika? How do abandoned Naga children get adopted? Maika is the one place where there is no bias against the Nagas, Baba. Perhaps the sight of helpless Naga babies shrieking in pain as a cancerous growth bursts through their bodies melts the hearts of the authorities. The Maika governor takes personal interest in attempting to save as many Naga babies as he can in the crucial first month after their birth. A Naga ship sails down the Narmada every month, docks at Maika late at night, and the babies born in that month are handed over to us by the Maika record keeper. Some non-Naga parents choose to stay back and move to Panchavati for the sake of their children. Don't the Maika authorities stop them? Actually, the tenets of Meluhan law require parents to accompany their Naga children to Panchavati. In doing so, they are following their law, but others refuse to do so. They abandon their children and return to their comfortable life in Meluha. In such cases, only the child is handed over. The Maika governor pretends not to notice this breach of law. Sati shook her head. She had lived in Maluha for more than 100 years, a few of which were in Maika as an infant. She had never known any of this. It was almost like she was discovering her seemingly upright nation anew. Her father had not been the only one to break the law. It appeared as if many Meluhans valued the comforts of their land more than their duty towards their children or towards observing Lord Ram's laws. Shiva looked ahead to see a large ship anchored in a massive lagoon. The waters were blocked on the far side by a dense grove. Having seen the grove of floating Sundari trees in Branga, Shiva assumed that these trees must also have free-floating roots. The route ahead seemed obvious. I guess we have reached your secret lagoon. I assume the Narmada is beyond that grove. There is a massive river beyond that grove, Baba, said Ganesh. But it is not the Narmada. It is the Tapi. We have to cross to the other side. After that, it is a few more days' journey to Narmada. Shefa smiled. The Lord Almighty has blessed this land with too many rivers. India can never run short of water. Not if we abuse our rivers the way we are now abusing the Saraswati. Shiva nodded, silently agreeing with Ganesh. Brigu tore open the letter. It was exactly what he had expected. The Vayuputras had excommunicated him. Lord Brigu, it has been brought to our attention that Devi Astras were loaded onto a fleet of ships in Karachapa. Investigations have led to the regrettable conclusion that you manufactured them, using materials that were given to you strictly for research. While we understand that you would never misuse the weapons expressly banned by our god, Lord Rudra, we cannot allow the unauthorized transport of these weapons to go unpunished. You are therefore prohibited from ever entering Pareha or interacting with the Vayuputra again. We do hope you will honor the greater promise that every friend of a Vayuputra makes to Lord Rudra, that of never using the Devi Astras. It is the expectation of the council that you will surrender the weapons at once to Vayuputra security. What surprised Brigu was that the note had been signed by the Mitra, leader of the council. It was rare for the Mitra to sign orders personally. Usually it was done by one of the Amartya Shpand, the six deputies on the council. The Vayuputras were clearly taking this very seriously. 
but Brigo believed that he had not broken the law. He had already written to the Vayuputras that they were making the institution of the Nilkant a mockery by not acting against the self-appointed impostor. But alas, the Vayuputras had done nothing. However, he could see how they would think he had misused their research material. Ironically, he had not. Even if he had got over his qualms about using that material, Brigu knew there was simply not enough to make the quantity of Devi Astras that were needed. He had made his own stockpile of such weapons using materials he himself had compiled over the years. Perhaps that was the reason why they did not have the destructive potency of the Vayuputra material. They had entire laboratories, whereas Brigu worked alone. Brigu sighed. He had used all the weapons that he had manufactured. The only mystery was whether they had achieved their purpose, whether the Nilkant had been assassinated. Talking to Daksha was an exercise in fertility. He seemed to be in a state of shock since the rupture of his relations with his daughter. Brigu had sent off another ship, manned by men drawn from Dilipa's army, to the mouth of the Godavari to investigate the matter. But it would be months before he knew what had happened. Anything else, my lord? asked the attendant. Brigu dismissed her with an absent-minded wave. Perhaps the job was done. Maybe the Nilkant was no more. But it was also possible that Brigu's ships had failed. Even worse, the Nilkant may have been persuaded by the Nagas and was plotting to turn the people against the Somras. Nothing was certain till he received news of the five ships he had sent earlier to attack Shiva's convoy. For now, much as he disliked living in Devagiri, he had no choice but to wait. He had to stay till he knew the Somras was safe. He believed India's future was at stake. Brigu took a deep breath and went back into a meditative trance. Shiva's convoy had covered ground quickly after crossing the Tapi and was waiting at the edge of another secret lagoon while the Nagas prepared to set sail. Beyond the floating grove guarding this lagoon flowed the mighty Narmada, mandated by Lord Manu as the southern border of the Sapt Sindhu, the land of the seven rivers. How much further, Dada? Not too far, Karthik. Just a few more weeks, answered Ganesh. We will sail east up the Narmada for a few days, then march on foot through the passes of the great Vindhya mountains till we reach the Chambal River. We will then have to sail for only a few days down the Chambal to reach Ujjain. Sati watched the sailors pull the gangway plank towards the rudimentary dock, preparing the ship for loading. She wished that her sister Kali had accompanied them on this journey. But she also knew that being a queen, Kali had many responsibilities in Panchavati. Her thoughts were interrupted by the ship's gangway plank landing on the dock with a loud thud. Parvateshwar, Anandamai, Bhagirath and Ayurvati were dining together in the late afternoon. They had just entered the first of five clearings on the Dandakaranya road from Panchvati. The road led to the hidden lagoon on the Madhumati in Branga. Accompanied by the convoy of 1600 soldiers that had set out with Shiva more than a year ago, they were marching back to Kashi to await Shiva's return. Bhagirath looked at the five paths in wonder. Only one of these was correct, while the others were decoys that would lead trespassers to their doom. These Nagas are obsessive about security. Anandamai looked up. Can we blame them? Do not forget, it was this attitude that saved our lives when those ships attacked us on the Godavari. True, said Bhagirath. The Nagas will no doubt prove to be good allies. Their loyalty to the Nilkant isn't suspect, even though the reasons might well be. When the moment of truth is upon us, all will have to answer a simple question. Will they fight the world for the Nilkant? I know I will. Anandamai's eyes flashed as she looked at Parvateshwar and then back at Bhagirath, chiding him. Get back to your food, little brother. Parvateshwar looked at Anandamai with a tortured expression. I don't think the Paramatma will be so unkind to me. He could not have made me wait for more than a century to find my living God, only to force me to choose between my country and him. I'm sure the Almighty will find a way to ensure that Maluha and the Lord Nilkant are not on opposite sides. Parvateshwar's sad smile told Anandamai 
He himself did not believe that. She touched her husband's shoulder gently. Bhagirath played with his roti absent-mindedly. He was beginning to believe they could not count on Parvateshwar. That would be a huge loss for the Nilkant's army. Parvateshwar's strategic abilities had the capacity to turn the tide in any war. Ayavati looked at Parvateshwar with sympathy. She could identify with his inner conflict. In her case, though, a decision had emerged that sat comfortably in her heart. Her emperor had committed heinous acts which dishonored Meluha. This was no longer the country she had loved and admired all her life. She knew in her heart that Lord Ram would not have condoned the immorality that Meluha had descended into under Daksha's watch. Her path was clear. In a fight between Meluha and Shiva, she would choose the Nilkant, for he would set things right in Meluha as well. The Naga ship was anchored close to the Chambal shore. Shiva, Sati, Ganesh and Karthik climbed down rope ladders to the large boat that had been tied to the ship's anchor line. Brahaspati, Nandi and Parshuram followed them, accompanied by ten Naga soldiers. When everyone had disembarked, they began to row ashore. The Vasudevs, being even more secretive than the Nagas, Shiva did not expect to find any sign of habitation close to the river. Almost touching the river bank, a wall of dense foliage blocked the view beyond. Weeds had spread over the gentle Chambal waters, making rowing a back-breaking task. Ganesh navigated the boat towards a slender clearing between two immense palm trees. Shiva could sense something unnatural about the clearing, but couldn't put his finger on it. He turned towards Karthik, who was staring at the clearing as well. Baba, look at the trees behind the clearing, said Karthik. You'll have to bend down to my level. As Shiva bent low, the image became clear. The trees behind the clearing were organized unnaturally, given the dense, uncontrolled growth surrounding it. Placed equidistant, they seemed to grow in height as one looked further away. This was because the ground itself sloped upward in a gentle gradient. It was obviously not a natural hillock. A majority of the trees behind the clearing were the gulmohar, their flaming orange flowers suggestive of fire. Shiva blinked at what appeared to be an optical illusion. He suddenly stood up, rocking the boat as Sati and Ganesh reached out to hold him steady. The Gulmohar trees had been placed in a specific pattern that was visible from a certain distance as one placed oneself directly in front of the small clearing between the twin palms. It was in the shape of a flame, a specific symbol that Shiva recognized. Fravashi, whispered Shiva. Surprised, Ganesh asked, How do you know that term, Baba? Shiva looked at Ganesh and then back at the Gulmohar trees. The pattern had disappeared. Shiva sat down and turned towards Ganesh. How do you know that term? It's a Vayuputra term. It represents the feminine spirit of Lord Rudra, which has the power to assist us in doing what is right. We are free to either accept it or reject it, but the spirit never refuses to help. Never. Shiva smiled as he began to understand his ancient memories. Who told you about Fravashi Baba? asked Ganesh again. My uncle Monobu, said Shiva. It was among the many concepts and symbols that he made me learn. He said it would help me when the time came. Who was he? I thought I knew, said Shiva. But I'm beginning to wonder if I knew him well enough. The conversation came to a halt as the boats hit the banks. Two Naga soldiers jumped out and pulled the boat further up onto dry land. Tugging hard on the line, they tied the craft to a conveniently placed tree stump. The landing party quickly disembarked. Karthik surveyed the palms that marked the clearing. He turned towards Ganesh, who was standing at the center of the clearing. Can everyone stand behind me, please? requested Ganesh. I do not want anyone between me and the palm trees. The others moved away as Ganesh closed his eyes to drown out the distractions surrounding him and find his concentration. Ganesh breathed deeply and clapped hard repeatedly in an irregular beat. The claps were set in the Vasudev code and were being transmitted to the gatekeeper of Ujjain. This is Ganesh, the Naga lord of the people, 
requesting permission to enter your great city with our entourage. Shiva heard the soft sounds of claps reverberating back. Ujjain's gatekeeper had answered, Welcome, Lord Ganesh. This is an unexpected honor. Are you on your way to Swadweep? No, we have come to meet with Lord Gopal, the great chief Vasudev. Was there something specific you needed to discuss, Lord Ganesh? Clearly, the Vasudevs were still not comfortable with the Nagas, despite the fact that they had reached out to Ganesh for the Naga medicines to help with the birth of Kartik. The Ujjain gatekeeper was trying to parry off Ganesh's request while trying not to insult him. Ganesh continued to clap rhythmically. It is not I who seeks Lord Gopal, honored gatekeeper. It is the Lord Nilkant. Silence for a few moments. Then the sound of claps in quick succession. Is the Lord Nilkant at the palm clearing with you? He is standing with me. He can hear you. Silence once again, before the gatekeeper responded. Lord Ganesh, Lord Gopal himself is coming to the clearing. We will be honored to host your convoy. It will take us a day to get there. Please bear with us till then. Thank you. Ganesh rubbed his palms together and looked at Shiva. It will take a day for them to get here, Baba. We can wait in our ship till they arrive. Have you ever been to a Jan? asked Shiva. No, I have met the Vasudevs just once at this very clearing. All right, let's get back to our ship. Are you telling me Lord Bhrigu visited Ayodhya eight times in the last year? asked a surprised Surapadman. The Crown Prince of Magad maintained his own espionage network, independent of the notoriously inefficient Royal Magad spy service. His man had just informed him of the goings-on in the Ayodhya royal household. Yes, Your Highness, answered the spy. Furthermore, Emperor Dilipa himself has visited Meluha twice in the same period. That I am aware of, said Surapadman. But the news you bring throws new light on it. Perhaps Dilipa was not going to meet that fool Daksha after all. Maybe he was going to meet Lord Briku. But why would the great sage be interested in Dilipa? That I do not know, Your Highness. But I am sure you have heard of Emperor Dilipa's newly acquired youthful appearance. Perhaps Lord Briku has been giving him the Somras. Surapadman waved his hand dismissively. The Somras is easily available to Swadweepan royalty. Dilipa doesn't need to plead with a Maharishi for it. I know Dilipa has been using the Somras for years. But when one has abused the body as much as he has, even the Somras would find it difficult to delay his aging. I suspect Lord Brigo is giving him medicines that are even more potent than the Somras. But why would Lord Brigo do that? That's the mystery. Try to find out. Any news of the Nilkant? No, Your Highness. He remains in Naga territory. Surapadman rubbed his chin and looked out of the window of his palace chambers along the Ganga. His gaze seemed to stretch beyond the river into the jungle that extended to the south, the forests where his brother Ugrasen had been killed by the Nagas. He cursed Ugrasen silently. He knew the truth of his brother's murder. Addicted to bull racing, Ugrasen had indulged in increasingly reckless bets. Desperate to get good child riders for his bulls, he used to scour tribal forests, kidnapping children at will. On one such expedition, he had been killed by a naga who was trying to protect a hapless mother and her young boy. What he could not understand, though, was why a naga would risk his life to save a forest woman and her child. But the death had narrowed Surapadman's choices. The Nilkant would lead his followers against whoever he decided was evil. A war was inevitable. There would be those who would oppose him. Surapadman did not care much about this war against evil. All he wanted was to ensure that Magad would fight on the side opposed to Ayodhya. He intended to use wartime chaos to establish Magad as the overlord of Swadeep and himself as emperor. Madhograsen's killing had deepened his father, King Mahindra's distrust of the Nagas into unadulterated hatred. Surapadman knew Mahindra would force him to fight against whichever side the Nagas allied with. 
is only hopefully in the Nagas and the Emperor of Ayodhya choosing the same side. Kanakla waited patiently in the chambers of Maharishi Bhrigu at Daksha's palace. The Maharishi was in deep meditation. Though his chamber was in a palace, it was as simple and severe as his real home in a Himalayan cave. Bhrigu sat on the only piece of furniture in the room, a stone bed. Kanakla therefore had no choice but to stand. Icy water had been sprinkled on the floor and the walls. The resultant cold and clammy dampness made her shiver slightly. She looked at the bowl of fruit at the far corner of the room on a small stand. The Maharishi seemed to have eaten just one fruit over the previous three days. Kanakla made a mental note to order fresh fruit to be brought in. An idol of Lord Brahma had been installed in an indentation in the wall. Kanakla stared fixedly at the idol as she repeated the soft chanting of Bhrigu. Om Brahmya Nama, Om Brahmya Nama. Bhrigu opened his eyes and gazed at Kanakla contemplatively before speaking. Yes, my child. My lord, a sealed letter has been delivered for you by bird courier. It has been marked as strictly confidential. Therefore, I thought it fit to bring it to you personally. Bhrigu nodded politely and took the letter from Kanakla without saying a word. As instructed, we have also kept the pigeon with us. It can return to where it came from. Of course, this would not be possible if the ship has moved. Please let me know if you'd like to send a message back with the pigeon. Hmm. Will that be all, my lord? asked Kanakla. Yes, thank you. As Kanakla shut the door behind her, Brigu broke the seal and opened the letter. Its contents were disappointing. My lord, we have found some wreckage of our ships at the mouth of the Godavari. They have obviously been blown up. It is difficult to judge whether they were destroyed as a result of sabotage or an accident owing to the goods they carried. It is also difficult to say if all the ships were destroyed or if there are any survivors. Await further instructions. The words gave Brigo information without adding to his understanding of the situation. Not one of the five ships that he had sent to assassinate the Nilkant and destroy Panchavati had returned or sent a message. The wreckage of at least some of the ships had been discovered, having drifted down the Godavari. Both the possible conclusions were disturbing. Either the ships had been destroyed or some of them had been captured. Brigo could not afford to send another ship up the Godavari to try and dig deeper. He might end up gifting another well-built warship to the enemy just before the final war. Of course, there was also the possibility that the ships may have succeeded in their mission and had been destroyed subsequently, but Brigo simply could not be sure. Brigo would have to wait. Maybe an angry Nilkant would emerge from the jungles of Dandak. He could rally his followers and attack those allied against him. If that did not happen, then the sage would assume that the Nilkant threat had passed. Brigo rang the bell, summoning the guard outside. He would send a message to the ship at the mouth of the Godavari with orders to return. He would also have to order Meluha and Ayodhya to prepare their armies for battle, just in case. Chapter 6 The City That Conquers Pride It was a full moon night. Shiva stood at the anchored ship's balustrade as he looked into the dark expanse of forest on the Chambal's banks. Deep in the distance was what seemed to be a massive hill made of pure black stone. Shiva had been observing that hill all evening. It was too smooth to be natural. Even more unusually, it had an inverted bowl-like structure at the top that was distinctly a cupola. It was colored a deeper hue of black as compared to the rest of the hill which it was certainly not a part of. It's man-made, Baba, said Karthik. Shiva, Ganesh and Braspati turned towards Karthik, who was crouching, looking at the bank of the river from a lower height. Shiva went down to the same level as Karthik. He observed the area behind the palm tree clearing. He could clearly see the pattern of the ancient Vayuputra image, Fravashi. As his eyes traced the path of the slope, he realized that had the incline continued, it would have ended at the very top of the black hill in the distance, at the cupola. 
Braspati spoke up. The slope of the trees is probably the remnant of a very long ramp that was used to carry that stone cupola to the top of the hill. Shiva smiled at the precise engineering skills of the Vasudevs. He had known his mysterious advisors for years. He looked forward to finally meeting their leader. Daksh gazed at the full moon reflected in the shimmering Saraswati waters. He was standing by the large window of his private palace chamber. He had increasingly isolated himself in the last few months, avoiding meeting people as far as possible. He was especially terrified of meeting Maharishi Bhrigu, convinced as he was that the Maharishi would read his mind and realize that it was Daksha who had foiled the attack on Panchavati in an attempt to save his beloved daughter. But this period of isolation had done wonders for Daksha and Virini's relationship. They were conversing, even confiding in each other once again, almost like the first few years of their marriage. Before Daksha developed ambitions to become the ruler of Meluha, Virini walked up to her husband and placed her hand on his shoulder. What are you thinking? Daksha pulled back from his wife. Virini frowned. Then she noticed Daksha's hands. He was holding an amulet that showed his chosen tribe the self-declared ranking within the caste hierarchy that is adopted by young men and women. It was a subordinate rank, a lowly goat. Many Kshatriyas felt that the goat-chosen tribe was so low that it did not entitle its members to be considered complete Kshatriyas. In Daksha's case, it was his father, Brahmanayak, who had selected his chosen tribe, clearly reflecting his contempt for his son. What's the matter, Daksha? Why does she think I'm a monster? I got rid of her son for her own good. And we didn't abandon Ganesh. He was well taken care of in Panchavati. And how can she imagine that I would even think of getting her husband killed? It wasn't me. Virini stayed silent. Now was not the time to confront her husband with the truth. Had he wanted to, he could have saved Chandanthwaj, Sati's first husband. Daksha may not have got the killing done through commission, but he was complicit by omission. However, weak people never admit that they are responsible for their own state. They always blame either circumstances or others. I'm saying once again, Daksh, let's forget everything, said Virini. You have achieved all you wanted to. You are the emperor of India. We cannot live in Panchavati anymore. We lost that opportunity long ago. Kali and Ganesh despise us. And I don't blame them for it. Let us take sannyas. Retreat to the Himalayas and live out the rest of our lives in peace and meditation. We will die with the name of the Lord on our lips. I will not run away. Daksha, everything is clear to me now. I needed the Nilkant to conquer Swadeep. He has now served his purpose. Sati will be back once he is gone and we will be happy again. A horrified Virini stared at her husband. Daksha, what in Lord Ram's name are you thinking? I can set everything right by... Trust me, the best thing to do is leave all this alone. You should never even have tried to become emperor. You can still be happy if... Never tried to become emperor? What nonsense! I am the emperor. Not just of Meluha, but of India. You think some barbarian with a blue throat can defeat me? That a chillum smoking uncouth ingrate is going to take my family away from me? Virini held her head in despair. I made him, said Daksha. And I will finish him. My lord, exclaimed Parshuram, look! Shiva turned to look towards the dense forests beyond the palm tree clearing. In the distance, they saw a sudden flight of birds flying off into the sky, obviously disturbed by massive movement. The approaching mass was effortlessly pushing trees aside as it forged through the forest. They're here! said Nandi. Shiva turned around and spoke loudly. Ganesh, lower the boats. Having left a majority of the soldiers on board, Shiva and his entourage of 200 were already at the clearing when enormous elephants burst through the jungle. They wore intricately carved ceremonial forehead gear made of gold. The human handlers of the elephants, or mahuts, sat just behind the beasts' heads, 
and was secured into their position with ropes. They were covered from head to toe in cane armor, which protected them from the whiplash of the branches that the elephants effortlessly pushed aside. With the aid of gentle prodding with their feet as well as the hand-held hooks called ankush, the mahuts expertly guided the elephants into the clearing. Firmly secured on the backs of the elephants were large, strong wooden howdahs fashioned to extend horizontally from the sides of the animals. Completely covered from all sides, they afforded protection to the people inside. Angled slats allowed access to air and a side door to the howdahs facilitated entry. Shiva's eyes were fixed on the first elephant in the line. As it halted, the side door flung open and a rope ladder was flung down. A tall and lanky pundit, clad in a saffron dhoti and angavastram, climbed down. As soon as the pundit's feet touched the ground, he turned towards Shiva, his hands folded in a respectful namaste. He had a flowing white beard and a long silvery mane. His wizened face, calm eyes and gentle smile showed a deep understanding of true wisdom. The wisdom of Satchit Anand, of truth, consciousness, bliss. The unrelenting bliss of having one's consciousness and mind drowned in truth. Namaste, Pandaji, said Shiva. It is an honor to finally meet the Chief Vasudev. Namaste, Great Mahadev, said Gopal politely. Believe me, the honor is all mine. I have lived for this moment. Shiva stepped forward and embraced Gopal. The surprised Chief Vasudev responded tentatively at first and then returned the embrace as the open-heartedness of the Nilkant made him smile. Shiva stepped back and looked at the large number of men and elephants waiting patiently. It's a little crowded, isn't it? Gopal smiled. This is a small clearing, Great Mahadev. We don't really meet too many people. Well, let's climb aboard, your elephants, and leave for a jan. Certainly, said Gopal, as he gestured towards his men. The Hauras were surprisingly spacious and could seat up to eight people in relative comfort. The carriage with Gopal and Shiva also carried Sati, Ganesh, Karthik, Braspati, Nandi and Parshuram. I hope your journey was comfortable, said Gopal. Yes, it certainly was, said Shiva before pointing towards Ganesh. My son guided us well. The Lord of the people has the reputation of a wise man agreed Gopal, and stories of the warrior spirit of your other son, Karthik, have already reached our ears. Karthik acknowledged the compliment with a slight nod and folded his hands into respectful namaste. Pandaji, is it because of the distance that it takes us a day to reach Ujjain, or is it the density of the forest? asked Shiva. A bit of both, great Nilkant. We have not built any roads from the clearing to the chambal into the city of Ujjain. We do not really meet a lot of people. But when we do need to travel, we have well-trained elephants that make it possible for us. The people sitting in the howdahs had got used to the sounds of foliage crashing and scraping against the outside of the closed carriage. It had been a long and steady ride due to which their attention was immediately drawn when the sound stopped. Gopal spoke up before any of them could make inquiries. We're here. As he said this, Gopal pressed a lever to his left. Hydraulic action made three sides of the howdah, the left, right and rear, slowly collapse outwards. Support pillars on the sides remained strong and held the howdah roof up. Horizontal metal railings ensured no passengers fell out but none were paying attention to the engineering behind the Howrah. They were all transfixed by Ujjain, the city that conquers pride. The entire circular city had been laid out within a giant, perfect square clearing in the dense forest. A sturdy ring of stones, almost ten feet in depth and thirty feet in height, ran around the city, a strong and effective fort wall. The Shipra River, a tributary of the Chambal, which flowed along a gen, had been channeled into a moat around the walls. The moat followed the dimensions of the forest clearing. Therefore, the circular city was enclosed within a square moat. The moat was infested with crocodiles. 
the elephants ambled slowly towards the moat, where, much to everyone's surprise, there did not appear to be any bridge. Shiva had seen many forts across India with retractable drawbridges across their moats. These moats provided effective defense against the siege engines that an enemy used to attack a city's fort walls. He expected the elephants to stop and wait till the drawbridge was lowered. But neither did the elephants stop, nor was there any sign of a drawbridge being lowered. Instead, there were twenty armed men who stood on the raised embankments which ran around the moat. As the elephants neared, two men stepped back and pushed hard on what appeared like cobbled ground. A button, the size of a stone block, depressed into the embankment with a soft hiss. This, in turn, triggered a part of the ground, just before the embankment, to slide sideways, revealing broad, gentle steps descending deep into the earth. The steps led to a well-lit tunnel, which the elephants entered. The Vasudev guards went down on their knees in obeisance to the Nilkant. Kartik looked at Ganesh, smiling. What a brilliant idea, Dada! Yes, instead of building a bridge over the moat, they built a tunnel underneath it and the door to the tunnel merges completely into the cobbled ground, thus being effectively camouflaged. The entire ground around the moat is cobbled. This will prevent animal tracks from appearing around the tunnel entries. Unless an enemy knows exactly where the entrance is, he can never find a way to cross the moat and enter the city. Nandi looked at Gopal. Your tribe is brilliant, Pandaji. Gopal smiled politely. As the elephants moved towards the city gates, the passengers noticed large geometric patterns along the walls. There were a series of concentric circles boxed within a single perfect square that skirted the outermost circle. It seemed to symbolize the aerial layout of a gen. The circular fort wall of the city was not an accident, but the culmination of what the Vasudevs believed was a perfect geometric design. We have built the entire city in the form of a mandal said Gopal. What is the mandal, Panditji? asked Shiva. It's a symbolic representation of an approach to spirituality. How so? The square boundary of the moat symbolizes Prithvi, the land we live on. It is represented by a square that is bound on four sides, just like our land, which is also bound by the four directions. The space within the square represents Prakriti, or nature, as the land that we live on is uncultured and a wild jungle. Within it, the path of consciousness is the path of the Paramatma, which is represented by the circle. Why a circle? The Paramatma is the Supreme Soul. It is infinite. And if you want to represent infinity through a geometric pattern, you cannot do better than with a circle. It has no beginning. It has no end. You cannot add another side to it. You cannot remove a side from it. It is perfect. It is infinity. Shiva smiled. A bird's eye view of a jan would show that within the circular fort wall, there were five tree-lined ring roads that had been laid out in concentric circles. The outermost road skirted the fort walls. The remaining four were arranged in concentric circles of decreasing diameter. The smallest ring road circled the massive Vishnu temple at the center of the city. Twenty paved radial roads extended in straight lines from the outermost ring road to the innermost. These roads effectively divided Ujjain into five zones. The outermost zone between the fourth and the fifth ring road had massive wooden stables for various domesticated animals such as cows and horses. The pride of place was occupied by the thousands of well-trained elephants. The next zone, between the third and the fourth ring road, was for the residences of the novices and trainees. It also housed their schools, markets and entertainment districts. The zone between the second and the third ring road housed the Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Shudras amongst the Vasudevs. The one between the first and the second ring road housed the Brahmins, the community which administered the tribe of Vasudevs. And within the first ring road, in the heart of the city, was the holiest place in Ujjain, their central temple. The temple was made of black bricks and was what had appeared as a hill to Shiva 
from the chambal. Entirely man-made, this temple was in the shape of a perfect inverted cone, with its base in a circle supported by a thousand pillars running along its circumference. The conical temple was completely hollow inside and rose in ever smaller circles to reach its peak at a height of a gigantic 200 meters. A central pillar made of hard granite had been erected within the temple to support the massive weight of the ceiling. A giant cupola made of black limestone had been placed at the apex of the temple. Weighing almost 40 tons, the cupola had been rolled onto the top of the temple by using elephants to pull the stone over a 20 kilometer long gradual incline. It was the remnants of this incline that Shiva had seen at the Chambal. Of course, Shiva and his entourage were yet to see this grandeur. As the elephants emerged from the tunnel onto the outer ring road along the inner fort wall, all eyes fell upon the vision that was impossible to miss from any part of Ujjain, the Vishnu temple at the center. The entire entourage stared in wonder at the awe-inspiring sight. Only Braspati voiced what everyone felt within. Chapter 7 An Eternal Partnership Shiva's entourage had been housed in Ojan's Brahmin zone, abutting the central Vishnu temple. After a comfortable night's rest, Shiva had just finished breakfast with his family when a Vasudev Pandit came over and then escorted him to the Vishnu temple. Shiva had a meeting with Gopal in the morning. The simple grandeur of the massive Vishnu temple became even more apparent as Shiva approached it. It was built on a circular platform of polished granite stones that were fixed together using metal. Contiguous holes and channels were drilled into stones and then molten metal poured into them. As the metal solidified, it bound the stones together in an unbreakable grip. Although expensive, this technique ensured strength as compared to the stones being bound together by mortar. There were no carvings on the platform at all, in keeping with its simplicity. In fact, Statues and carvings would have been an unnecessary distraction given the marvel of engineering that the structure itself was. Steps had been chiseled all along the sides of the circular platform so that visitors could approach the great seventh Vishnu, Lord Ram, from all directions. A thousand cylindrical pillars made of granite stood atop the platform, their bases buried deep. Lathe machines powered by elephants had achieved perfect evenness and uniform solidity in the pillars, which allowed them to efficiently bear the weight of the conical spire on top. The massive black stone spire looked as smooth from up close as from a distance. Each stone block was of the same dimension, fitted in perfectly and polished smooth. A giant cupola made of black limestone had been placed on top of the spire. The Vasudev Pandit remained silent as he watched Shiva climb the steps of the temple in wonder. As he entered the main temple, he noticed that the spire was completely hollow from the inside, giving a magnificent view of the giant conical ceiling that enveloped a cavernous hall. This temple, unlike the others that Shiva had seen in India, did not have a separate sanctum sanctorum. The inside of the temple was an open, communal place of worship. The ceiling was ablaze with paintings in bright colors depicting the life of Lord Ram, his birth, his education, his exile and eventual triumphant return. Large frescoes on a prominent wall were devoted to the Lord's life after ascending the throne of Ayodhya, his real enemies, the wars he waged against them, his intense relationship with his inspirational wife Lady Sita and his founding of Maluha. A giant pillar made of white granite stood in the center of the hall. It was almost 200 meters high, extending all the way to the top of the conical spire. Shiva was aware that granite was amongst the hardest stones known to man and extremely difficult to carve. Hence, he was surprised to see the detailed carvings on the pillar. They were giant images of Lord Ram and Lady Sita. Dressed simply, with no royal ornaments or crowns, they wore plain hand-spun cotton, the clothes of the poorest of the poor. These were the garments worn by the divine couple 
during their 14-year exile, most of it in dense jungles. Even more intriguing was the absence of Lord Lakshman and Lord Hanuman, who were normally included in all depictions of the seventh Vishnu. Lady Sita held his right hand from below, as if in support. Why has the worst phase of their life been chosen for depiction? asked Shiva. This was when they had been banished from Ayodhya, when Lady Sita was later kidnapped by the demonic King Ravan and Lord Ram fought a fierce battle to rescue her. The Vasudev Pandit smiled. Lord Ram had said that even if his entire life was forgotten, this phase, the one that he had spent in exile along with his wife, his brother and his follower Hanuman, should be remembered by all, for he believed this was the period that had made him who he was. Gopal stood close to the base of the central pillar. Next to him were two ceremonial chairs, one at the feet of the statue of Lady Sita and the other at the feet of Lord Ram. A small ritual fire burned between the two chairs. The presence of the purifying Lord Agni, the god of fire, signified that no lies could pass between those who sat on either side. Many Vasudev Pandits stood patiently behind Gopal. Gopal bowed to Shiva and joined his hands in a respectful namaste. A Vasudev exists to serve but two purposes. The next Vishnu must arise from amongst us and we must serve the Mahadev whenever he should choose to come. Shiva bowed low to Gopal in reciprocation. Every single one of us present here is honored, continued Gopal, that one of our missions will be fulfilled within our lifetime. We are yours to command, Lord Nilkant. You are not my follower, Lord Gopal, said Shiva. You are my friend. I have come here to seek your advice, for I am unable to come to a decision. Gopal smiled and gestured towards the chairs. Shiva and Gopal took their seats as the other Vasudev Pandits sat around them on the floor in neat rows. Ganesh, Kartik and Braspati had set off on a short tour of Ajayan, accompanied by a Vasudev Kshatriya. Ganesh was deeply interested in the animal enclosures in the outermost zone, specifically the elephant stables. Pulling his horse close to Ganesh's mount, the Vasudev Kshatriya asked, Why are you so interested in the elephants, my lord? They are important for the impending war. They will play a big role, if they are as well trained as I hope. The Vasudev smiled and prodded his horse forward, leading the way to the enclosures. He was happy to see the son of the Nilkant interested in their war elephants. The Kshatriyas amongst the Vasudevs had revived the art of training them, much against the advice of the ruling Vasudev Pandits. These magnificent beasts had once formed the dominant core in Indian armies. However, counter-tactics had been developed in recent times that offset their fearsome power. Foremost amongst them was the use of specific drums which disturbed the elephants and made them run amok, resulting in casualties within their own ranks. Most armies had stopped using them, but it was undeniable that well-trained elephants could be devastating on a battlefield. Ganesh had heard about the skillfully trained elephants in the Vasudev army, but their famous reticence made it difficult to believe whether this was true or in fact just rumors. Kartik leaned close to his brother. But Dada, we've seen the elephants already when we rode them here from the Chambal. They are exceptionally well-trained and disciplined. Yes, they are, Kartik, answered Ganesh. But those were female elephants that are not used in war. They are used for domestic work like ferrying people or material. It is the male elephants that are required in times of war. Is that because they are more aggressive? Notwithstanding their otherwise calm temperament, elephants can be provoked, even trained to be more aggressive. It is difficult to train a female elephant to be more aggressive though, for she will kill only with a good reason. For example, when her offspring is threatened. A male elephant, however, can be trained to be belligerent far more easily. Why is that so? asked Kartik. Are they less intelligent in comparison? Well, I have heard that on average, the female of the species is smarter. But it's a little more complicated. 
Elephant herds are matriarchal, and it's usually the oldest female who makes all the decisions in the wild. When they will move, where they will feed, who remains in the herd and who gets kicked out. Kicked out? Yes. Male elephants are made to leave the herd when they reach adolescence. They either learn to fend for themselves or join nomadic male elephant herds. That's unfair. Nature is not concerned with fairness, Karthik. It's only interested in efficiency. The male elephant is not much used to the herd. The females are quite capable of defending themselves and taking care of each other's calves. The male is only required when a female wants to have a child. So how do they... During the mating season, the female herd accepts a few nomadic male elephants for some time so that the females can get impregnated. Then the males are abandoned once again. Karthik shook his head. That's so cold. Well, that's the way it is. The female wild elephants have well-defined social behavior and group dynamics, enforced by the matriarch. The male elephant, on the other hand, is a nomad with no ties to anyone of his kind. Since he is usually a loner, he would have to be much more aggressive to survive. Therefore, he's more difficult to break and one needs to catch him young. But once he's broken in, he's much easier to handle and remains loyal to the Mahut, his rider. More importantly, unlike a female elephant, he will kill without sufficient reason, just because his Mahut orders him to do so. My lords, said the Vasudev Kshatriya, interrupting the conversation as he pointed forward. The elephant stables. I guess you already know what I suspect is evil, said Shiva, looking at Gopal sitting across the small ritual fire. I wouldn't be much of a mind reader if I didn't, smiled Gopal. But I suppose you are more interested in knowing if I agree. Yes, and if you do, what are your reasons? Well, first things first. Of course we agree with you. Every single Vasudev agrees with you. Why? We are faithful followers of the institution of the Mahadev. We have to agree with you once you have the right answer. Shiva caught on to something. Once I have the right answer. Yes, despite so many challenges, you have arrived at the right answer to the question posed to every Mahadev. What is evil? Does that mean you were already aware of the right answer? Of course. What I did not know were the answers to the question posed to me. The questions for the institution of the Vishnu are very different. The Mahadev's key question is, what is evil? For the Vishnu, there are two key questions. What is the next great good? And when does good become evil? When? Yes. While a Mahadev is an outsider, a Vishnu has to be an insider. His job is to use a great good to create a new way of life and then lead men to that path. The great good could be anything, a new technology like the Devi Astras or a creation like the Somras. It could even be a philosophy. Most leaders just follow what has been ordained by a previous Vishnu. But once in a while, a Vishnu emerges who uses a great good to create a new way of life. Lord Ram used more than one, such as the idea that we can choose our own community rather than being stuck with the community that we are born into. He also allowed for the widespread use of the Somras so that not just the elite, but everyone could benefit from its powers. But remember, great good will, more often than not, lead to great evil. I understood that from the teachings of Lord Manu. I'd like to hear your reasons for why this is so. We have a philosophical book in our community that answers this question beautifully. It contains the teachings of great philosophers who we have revered over the centuries, like Lord Hari and Lord Mohan. It also contains the teachings of the chiefs of the Vasudev tribe, beginning with our founder, Lord Vasudev. The book is called The Song of Our Lord. Song of Our Lord? Yes, it is called the Bhagavad Gita in Old Sanskrit. The Gita has a beautiful line that encapsulates what I want to convey. Ati Sarvatra Varjayat Excess should be avoided. Excess of anything is bad. Some of us 
are attracted to good. But the universe tries to maintain balance. So what is good for some may end up being bad for others. Agriculture is good for us humans as it gives us an assured supply of food. But it is bad for the animals that lose their forest and grazing land. Oxygen is good for us as it keeps us alive. But for anaerobic creatures that lived billions of years ago, it was toxic and it destroyed them. Therefore, if the universe is trying to maintain balance, we must aid this by ensuring that good is not enjoyed excessively. Or else, the universe will rebalance itself by creating evil to counteract good. That is the purpose of evil. It balances the good. Why can't there be a good that does not create evil? Why can't we establish a way of life that does not imbalance the universe? That is impossible. Our being alive itself creates imbalances. In order to live, we breathe. When we breathe, we take in oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. Aren't we creating an imbalance by doing so? Isn't carbon dioxide evil for some? The only way we can stop creating evil is if we stop doing good as well. If we stop living completely. But if we have been born, then it is our duty to live. Let us look at it from the perspective of the universe. The only time the universe was in perfect balance was at the moment of its creation. And the moment before that was when it had just been destroyed. For that was when it was in perfect imbalance. Creation and destruction are the two ends of the same moment. And everything between creation and the next destruction is the journey of life. The universe's dharma is to be created, live out its life till its inevitable destruction and then be created once again. We are a downscaled version of the universe. These are just theories, Pandaji. Yes, they are. But they explain a lot of things that otherwise seem abstruse. Even if I were to agree with you, how would it work at our level? We are minuscule compared to the universe. Yes, that is true. But the universe lives within us in a minute model of itself. Good and evil are a way of life for every living entity, including us. Our creation and destruction is through good and evil, through balance and imbalance. This is true for animals, plants, planets, stars, everything. What makes us humans special is that we can choose how to control good and evil. Most creatures are not given that opportunity. There were giant creatures that lived on Earth many millions of years ago. Climate change made them extinct. We have good reason to believe that they were not responsible for this, but were victims of the evil which suddenly reared its head. Humans, however, have been blessed with intelligence, the greatest gift of the Almighty. This allows us to make choices. We have the power to consciously choose good and improve our lives. We also have the ability to stop evil before it destroys us completely. Our relationship with nature is different from that of other living creatures. Others have nature's will forced upon them. We have the privilege, at times, of forcing our will upon nature. We can do this by creating and using good like we created agriculture. What is forgotten, however, is that many times the good we create leads to the evil that will destroy us. Is that where the Mahadev comes in? Yes. Good emerges from creative thinkers and scientists like Lord Brahma. But it needs a Vishnu to harness that good and lead humanity on the path of progress. Paradoxically, imbalance in society is embedded in this very progress. At other times, a Vishnu arises and intervenes to move society away from the evil which good may be leading it to. He creates an alternative good. By diluting the potency and hence the toxic effects of the Somra's waste, Braspati was attempting just such an intervention. Had he succeeded, we Vasudevs would inevitably have helped him fulfill that mission. A new way of life 
based on a benign Sumras would have been established. Alas, Praspati did not succeed and that path is closed. There exists only the path of the Mahadev now to confront and then lead people away from the good that has now become evil. So, a Vishnu can make people move away from a good that has turned evil by offering an alternate good. But a Mahadev has to ask people to give up a good without offering anything in return. Yes, and that is not an easy thing to do. The Somras is still good for a lot of people. It increases their lifespan dramatically and enables them to lead youthful, disease-free and productive lives. But it is evil for society as a whole. We are asking people to sacrifice their selfish interests for the sake of a greater good, while giving them nothing in return. This requires an outsider, a leader who people will follow blindly. This requires a God who excites fervent devotion. This requires the Mahadev. So, you always knew the Somras was evil. We always knew it would eventually become evil. What we didn't know is when. Remember, good needs to run its course. If we remove a good too early from society, we are obstructing the march of civilization. However, if we remove it too late, we risk the complete destruction of society. So, in the battle against evil, the institution of the Vishnu has to wait for the institution of the Mahadev to decide if the time has come. In our case, a Mahadev emerged and his quest led him to the conclusion that the Somras is evil. Therefore, we knew that it was time for evil to be removed. The Somras had to be taken out of the equation. Ganesh, Karthik and Braspati stood at the entrance to the elephant stables. There were ten circular enclosures, built of massive stone blocks. Each enclosure could house between 800 to 1,000 animals. Five of the enclosures were for the female elephants and their calves. The remaining five were reserved for the male elephants that were regularly trained for war. The female elephant enclosures had massive pools of water at their center, allowing the beasts to submerge, have a mud bath and splay themselves with water. The area around the pools was also a social meeting point for the animals. Piles of nutritious leaves around the central pool catered to the voluminous appetites of the animals. The female elephants were also taken to the jungle in small herds to feast on fresh vegetation. These outings also allowed the beasts to rub their skin against trees which would scale off their dead skin. The resting areas in the female enclosure did not have partitions and they were allowed to mix freely. They usually grouped into herds led by their specific matriarchs. The enclosures for the male elephants though were completely different. To begin with, the shelters were partitioned into separate sections for each elephant. The animal's individual Mahut lived just above the elephant's enclosure, spending practically all his time with the beast under his control. This developed an attachment on the part of the elephant for his Mahut. The beasts were not expected to do any work. They did not rub their skin against rocks and trees to scrub the dead skin off. Instead, the Mahouts bathed them daily. They did not walk to a central area for their meals. Instead, freshly cut plants were supplied to them outside their own specific shelter. The male elephants had only one task, train for war. The central area of the male elephant enclosures had been suitably prepared for that purpose. There was a pool of water in the central enclosure, just like in the female enclosure. But the pool was much deeper. Here, the elephants were taught to put their inborn swimming skills to better use. They were taught to ram and sink boats. Around the pool were massive training grounds, where the elephants were trained for specific tasks, like mowing down opposing army lines. They were also toughened to survive the heat of battle. The Vasudevs were aware of the recent widespread use of drums with low-frequency sounds to trouble elephants and drive them crazy. To combat this, the Vasudevs had developed an innovative earplug for them. Furthermore, the elephants were also subjected 
to a daily bout of low-frequency war drums to help them get used to the sounds. Ganesh, Karthik and Braspati were led into one of the male elephant enclosures. The Vasudev led them directly to one of the animals that he was personally proud of. As he reached the enclosure, he called out to the Mahut, instructing him to bring the elephant out of his shelter. The Mahut immediately did so, sitting proudly on top of the beast just behind his head. To Ganesh's surprise, the elephant's eyes had been covered by its headgear. The Vasudev Kshatriya clarified that the covers could be removed easily by the Mahut from his position. It was used when they wanted the elephant to act solely on the Mahut's instructions and not based on what it saw. A metallic cylindrical ball was tied to its trunk with a bronze chain. The Vasudev then proceeded to set up a round wooden board as a target. It was roughly three times the size of a human head. You may want to step back, said the Vasudev to the assemblage. As the visitors stepped back, the Vasudev looked towards the Mahut and nodded. The man gently pressed his feet into the back of the elephant's ears in a series of instructions. The elephant stepped languidly up to the wooden target and shook his head, acknowledging the orders. Then, all of a sudden, with the speed of lightning, it swung its mighty trunk, hitting the wooden board smack in the center with a metallic ball, smashing the target to smithereens. Karthik whistled softly in appreciation. Ganesh looked toward the Vasudev. Can we make the target a little more interesting? The Vasudev was so confident of his elephant that he immediately agreed. Another wooden target was brought in, but placed on a board with wheels at the bottom, as Ganesh had instructed. He painted a smaller circle on the wooden board as a target. It was the size of a human head. In addition, Ganesh asked for the metallic ball tied to the elephant's trunk to be painted a bright red. Thus, they'd know exactly where the ball would hit the target. The Mahat was tasked with ensuring that the elephant struck the smaller circle with his metallic ball, even as two other soldiers moved the ball around with long ropes. The target simulated a man trying to avoid the elephant's blow. If the elephant could be used to kill a specific man rather than for mass butchery, then one could target the leader of an opposing army, rendering it headless. Everyone stepped back. The Mahot kept his eyes pinned to the board as he issued instructions through his feet, making the elephant move slowly towards the target. The soldiers with the ropes were alternately pulling and releasing their lines, keeping the target in constant motion. Suddenly, the Mahot dug in deep with his right foot and the elephant swung his mighty trunk. The metallic ball hit the center of the wooden board. It was a killer blow. Ganesh smiled and swore in the name of the legendary Lord of the Animals. By the great Pashupatinath himself, what an elephant! Chapter 8 Who is Shiva? What if I had arrived at a different answer? asked Shiva. Then we would have known that it is not yet time for evil to have risen, answered Gopal, that the Somras is still a force for good. Isn't that rather simplistic? Did you really believe that a random, untested foreigner would arrive at the right answer to the most important question of this age? Is this the way the system works? Gopal smiled. In truth, no. The system is very different. If I am not mistaken, one of the Vasudev Pandits has told you about the Vayuputras. Just like we are the tribe left behind by the previous Vishnu, the Vayuputras are the tribe left behind by the previous Mahadev, Lord Rudra. The institutions of the Vishnu and the Mahadev work in partnership with each other. The Vasudevs interact closely with the Vayuputras. We defer to them for the question that has been reserved by Lord Manu for them. What is evil? And they defer to us for the question that has been reserved for us. What is the next great good? The Vayuputras control the institution of the Nilkant. They train possible candidates for the role of the Nilkant and if they believe that evil has arisen, they allow the identification of a Nilkant. 
Kali did tell me about this. But how do the Vayuputras engineer a man's throat turning blue at a time of their choosing? I have heard that they administer some medicine to the candidate as he enters adolescence. The effect of this medicine remains dormant in his throat for years till it manifests itself on his drinking the somras at a specific age. I believe the somras reacts with the traces of the medicine already present in the man's throat to make his neck appear blue. All of these activities have to be done at specific time periods in the man's life if this is to happen the way it has been conceptualized. For example, if a man drinks the somras more than 15 years after adolescence, his throat will not turn blue, even if he had taken the Vayuputra medicine as a child. Shiva's eyes open wide. This is seriously complicated. It's a means by which the system could be controlled. As you can imagine, it is only the Vayuputras who could control the process such that a man's throat would turn blue at the appointed hour. People's blind faith in the legend would ensure that they would follow the Nilkant and evil would be taken out of the equation. I must mention that for some time now, we had begun to believe that the Somras was turning evil. But we do not control the institution of the Nilkant. The Vayuputras do. And they believed that the Somras was still good. Therefore, they refused to release their Nilkant nominee. Even though we were convinced that it was time for the Nilkant to appear, it did not happen. Did you present your case to the Vayuputras? We did, but they did not agree. The only alternative available to us was to try and find a solution by the Vishnu method of creating another good. That is what we were deeply engaged with when an event occurred that stunned everyone, including the Vayuputras. Shiva pointed at himself. I suddenly emerged out of nowhere. Yes, nobody really understood what had happened. We knew you were not a Vayuputra authorized candidate. Many Vayuputras, in fact, believed that you were a fraud who would be exposed soon enough. Some even wanted you assassinated in the interests of the institution of the Nilkant. But the leader of the Vayuputras, the Mitra, prevailed upon them and decreed that you be allowed to live out your karma. Why would the Mitra do that? I don't know. That is a mystery. There was a lot of debate amongst us as well. Some of us believed that your emergence proved us right and we should use you to take the Somras out of the equation. There were others who thought that you were an unknown entity who could use the Nilkant legend to create chaos. Therefore, we should have nothing to do with you. But there were also those amongst us who believed it is not our job to determine the fate of evil. That is the sole preserve of the Nilkant. Still others debated against us that you were, after all, with due apologies, a mere barbarian, and chances were you'd arrive at an incorrect conclusion as to what constituted evil. But the view that finally prevailed was that if the Paramatma has chosen to make you the Nilkant, he will also lead you to the right answer. And we should, with all humility, accept that. And I arrived at the Sombras. Doesn't it make the decision obvious then? You were not marked for this task. Yet somehow, you were given the Vayuputra medicine at the right age. Furthermore, you also arrived in Maluha at the appropriate time and were administered the Somras that made your throat turn blue. You were not trained for the role of Nilkant. Nobody gave you the answer to the key question. We consciously refused to say anything that would create a bias in your mind. We were very careful in our communications with you regarding your task. And yet, you arrived at the right answer. Isn't this ample proof that you have been chosen by the Paramatma and that you are truly the Mahadev? Doesn't it make my decision easy then that in following you, we are following the Paramatma himself? Shiva leaned back on his chair, rubbing his forehead. His brow felt uncomfortable. On returning from their short tour of Ajayan, Braspati, Ganesh and Karthik joined Sati, Nandi and Parshuram at the guest house. How is the city, Braspati ji? asked Sati. 
beautiful and well organized, answered Braspati. This city is a better rendition of Lord Ram's principles than even Meluha and Panchavati. Sathi turned to Ganesh and Karthik. My sons, did you like the city? Ganesh's tactical mind reflected in his opinion. Though Jain is nice, what fascinated me were the elephant stables. We watched the Mahuts tend to these beasts of war, each one of the five thousand of them equivalent to a thousand foot soldiers. I dare say our strength has increased manifold, given that the Vasudevs follow the Nilkant. With these elephants on our side, we are not as precariously placed as we were earlier. Precariously placed? asked Parshuram. Lord Ganesh, forgive me for disagreeing with you, but how can you say that? We have the Nilkant with us. That means a vast majority of Indians will be with us. I would say that the odds overwhelmingly favor us. Parshuram, I have always admired your bravery and your utter devotion to the Nilkant. But hope alone does not win battles. Only an honest evaluation of one's weaknesses, followed by their mitigation, can win the day. What weaknesses can we have? We are led by the Nilkant. The people will follow him. The people will follow the Nilkant, but their kings won't. And remember, the people do not control the army. Kings do. Emperor Daksh is already turning against us. So is Emperor Dilipa. Together, they have the technological wizardry of Meluha and the sheer numbers of Swadeep. That makes a very strong army. But Tada, argued Kartik, even the most capable army is of little use if it is led by incapable leaders. Do you see any good generals on their side? I see none. Ganesh shook his head and looked at Braspati and Nandi before turning back to Kartik. They have the best. They have Lord Parvateshwar. Sati burst in angrily. Ganesh, I have warned you to desist from insulting Pitratulya. I know he's like a father to you, Ma, said Ganesh politely. But the truth is, Lord Parvateshwar will fight for Meluha. No, he will not. Your father trusts him completely. How can you believe he will escape and join those who tried to kill the Nilkant? Ma, Parvateshwarji has too much honor to escape. He will leave openly once he has revealed his intentions to Baba. And trust me, Baba will let him go. He will not even try to stop him. For they are both honorable men who would rather bring harm upon themselves than forsake their honor. Indeed, he is an honorable man, Ganesh. Will that sense of duty not bind him to the path of the Nilkant? No. Parvateshwarji is with Baba because he is inspired by him, not because he is honor-bound to follow him. He is supremely committed to one value alone, as in fact all Meluhans are, the protection of Meluha. You can ask any of the Meluhans here. Nandi's eyes flashed with anger as the normally affable man stared at Shiva's son, his eyes unblinking. Lord Ganesh, I have already made my choice. I live for the Nilgant and I will die for the Nilgant. If that means I have to oppose my country, so be it. I will face my karma for having betrayed my country, but I will not have you questioning my loyalty again. Ganesh immediately reached out to Nandi. I was not questioning your loyalty, brave Nandi. I was wondering how you think General Parvateshwar will react. I don't know how the general thinks. I only know what I think, Nandi bristled. Well, I know how Parvateshwar thinks, said Braspati. I realize this will hurt you, Sati, but Ganesh is right. Parvateshwar will not abandon Meluha. In fact, he will battle those who seek to hurt Meluha. And if Shiva, as I hope, decides that the Somras is evil, then Meluha will be our primary enemy. The battle lines are drawn, my child. Wordlessly, Sati looked out of the window at the Vishnu temple and sighed. Shiva rubbed his throbbing brow as he pondered over the mystery of his childhood. Gobal bent forward. What is it, great Nilkant? It is not the hand of fate, Panditji, said Shiva. Neither is it the grand plan of the Paramatma that I emerged as the Nilkant. I suspect it was my uncle's doing, though how he did all this is a mystery to me. What do you mean? I remember being administered some medicine in my childhood by my uncle. I used to suffer severe burning between my brows from when I was very young. My uncle's medicine helped me calm the burning sensation. 
The throbbing persists to this day, but it is not as bad as it used to be. I still recall his words as he readied the medicine. We will always remain faithful to your command, Lord Rudra. This is the blood oath of Avayuputra. Then he pricked his index finger and let the blood drop into the potion. It was this mix that he gave to me and bade me rub it into the back of my throat. Gopal's eyes had been pinned on Shiva, fascinated. He briefly looked at the Vasudev Pandit from the Ayodhya temple, who was sitting in the first row. The Ayodhya Vasudev spoke up. Great Nilkant, what was the name of your uncle? Monobhu, said Shiva. The stunned Ayodhya Vasudev turned to Gopal. In the great name of Lord Ram! What is it? asked a surprised Shiva. Lord Manubhu was your uncle? asked Gopal. Lord Manubhu? He was a Vayuputra lord, one of the Amartya Shpand, a member of the council of six wise men and women who ruled the Vayuputras under the leadership of the Mitra. He was a Vayuputra lord? Yes, he was. Many years ago, when we were still trying to convince the Vayuputras about the Somras having turned evil, he was the only one amongst the Amartya Shpand who had agreed with us. Unfortunately, he got no support from the others in the council. The Mitra had also overruled Lord Manubhu. What happened thereafter? I remember that conversation as if it happened yesterday, said Lord Gopal. Lord Manubhu and I had spoken for hours about the Somras. It was obvious that we would not be able to convince the council. He had promised that he would ensure a Nilkant arose. When I asked him how he would do it, he had said that Lord Rudra would help him. He made me promise that when the Nilkant did rise, the Vasudevs and I would support him wholeheartedly. I had assured him that this was our duty in any case. And then what happened? Lord Manubhu disappeared. Nobody knew what happened to him. Some believe that he had gone back to his homeland of Tibet since he had been isolated in the Vayuputra council. Some thought he had been killed. I tended to believe the latter, for only death could have stopped a man like him from fulfilling his promise. But he did not fail. He created you. Where is he now? How did he contrive to get you invited to Meluha and receive the Somras? He didn't. He died many years ago at a peace conference in a cowardly ambush mounted on him by the Pakratis, our local enemies in Tibet. Then how were you invited into Meluha within that specific period? As I've told you, your throat could turn blue only if you drank the Somras within 15 years of entering adolescence. I don't know, answered Shiva. Nandi just happened to come to Mansarovar at that time, asking for immigrants. Gopal looked up at the central pillar of the temple, towards the idols of Lord Ram and Lady Sita. It is obvious then. It was the will of the Almighty that events unfolded the way they did. Shiva looked at Gopal, his eyes revealing his skepticism that his life was somehow all part of a divine plan. Gopal tactfully changed the topic. My friend, you said that your brow has throbbed from a very young age. Did it happen after a specific incident? Did your uncle give you something which started the burning sensation? Shiva frowned. No, I've had it for as long as I can remember. I think from when I was born. Whenever I'd get upset, my brow would start throbbing. Would this happen when your heart rate went up dramatically? Shiva thought about it for a second. Yes, whenever I'm angry or upset, my heart does beat dramatically. Or when I think of Sati, but that is a happy heartbeat. Gopal smiled. Which means your third eye has been active from the time of your birth, and that is very rare. It convinces me that you are the one chosen by the Paramatma. Third eye? It is the region between one's brows. It is believed that there are seven chakras or vortices within the human body which allow the reception and transmission of energy. The sixth chakra is called the Ajna chakra, the vortex of the third eye. These chakras are activated by yogis after years of practice. Of course, they can also be activated by medicines. 
The Vayuputras use medicines to activate the third eye of those amongst their young who are potential candidates. But in all my 140 years, I have yet to hear of a child born with his third eye active. So what is so special about that? It just causes me trouble. It burns dreadfully. Kopal smiled. That is just a small side effect. I believe that your active third eye could be one of the reasons why your uncle thought you may have been the chosen one, for it set your body up to easily accept the Vayuputra medicine. How so? The Parian system of medicine believes that the pineal gland, which exists deep within our brain, is the third eye. It is a peculiar gland. The cortical brain is divided into two equal hemispheres, within which most components exist in pairs. The singular pineal gland, however, is present between the two hemispheres. It is a little like an eye and is impacted by light. Darkness activates it and light inhibits it. A hyperactive pineal gland is regenerative. This is probably what made your body such that the somras did not only lengthen your life, but also repaired your injuries. Furthermore, the pineal gland is not covered by the blood barrier system. Blood barrier system? Yes. One's blood flows freely throughout the body. But there is a barrier when it approaches the brain. Perhaps this is so as to prevent germs and infections from affecting the brain, the seat of one's soul. However, the pineal gland, despite being lodged between the two hemispheres, is not covered by the blood barrier system. It is obvious why your third eye throbs when you are upset. This is the result of blood gushing through your hyperactive pineal gland. Shiva nodded slowly. Does this happen to others? Yes, it does. But only amongst those who practice decades of yoga to train their third eye. Or it is active amongst those who are given medicines to stimulate it. What is unnatural about your case is that you were born with an active third eye. This is unheard of. Shiva shifted uneasily in his chair. So, a congenital event just set me up for this role. My uncle could have got it all wrong. I could still be an erroneous choice, and maybe I will not achieve the purpose set out for me. But I am sure your uncle did not give you the medicine merely because of your active third eye. He would have judged your character and found you worthy. He must have trained you for this. I was trained by him, no doubt. He taught me ethics, warfare, psychology, arts. But he did not say anything to me about my purported task. You must concede he did an excellent job, though, for you have done well as a Nilkant. Just luck, said Shiva wryly. Great Nilkant. A non-believer will credit luck for one's achievements. But a believer in the Paramatma, like me, will know that the Nilkant has achieved all that he has because the Paramatma willed it. And that means that the Nilkant will complete his journey and eventually succeed in taking evil out of the equation. Shiva smiled. Sometimes faith can lean towards over simplicity. Gopal smiled in return. Maybe simplicity is what this world needs right now. Shiva laughed softly and looked at the audience of Vasudev Pandits, listening to the two of them with rapt attention. Well, many of my doubts have been cleared. The Somras is the greatest good, and will therefore, one day, certainly emerge as the greatest evil. But how do we know that the moment has arrived? How can we be sure? One of the Vasudev Pandits answered, We can never be completely sure, Great Nilkant. But if you allow me to express an opinion, we have had a good which has had a glorious journey for thousands of years and humanity has grown tremendously with its munificence. However, we also know that it is close to becoming evil now. It is possible that the Somras is taken out of the equation a trifle early and the world will lose out on a few hundred years of additional good that it could do. But that pales in comparison to the enormous contribution it has already made for thousands of years. On the other hand, there is the risk that the Somras is getting closer to evil and is likely to lead to chaos and destruction. 
it is already causing it in substantial measure. I am not merely referring to the plague of Branga or the deformities of the Nagas. It is believed that the Somras is also responsible for the drastic fall in the birth rate of the Meluhans. Really? Yes, answered Gopal. Perhaps in refusing to embrace death, they pay the price of not seeing their own genes propagate. Shiva acknowledged that he'd understood with a gentle nod. The massive images of Lord Ram and Lady Sita that formed the carved central pillar seemed to smile at him. Accepting their blessings, his eyes were drawn further towards a grand painting depicting Lord Ram at the feet of Lord Rudra in the backdrop of Holy Rameshwaram. Shiva smiled at the giant circle of life. He joined his hands together in a respectful namaste, closed his eyes and prayed, Jai Ma Sita, Jai Shri Ram. Shiva was resolute as he opened his eyes and beheld Gopal. I have made my decision. We will strive to avoid war and needless bloodshed. But should our efforts prove futile, we shall fight to the last man. We will end the reign of the Somras. Chapter 9 The Love Struck Barbarian Your uncle was a Vayuputra lord? asked an amazed Sati. Sati and Shiva were in their private chambers. Shiva had just related his entire conversation with the Vasudevs and the decision that he had arrived at. Not just an ordinary lord, smiled Shiva, and a Martya Shpand. Sati raised her arms and rested them on Shiva's muscular shoulders, her eyes teasing. I always knew there was something special about you, that you couldn't have been just another rough tribal. And now I have proof. You have pedigree. Shiva laughed loudly, holding Sati close. Rubbish! You thought I was an uncouth barbarian when you first laid your eyes on me. Sati edged up on her toes and kissed Shiva warmly on his lips. Oh, you are still an uncouth barbarian. Shiva raised his eyebrows. But you're my uncouth barbarian. Shiva's face lit up with a crooked smile he reserved for Sati. The smile that made her weak in the knees. He held her tight and lifted her up close to his lips. Her feet dangling in the air, they kissed languidly, warm and deep. You are my life, whispered Shiva. You are the sum of all my lives, said Sati. Shiva continued to hold her up in the air, embracing her tight, resting his head on her shoulders. Sati had her arms around her husband, her fingers running circles in his hair. So, are you going to let me down sometime? asked Sati. Shiva just shook his head in answer. He was in no hurry. Sati smiled and rested her head on his shoulders, content to let her feet dangle in mid-air, playing with Shiva's hair. Here you go, said Sati. Shiva took the glass of milk from her. He liked his milk raw. No boiling, no jaggery, no cardamom, nothing but plain milk. Shiva drained the glass in large gulps, handed it to Sati and sank back on his chair with his feet up on the table. Sati put the glass down and sat next to him. Shiva looked across the balcony towards the Vishnu temple. He took a deep breath and turned to Sati. You're right. Much as I respect Ganesha's tactical thinking, this time he is wrong. Parvateshwar will not leave me. Sati nodded emphatically in agreement. Without an inspirational leader like him, the armies of Meluha and Swadweep, though strong, will lack motivation as well as sound battle tactics. That is true, but let us hope that the people themselves will rise up in rebellion and there will be no need for war. How can we ensure that though? If you send the proclamation banning the Somras to the kings, they will make sure that the general public will not know. That is exactly what the Vasudevs and I discussed. My proclamation should not only reach the royalty, but every citizen of India directly. The best way to ensure this is to display the proclamation in all the temples. All Indians visit temples regularly, and when they do, they will read my order. And I'm sure the people will be with you. Let's hope that the kings listen to the will of their people. Yes, I cannot think of another way to avoid war. I expect unflinching support from only the royalty of Kashi 
Panchavati and Branga. Every other king will make his choice based on selfish interests alone. Sati held Shiva's hand and smiled. But we have the king of kings, the Paramatma himself with us. We will not lose. We cannot afford to lose, said Shiva. The fate of the nation is at stake. Are you sure you can do this, Karthik? asked Ganesh. Karthik looked up at his brother with eyes like still waters. Of course I can. I'm your brother. Ganesh smiled and stepped away from the elephant mounting platform. Karthik and another diminutive Vasudev soldier were sitting on a howdah atop one of the largest bull elephants in the Ojan stables. The howdah had been altered from its standard structure. The roof had been removed and the side walls cut by half. This reduced the protection to the riders but dramatically improved their ability to fire weapons. Karthik had come up with an innovative idea that used the elephant as more than just a battering ram for enemy nines. Instead, it could be used as a high platform from which to fire weapons in all directions. This strategy envisioned a deliberate and coordinated movement of war elephants as opposed to a wild charge. The issue of the choice of weapons, however, remained. Arrows discharged from elephant back could never be so numerous as to cause serious damage. The Vasudev military engineers were ready with a solution. An innovative flamethrower which used a refined version of the liquid black fuel imported from Mesopotamia. This devastating weapon spewed a continuous stream of fire, burning all that stood in its path. The fuel tanks occupied a substantial part of the howdah, leaving just enough room for two such weapons and infantrymen. The flamethrowers were not just heavy but released intense heat while operational. Therefore, they required strong operators. But constraints of space in the howdah also meant that the operators be, perforce, of short stature. Karthik, along with such a soldier, had volunteered to man this potential inferno. Ganesh stood at a distance along with Parshuram, Nandi and Braspati. He shouted out to his brother, Are you ready, Karthik? Karthik shouted back, I was born ready, Dada. Ganesh smiled as he turned towards the Vasudev commander. Let's begin, pray Vasudev. The commander nodded and waved a red flag. Karthik and the Vasudev soldier immediately struck a flame and lit the weapons. Two devilishly long streams of fire burst out and reached almost 30 meters on both sides of the elephant. A protective covering around the elephant's sides ensured it did not feel the heat. Karthik and the Vasudev had been tasked with reducing some 30 mud statues to ashes. The enemy mud soldiers had been spread out to test the range and accuracy of the weapon. Though heavy, the fire weapons were surprisingly maneuverable. The Mahut concentrated on following Karthik's orders and the mud soldiers were reduced to ash in no time. Parshuram turned towards Ganesh. These can be devastating in war, Lord Ganesh. What do you think? Ganesh smiled as he borrowed a phrase from his father. Hell yes! We have transcribed your proclamation, Lord Nilkant, said Gopal. Gopal and Shiva were in the Vishnu temple near the central pillar. Shiva read the papyrus scroll. To all of you who consider yourselves the children of Manu and followers of the Sanatan Dharma, this is a message from me. Shiva, your Nilkant. I have travelled across our great land, through all the kingdoms we are divided into, met with all the tribes that populate our fair realm. I have done this in search of the ultimate evil, for that is my task. Father Manu had told us evil is not a distant demon. It works its destruction close to us, with us, within us. He was right. He told us evil does not come from down below and devour us. Instead, we help evil destroy our lives. He was right. He told us good and evil are two sides of the same coin. That one day, the greatest good will transform into the greatest evil. He was right. Our greed in extracting more and more from good turns it into evil. This is the universe's way of restoring balance. It is the Paramatma's way 
to control our excesses. I have come to the conclusion that the Somras is now the greatest evil of our age. All the good that could be wrung out of the Somras has been wrung. It is time now to stop its use before the power of its evil destroys us all. It has already caused tremendous damage from the killing of the Saraswati River to birth deformities to the diseases that plague some of our kingdoms. For the sake of our descendants, for the sake of our world, we cannot use the Somras anymore. Therefore, by my order, the use of the Somras is banned forthwith. To all those who believe in the legend of the Nilkant, follow me. Stop the Somras. To all those who refuse to stop using the Somras, know this. You will become my enemy. And I will not stop till the use of the Somras is stopped. This is the word of your Nilkant. Shiva looked up and nodded. This will be distributed to all the pundits in all the Vasudev temples across the Sap Sindhu, said Gopal. Our Vasudev Kshatriyas will also travel to other temples across the land. They will carry your proclamation, carved on stone tablets and fix them on the walls of temples. All of them will be put up on the same night, one year from now. The kings will have no way to control it, since it will be released simultaneously all over. Your word will reach the people. This is exactly what Shiva wanted. Perfect, Panditji. This will give us one year to prepare for war. I would like to be in Kashi when this proclamation is released. Yes, my friend. Until then, we need to prepare for war. I also need to use this one year to uncover the identity of my true enemy. Gopal frowned. What do you mean, great Nilkant? I don't believe that either Emperor Daksh or Emperor Dilipa is capable of mounting a conspiracy of this scale. They are obviously being led by someone. That person is my real enemy. I need to find him. I thought you knew who your real enemy is. Do you know his identity? Yes, I do. And you are right. He is truly dangerous. Is he so capable, Pandaji? A lot of people are capable, Nilkant. What makes a capable person truly dangerous is his conviction. If we believe that we are fighting on the side of evil, there is moral weakness in our mind. Somewhere deep within, the heart knows we are wrong. But what happens if we actually believe in the righteousness of our cause? What if your enemy genuinely believes that he is the one fighting for good and that you, the Nilkant, are fighting for evil? Shiva raised his eyebrows. Such a person will never stop fighting, just like I won't. Exactly. Who is this man? He is a Maharishi. In fact, most people in India revere him as a Saptarishi Uttradhikari, said Gopal, using the Indian term for the successors of the seven great sages of yore. His scientific knowledge and devotion to the Paramatma are second to none in the modern age. His immense spiritual power makes emperors quake in his presence. He leads a selfless, frugal life in Himalayan caves. He comes down to the plains only when he feels that India's interests are threatened, and he has spent the whole of last year in either Meluha or Ayodhya. Does he genuinely believe that the Somras is good? Yes, and he believes that you are a fraud. He knows that the Vayuputras did not select you. In fact, we believe that the Vayuputras are on his side. For who else could have given him the Deviastras that were used in the attack at Panchavati? Is there a possibility that he could have made the Deviastras himself? That is what I assumed must have happened. Trust me, that is not possible. Only the Vayuputras have the know-how to make the Deviastras. Nobody else does, not even us. Shiva stared at Gopal, stunned. I didn't expect the Vayuputras to support me. I'm not one of them. But I thought they would at least be neutral. No, my friend. We must assume that the Vayuputras are on the side of your enemy. They may even be in agreement with him about the Somra still being good. 
Shiva breathed deeply. This man sounded formidable. Who is he? Maharishi Bhrigu. Bhrigu's eyes scanned the distance, observing the Maluhan soldiers practicing their art. Daksha stood next to him with his eyes pinned to the ground. Maya Shrenik, the stand-in general of the Meluhan army, in the absence of Parvateshwar, was a few meters ahead. Brigo said softly, without turning towards Daksha, Your soldiers are exceptional, Your Highness. Daksha did not answer as he continued to study the ground. Brigo shook his head. Your Highness, I said that your soldiers are well trained. Daksh turned his attention towards Brigu. Of course, my lord. I had already mentioned this to you. There is no need to worry. To begin with, a war is unlikely. But even the possibility of war leaves little to fear. For I have the combined Ayodhyan and Meluhan armies at my command, which... We have much to fear, said Brigu, interrupting Daksh. Your soldiers are well trained, but they are not well led. But Maya Shrenik, Maya Shrenik is not a leader. He is a great second in command. He will follow orders unquestioningly and implement them effectively. But he cannot lead. But we need someone who can think, someone who can strategize, someone who is willing to suffer for the sake of the greater good. We need a leader. But I am their leader. Brigo looked contemptuously at Daksha. You are not a leader, Your Highness. Parvateshwar is a leader. But you sent him off with that fraud Nilkant. I don't know if he is alive, or even worse, if he has switched loyalties to that barbarian from Tibet. Daksh took offence at Brigo's criticism. Parvateshwar is not the only great warrior in Meluha, my lord. We can use Vidyunmali. He's a capable strategist and would make great general. I don't trust Vidyun Mali, and I'd like to suggest that Your Highness is hardly the best judge of people. Daksh promptly went back to studying the ground that had held his fascination a few moments back. Brigu took a deep breath. This discussion was pointless. Your Highness, I'm going to Ayodhya. Please make the arrangements. Yes, Maharishiji, said Daksh. Bhagirath and Anandamai were in the last clearing of the forests of Dandak. It would take a few more months to reach Branga and from there on Kashi. But the remaining journey was the last thing on Bhagirath's mind. What have they been talking about for so long? asked Bhagirath. Anandamai turned in the direction of Bhagirath's gaze. Ayurvati and Parvateshwar were gesticulating wildly. But the tone of their voices, true to Meluhan character, remained soft and polite. They seemed to be in the middle of an intense debate. Anandamai shook her head. I don't have supernatural abilities. I can't hear what she's saying. But I can take a good guess, said Bhagirath. I hope that Ayurvati succeeds. Anandamai turned towards Bhagirath, frowning. Ayurvati has already made her decision. She is with us. She is with the Mahadev. And now, I think, she is trying to convince Parvateshwar. Anandamai knew that her brother was probably right, but love was forcing her to hope. Bhagirath, Parvateshwar has not made his decision as yet. He is devoted to the Mahadev. Don't assume, trust me, if it comes down to a war and he has to choose between Lord Shiva and his precious Meluha, your husband will choose Meluha. Bhagirath, shut up! Bhagirath turned towards Anandamai, irritated. I'm only speaking the truth. That is a matter of opinion. I'm the crown prince of Ayodhya. Many will say my opinion is the truth. Anandamai tapped her brother on his head. And I, as the crown prince's elder sister, have the right to shut him up any time I choose. Parvateshwar, you have not thought this through, said Ayurati. Parvateshwar smiled sadly. I have not been thinking of much else in the last few months. I know the path that I must take. But will you be able to act against the living God you worship? Since there is no other choice, I must. 
But Lord Ram said that we must protect our faith. The Mahadevs and the Vishnus are living gods. How do we protect our religion if we do not fight alongside our living gods? You are confusing faith and religion. They are two completely different things. No, they are not. Yes, they are. The Sanatan Dharma is my religion, but it is not my faith. My faith is my country. My faith is Meluha, only Meluha. Ayurvati sighed and looked up at the sky. She shook her head and turned back towards Parvateshwar. I know how devoted you are to the Nilkant. Can you go to war against the Lord? Do you have it in your heart to even harm him? Parvateshwar breathed deeply, his eyes moist. I will fight all who seek to harm Meluha. If Meluha must be conquered, it will be over my dead body. Parvateshwar, do you really think that the Somras is not evil? That it should not be banned? No, I know it should be banned. I have already stopped using the Somras. I stopped using it the day Braspati told us about all the evil that it has been responsible for. Then why are you willing to fight to defend this Halahal? said Ayurvati, using an old Sanskrit term for the most potent poison in the universe. But I am not defending the Somras, said Parvateshwar. I am defending Meluha. But the both of them are on the same side, said Ayurvati. That is my misfortune. But defending Maluha is my life's purpose. This is what I was born to do. Parvateshwar, Maluha is not what it used to be. You are well aware of the fact that Emperor Daksh is no Lord Ram. You are fighting for an ideal that does not exist anymore. You are fighting for a country whose greatness lives on only in memory. You are fighting for a faith that has been corrupted beyond repair. That may be so, Ayurvati. But this is my purpose, to fight and die for Meluha. Ayurvati shook her head in irritation, but her voice was unfailingly polite. Parvateshwar, you are making a mistake. You are pitting yourself against your living God. You are defending the Somras, which even you believe has turned evil. And you are doing all this to serve some purpose. Does the purpose of defending Meluha justify all the mistakes that you know you are making? Parvateshwar spoke softly. Shreyansva dharma vigunaha para dharmat savunshtitat. Ayurvati smiled ruefully as she recalled the old Sanskrit shlok, a couplet attributed to Lord Hari, after whom the city of Hariyuppa had been named. It meant that it was better to commit mistakes on the path that one's soul is meant to walk on than to live a perfect life on a path that is not meant for one's soul. Discharge one's own swadharm, personal law, even if tinged with faults, rather than attempt to live a life meant for another. Ayurvati shook her head. How can you be so sure that this is your duty? Should you just be true to the role the world has foisted upon you? Aren't you blindly obeying what society is forcing you to do? Lord Hari also said that those who allow others to dictate their own duties are not living their own life. They are, in fact, living someone else's life. But that is exactly what you are doing. You are allowing others to dictate your duties. You are allowing Maluha to dictate the purpose of your soul. No, I am not. Yes, you are. Your heart is with Lord Shiva. Can you deny that? No, I can't. My heart is with the Nilkant. Then how do you know that protecting Maluha is your duty? Because I know, said Parvateshwar firmly. I just know that this is my duty. Isn't that what Lord Hari had said? Nobody in the world, not even God, can tell us what our duty is. Only our soul can. All we have to do is surrender to the language of silence and listen to the whisper of our soul. My soul's whisper is very clear. Meluha is my faith. Protecting my motherland is my duty. Ayurvati ran her hand over her bald pate, touching her choti, the knot of hair signifying Brahmin antecedents. She turned to look at Anandamai and Bhagirath in the distance. She knew that there was nothing more to be said. You will be on the losing side, Parvateshwar, said Ayurvati. I know. And you will be killed. 
I know. But if that is my purpose, then so be it. Ayurvati shook her head and touched Parvateshwar's shoulder compassionately. Parvateshwar smiled wanly. It will be a glorious death. I shall die at the hands of the Nilkant. Chapter 10 His Name Alone Strikes Fear Reclining in an easy chair, his legs outstretched on a low table, Shiva, along with Sati, contemplated the Ujjain temple from the chamber balcony. Ganesh leaned against the doorway while Karthik had balanced himself on the railing. Shiva had just related to his family his entire conversation with the Vasudevs, including the identity of their real enemy. The Nilkant looked up at the evening sky before turning towards Sati. Say something. What can I say? asked Sati. Lord Prigo, Lord Ram, be merciful. He can't be all that powerful. Sati looked up at Shiva. He is one of the Saptarishi Uttradhikaris. His spiritual and scientific powers are legendary. But it's not the fear of his powers which has shaken me. It is the fact that a man of his strength of character has chosen to oppose us. Why would you say that? He is singularly unselfish and a man of unimpeachable moral integrity. And yet, he sent five ships to eliminate us. Yes, he must truly believe that the Somras is good and we are evil to try and stop its usage. If he is convinced of it, could it be possible that we are wrong? Karthik was about to interject when Shiva raised his hand. No, said Shiva. I am sure. The Somras is evil and it has to be stopped. There is no turning back. But Lord Bhrigu, said Sati. Sati, why would a man of such immense moral character use the Devi Astras, which we all know have been banned by Lord Rudra himself? Sati looked at Shiva silently. Lord Brigo's attachment to the Somras has made him do this, said Shiva. He thinks he is doing it for the greater good. But in truth, he has become attached to the Somras. It is attachment that makes people forget not only their moral duties, but even who they really are. Karthik finally spoke up. Baba is right. And if this is what the Somras can do to a man of Lord Brigo's stature, then it surely must be evil. Shiva nodded before turning back to Sati. What we are doing is right. The Somras must be stopped. Sati didn't say anything. We need to concentrate our minds on the impending war, said Shiva. They admittedly have a leader of the caliber of Lord Brigo, along with the armies of Meluha and Ayodhya. The odds are stacked against us. How do we remedy this? Divide their capabilities, said Karthik. Go on. Karthik went into his bedchamber and returned with a map. Baba, would you please? As Shiva lifted his feet off the table, Karthik laid out the map and looked at Ganesh before speaking. Dada and I agreed that their strength lies in the technological wizardry of Meluha coupled with the sheer numbers of Ayodhya. If we can divide that, it would even out the odds. By ensuring that Meluha and Ayodhya joined hands and conspired to assassinate us at Panchavati, Lord Briku has played his cards well. When they realize that I am alive, they will be compelled to treat me as a common foe and hence ally with each other. After all, an enemy's enemy is a friend. Karthik smiled. I wasn't talking about breaking their alliance, Baba, but dividing their capabilities. Sati, who had been studying the map all this while, was struck by the obvious. Magad! Exactly, said Karthik, as he tapped on the location of Magad. The roads in Swadeep are either pathetic or non-existent. That is why the armies, especially the big ones, use rivers to mobilize. The Ayodhya army will not come to Meluha's aid by cutting through dense forests. They will sail down the Sarayu in ships, then up the Ganga, to the newly built pathway to Devagiri that Meluha has constructed. Shiva nodded. The Ayodhyan ships would have to pass Magad. 
at the confluence of the Sarayu and Ganga rivers. If Magad blockades that river, the ships will not be able to pass through. We can hold back their massive army with only a small naval force from Magad. Right, said Karthik. A smiling shiver patted Karthik on his shoulder. I'm impressed, my boy. Karthik smiled at his father. Sati looked at Shiva. We must first rally Prince Surapadman to our side. Bhagirath has told me it's the Magadan prince who makes all the decisions and not his father, King Mahindra. Shiva concurred before turning towards Ganesh. Ganesh remained silent. He seemed a little unsettled by this new development. That is a good idea, said Gopal. Shiva, Sati, Ganesh and Karthik were with Gopal at the Vishnu temple. It should be relatively easy to bring Magad to our side, continued Gopal. King Mahendra is old and indecisive, but his son, Surapadman, is a fearsome warrior and a brilliant tactician. And most importantly, he is a calculating and ambitious man. His ambition should make him smell the opportunities in the coming war, said Shiva. He can use it to bolster his position and declare independence from Ayodhya. Exactly, said Sati. Whatever may be the reason behind his choosing to back us, an alliance with him will help us win the war. Gopal suddenly noticed a pensive Ganesh. Lord Ganesh. Ganesh reacted with a start. Does something about this plan trouble you? asked Gopal. Ganesh shook his head. Nothing that needs to be mentioned at this point of time, Pandiji. Ganesh was worried that he had inadvertently ruined any likelihood of an alliance with Magad, for he had killed the elder Magadan prince, Ugrasen. He had done so while trying to save an innocent mother and her son from Ugrasen. He hoped Surapadman was not aware of his identity. Dada and I have discussed this, said Karthik, and we believe we should not assume Magad will come to our side. We should also be prepared to conquer Magad if need be. Well, hopefully, that situation will not arise, said Shiva, turning towards Ganesh. But yes, we should make contingent plans to fight Magad. It could be one of our opening gambits in the war. Then I shall start making plans for our departure to Magad, said Gopal. Are you going to come with us, Panditji? asked a surprised Shiva. That would reveal your allegiance openly. There was a time to remain hidden, my friend, said Gopal. But now we need to come out in the open, for the battle with evil is upon us. We have to pick our side openly. There are no bystanders in a holy war. Parvateshwar and Anandamai rode their favorite steeds, whispering to each other. He had leaned a bit to his right, holding Anandamai's hand. He had just told her that if it came to a war, he would have no choice but to fight on the side of Meluha. Anandamai, in turn, had told Parvateshwar that she would have no choice but to oppose Meluha. Aren't you even going to ask me why? asked Anandamai. Parvateshwar shook his head. I don't need to. I know how you think. Anandamai looked at her husband, her eyes moist. And I guess you know how I think, said Parvateshwar, for you didn't ask me either. Anandamai smiled sadly at Parvateshwar, squeezing his hand. What do we do now? asked Parvateshwar. Anandamai took a deep breath. Keep riding together. Parvateshwar stared at his wife. Till our paths allow us. Shiva leaned against the balustrade of the ship as it sailed gently down the chambal. Beyond the banks, he could see dense forests. There was no sign of human habitation for miles in any direction. He looked back at the five ships following them, a small part of the 50-ship Vasudev fleet. It had taken the Vasudevs a mere two months to mobilize for departure. What are you thinking, my friend? asked Gopal. Shiva turned to the chief Vasudev. I was thinking that the primary source of evil is human greed. It's our greed to extract more and more from good that turns it into evil. Wouldn't it be better if this was controlled at the source itself? Can we really expect humans to not be greedy? 
How many of us would be willing to control our desire to live for two hundred years? The dominance of the Somras over many thousands of years has admittedly done both good and evil, but it will soon perish for all practical purposes. Isn't it fair to say, then, that it has served no purpose in the larger scheme of things? Perhaps it would have been better had the Somras not been invented. Why embark on a journey when you know that the destination takes you back to exactly where you began? Are there any journeys which do not take you back to where you began? Shiva frowned. Of course they are. Gopal shook his head. If you aren't back to where you began, all it means is that the journey isn't over. Maybe it will take one lifetime, maybe many, but you will end your journey exactly where you began. That is the nature of life. Even the universe will end its journey exactly where it began, in an infinitesimal black hole of absolute death. And on the other side of that death, life will begin once again in a massive big bang. And so it will continue in a never-ending cycle. So what's the point of it all? But that is the biggest folly, great Nilkant, to think that we are on this path in order to get somewhere, aren't we? No, the purpose is not the destination, but the journey itself. Only those who understand this simple truth can experience true happiness. So you are saying that the destination, even purpose, does not matter? That the Somras had to just experience all this to create so much good for millennia and then to descend into creating evil in equal measure? And then to have a Nilkant rise who would end its journey? If one believes this, then in the larger scheme of things, the Somras has achieved nothing. Let me try to put it another way. I'm sure you're aware of how it rains in India, right? Of course I am. One of your scientists had explained it to me. I believe the sun heats the waters of the sea, making it rise in the form of gas. Large masses of this water vapor coalesce into clouds, which are then blown over land by monsoon winds. These clouds rise when they hit the mountains, thus precipitating as rain. Perfect. But you have only covered half the journey. What happens after the water has rained upon us? Shiva's knowing smile suggested that he was beginning to follow. Gopal continued. The water finds its way into streams and then rivers. And finally, the river flows back into the sea. Some of the water that comes as rain is used by humans, animals, plants, anything that needs to stay alive. But ultimately, even the water used by us escapes into the rivers and then back into the sea. The journey always ends exactly where it began. Now, can we say that the journey of the water serves no purpose? What would happen to us if the sea felt that there is no point to this journey, since it ends exactly where it begins? We would all die. Exactly. Now, one may be tempted to think that this journey of water results in only good, right? Whereas a Somras has caused both good and evil. But of course, Shiva smiled wryly, you would disabuse me of any such notion. Gopal smile was equally dry. What about the floods caused by rains? What about the spread of disease that comes with the rains? If we were to ask those who have suffered from floods and disease, they may hold that rain is evil. Excessive rains are evil, corrected Shiva. Gopal smiled and conceded. True. So, the journey of water from the sea back into the sea serves a purpose as it makes the journey of life possible on land. Similarly, the journey of the Somras served a purpose for many, including you. For your purpose is to end the journey of the Somras. What would you do if the Somras hadn't existed? I can think of so many things. Lazing around with Sati, for example. Or whiling away my time, immersed in dance and music. That would be a good life. Gopal laughed softly. But seriously, 
Hasn't the Somras given purpose to your life? Shiva smiled. Yes, it has. And your journey has given purpose to my life. For what is the point of being a chief Vasudev if I can't help the next Mahadev? Shiva smiled and patted Gopal on his back. Rather than the destination, it is the journey that lends meaning to our lives, great Nilkant. Being faithful to our path will lead to consequences, both good as well as evil. For that is the way of the universe. For instance, my journey may have a positive effect on the future of India, but it will certainly be negative for those who are addicted to the Somras. Perhaps that is my purpose. Exactly. Lord Vasudev had held that we should be under no illusion that we are in control of our own breathing. We should realize the simple truth that we are being breathed. We are being kept alive because our journey serves a purpose. When our purpose is served, our breathing will stop and the universe will change our form to something else so that we may serve another purpose. Shiva smiled. Chapter 11 The Branga Alliance Parvateshwar's entourage had sailed up the Madhumati to the point where it broke off from the mighty Branga River. There, they had dropped anchor as they waited for Bhagirath's return. Bhagirath's ship had turned east and sailed down the main distributary of the Branga, the massive Padma. A week later, his ship docked at the port of Branga Ridai, the capital city of the Branga kingdom. King Chandraketu had been informed of Bhagirath's arrival. The king of Branga had ensured that the prince of Ayodhya was escorted with due honor to his palace. As Bhagirath was led into the private palace rather than the formal court, he acknowledged that Chandraketu was not treating him as the crown prince of Swadweep, but as a friend. Bhagirath found Chandraketu waiting at the palace door along with his wife and daughter. The king of Branga folded his hands in a formal namaste. How are you doing, brave prince of Ayodhya? Bhagirath smiled and bowed his head as he returned the namaste. I'm doing well, your highness. Chandraketu looked at his consort with a fond smile. Prince Bhagirath, this is my wife, Queen Sneha. Bhagirath bowed towards Sneha. Greetings, your highness. A chivalrous Bhagirath then went down on one knee to face a six-year-old girl who looked at him with twinkling eyes. And who might this lovely lady be? Chandraketu smiled. That is my daughter, Princess Navya. Namaste, young lady, said Bhagirath. Navya slid behind her mother, hiding her face. Bhagirath smiled broadly. I am a friend to your father, my child. You don't have to be afraid of me. You smell funny, whispered Navya, sticking her face out. A startled Bhagirath burst into laughter. Chandraketu folded his hands together. My apologies, Prince Bhagirath. She can be a little direct sometimes. Bhagirath controlled his mirth. No, no, she's speaking the truth. He turned to Navya. But young lady, I was always taught to be polite to strangers. Don't you think that's important as well? Politeness does not mean lying, said Navya. Lord Ram had said we should always speak the truth, always. Bhagirath raised his eyebrows in surprise before turning to Chandra Ketu. Wow! Quoting Lord Ram at this age? She's smart. Well, she is very intelligent, said an obviously proud Chandraketu. Bhagirath turned fondly towards Navya. Of course, you're right, my child. I carry the odor of a long and rigorous voyage. I will make sure I bathe before I meet you next. You will not find my smell offensive the next time I wager. Chandraketu laughed. Be warned, great prince. Little Navya has never lost a bet. Navya smiled at her mother. He does not seem all that bad, Ma. I guess not all Ayodhyan royals are bad. Bhagirath laughed once again. King Chandraketu, I think we should retire to your chambers before any more assaults are made upon my dignity. A smiling Chandraketu nodded to his wife and then turned to Bhagirath. Come with me, Prince Bhagirath. Papa, whispered Ganesh. Ganesh had just entered Shiva's chambers in the central ship of the joint Vasudev Naga convoy. Shiva looked up as he put the palm leaf book aside. 
What is it, my son? A nervous Ganesh whispered, I need to speak to you. Shiva pointed to the chair next to him as he lifted his feet off the table. Ganesh took a deep breath. Baba, there may be some complications with Magad. Shiva smiled. I was wondering when you were going to bring that up. Ganesh frowned. You knew? I knew Ugrasen was killed by Anaga. I understand. That complicates things. Ganesh kept silent. Well, do you know who killed him? If it was a criminal act, then we should support Surapadman. Not only would justice be served, but it would also help pull Magad to our side. Ganesh didn't say anything. Shiva frowned. Ganesh? It was me, confessed Ganesh. Shiva's eyes widened. Well, this certainly complicates things. Ganesh stayed mute. Did you have a good reason? Yes, I did, Baba. What was it? The Chandravanshi nobility has always patronized the tradition of bull racing. In the quest for the lightest riders, the sport has degenerated to the extent that innocent young boys are being kidnapped and forced to ride the charging bulls. This cruel sport has left innumerable children maimed and some have even died painful deaths. Shiva looked at Ganesh in horror. What kind of barbaric men would do that to children? Men like Ugrasen. I found him trying to kidnap a young boy. The boy's mother was refusing to let him go, so Ugrasen and his men were on the verge of killing her. I had no choice. Shiva recalled something that Kali had mentioned. Is that the time when you were seriously injured? Yes, Baba. Shiva breathed deeply. Ganesh had once again shown tremendous character, fighting injustice even at risk to his own life. Shiva was proud of his son. You did the right thing. I'm sorry if I have complicated the issue. Shiva smiled and shook his head. What happened, Baba? The ways of the world are really strange, said Shiva. You protected an innocent child and his mother from an immoral prince. The Bhagadans, though, did not hesitate to spread a lie that Ugrasan died defending Magad from a Naga terrorist attack. And people chose to believe that lie. Ganesh shrugged his shoulders. The Nagas have always been treated this way. The lies never stop. Shiva looked up at the ceiling of his cabin. What do we do now? asked Ganesh. Nothing different. We'll stick to the plan. Let us hope that Surapadman is ambitious enough to realize where the interests of Magad lie. Ganesh nodded. And you stay in Kashi, continued Shiva. Don't come with us to Magad. Yes, Baba. Fists clenched, Chandraketu tried hard to suppress the anger welling up within him. Bhagirath had just told him about the Somra's waste being responsible for the plague that had been devastating Branga for generations. By all the fury of Lord Rudra, growled Chandraketu, my people have been dying for decades. Our children have suffered from horrific diseases and our aged have endured agonizing pain. All so that privileged Meluhans can live for two hundred years? Bhagirath stayed silent allowing Chandraketu to vent his righteous anger. What does the Lord Nilkant have to say? When do we attack? I will send word to you, Your Highness, said Bhagirath. But it will be soon, perhaps in a few months. You must mobilize your army and be ready. We will not only mobilize our army, but every single Branga who can fight. This is not just a war for us. This is vengeance. My sailors are unloading some gifts from the Nagas and from Parshuram at the Brangaridai docks. As promised by the Nilkant, all the materials required to make the Naga medicine are being delivered to you. A Naga scientist is also going to stay here and teach you how to make the medicine yourselves. These materials, combined with the herbs you already have in your kingdom, should keep you supplied with the Naga medicine for three years. Chandraketu smiled lightly. The Lord Nilkant has honored his word. He is a worthy successor to Lord Rudra. That he is. But I don't think we will need this much medicine. The combined might of Ayodhya and Branga will ensure the defeat of Meluha well within three years. We will stop the manufacturing of the Somras and destroy their waste facility in the Himalayas. 
Once the waste stops poisoning the Brahmaputra, there will be no plague and no further need for any medicine. Bhagirath narrowed his eyes, hesitating. What is it, Prince Bhagirath? Your Highness, Ayodhya is probably not going to be with us in this war. What? Are you saying Ayodhya may side with Maluha? Yes. In fact, they have already thrown in their lot with Maluha. Then why? Bhagirath completed the question. Why do I act against my own father and kingdom? Yes. Why do you? I am a follower of my lord, the great Nilkant. His path is true, and I will walk on it even if it entails fighting my own kinsmen. Chandraketu rose and bowed to Bhagirath. It requires a special form of greatness to fight one's own for the ideal of justice. As far as I am concerned, you are fighting for justice for the Brangas. I shall remember this gesture, Prince Bhagirath. Bhagirath smiled, happy with the way the conversation had progressed. He had accomplished the task that Shiva had given him, but in such a manner as to win the personal allegiance of the fabulously wealthy king of Branga. This alliance would prove useful when he made his move for the throne of Ayodhya. Having heard of Chandraketu's sentimental nature, Bhagirath thought it was wise to seal the alliance in blood. He pulled out his knife, slit his palm and held it up to the king. May my blood flow in your veins, my brother. A moist-eyed Chandraketu immediately pulled out his own knife, slit his palm and held it against Bhagirath's bloodied hand. And may my blood flow in yours. Sitting aft on the deck of the lead ship of the Vasudev Naga fleet, Prahaspati, Nandi and Parshuram could make out the outlines of Ganesh and Karthik practicing their swordsmanship in the vessel behind them. Further back, Shiva sat with Sati on a higher deck. Braspati's emotions were tinged with bitter regret. My mission has gained a leader, but I have lost a friend. Nandi turned towards Braspati. Of course not, Braspatiji. The Lord Nilkant continues to love you. Braspati raised his eyebrows and smiled. Nandi, lying does not behove you. Nandi laughed softly. If it makes you feel better, I can tell you that Lord Shiva missed you dearly when he believed that you were dead. You were always on his mind. I wouldn't have expected any less, said Braspati. But I don't think he understands why I did what I did. To be honest, said Nandi, neither do I. It was important to fake your death, I concede. But you probably should have revealed the truth to Lord Shiva. I couldn't have, said Braspati. Shiva is the son-in-law of Emperor Daksh, my prime enemy. Had Daksh known that I was alive, he would have sent assassins after me. I wouldn't have lived long enough to conduct the experiments I needed to. And I had no way of knowing whether Shiva would have enough faith in me to not reveal anything to Daksh. Parshuram tried to console Braspati. He has forgiven you. Trust me, he has. He may have forgiven me, but I don't think he's understood me as yet, said Braspati. I hope there comes a time when I will get my friend back. It will happen, said Parshuram. Once the Somras is destroyed, we will all go with the Lord to Mount Kailash and live happily ever after. Nandi smiled. Mount Kailash is far less hospitable than you imagine, Parshuram. I should know, for I've been there. It is no luxurious paradise. Any place would be paradise, so long as we sit at the feet of Lord Shiva. Have you worn Kajal in your eyes? asked a surprised Shiva. Reclining in an easy chair on the raised private deck, Shiva had been gazing fondly at his children as they sparred with each other, swords at the ready. Sati seated herself and leaned close against him, briefly lost in the moment. Shiva had rarely seen Sati use makeup. He believed her beauty was so ethereal that it did not need any embellishment. Sati looked up at Shiva with a shy smile. Her pronounced Suryavanshi personality had been subtly influenced by Chandravanshi women, particularly Anandamai. She was discovering the pleasures of beauty, especially when experienced through the appreciative eyes of the man she loved. Yes, I thought you hadn't noticed. The coal accentuated Sati's large almond-shaped eyes, and a bashful smile made her dimples spring to life. Shiva was mesmerized as always. Wow, it looks nice. 
Sati laughed softly as she edged up to Shiva's face and then kissed him lightly. Ganesh and Karthik were engaged in a furious duel on the fore deck. As had become a tradition with them, they fought with real weapons instead of wooden swords. They believed that the risk of serious injury would focus their minds and improve their practice. They would halt just before a killer strike and demonstrate to the other that an opening had been found. Converting his smaller size to his advantage, Karthik pressed close to Ganesh, cramping him and making it difficult for his taller opponent to strike freely. Ganesh stepped back and swung his shield down in a seemingly defensive motion, but halted the movement inches from Karthik's shoulder. Karthik, my shield has a knife, said Ganesh, as he pressed a lever to release it. This is a strike on my account. I've said this to you before. Fighting with two swords is too aggressive. You should use a shield. You ended up leaving an opening for me. Karthik smiled. No, Dada, the strike is mine. Look down. Ganesh's eyes fell on his chest as he felt a light touch of metal. Karthik was holding his left sword the other way round, with a small blade sticking out of the hilt end. He had managed to turn the sword around, release the knife and bring it in close, all the while giving the feint of an open right flank to Ganesh. Shiva's elder son had assumed that Karthik had pulled his left sword out of combat. Ganesh stood with his eyes wide open, seriously impressed with his brother. How in Lady Bhumi Devi's name did you manage that? Shiva, who had seen the entire maneuver from his upper deck, was equally impressed with Karthik. He pulled back from Sati and shouted out, Bravo, Karthik! Sensing angry eyes boring into him, Shiva immediately turned towards Sati. She was glaring at her husband, holding her breath irritably, her lips still puckered. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, said Shiva, trying to draw close and kiss Sati again. Sati pushed Shiva's face away with mock irritation. The moments passed. I'm so sorry, it's just that what Karthik did was... Of course, whispered Sati, shaking her head and smiling. It will not happen again. It better not. I'm sorry. Sati shook her head and rested it on Shiva's chest. Shiva pulled her close. I love the Kajal. I didn't think it was possible for you to look even more beautiful. Sati looked up at Shiva and rolled her eyes. She slapped him lightly on his chest. Too little, too late. Chapter 12 Troubled Waters How was it? asked Anandamai. Bhagirath had sailed up the Padma and reached Parvateshwar's vessel, which was anchored at the point where the river broke away from the Branga River. The captain was preparing to raise anchor and started sailing onwards. Parvateshwar, Anandamai and Ayurvati had been waiting for Bhagirath at the aft deck, eager for the news from Branga. Bhagirath looked briefly at Parvateshwar and Ayurvati before turning to Anandamai. What do you think? Did you tell him everything? asked Ayurvati. That is exactly what the Lord Nilkant had asked me to do, answered Bhagirath. Parvateshwar took a deep breath and walked away. Anandamai looked at her husband before turning back. So what did Branga say, Bhagirath? King Chandraketu is livid that his people have been suffering from a murderous plague so that the Maluhans can live extra long lives. But I hope you told him that most Maluhans did not know this, said Ayurvati. Had we known that the Somras was causing this evil in Branga, we would not have used it. Bhagirath looked disbelievingly at Ayurvati and sarcastically remarked, I did tell him that most Maluhans did not know about the devastation that their addiction had caused. Strangely, it did not seem to lessen King Chandraketu's anger. Ayurvati remained silent. Anandamai spoke irritably. Can you stop being judgmental for just a moment and tell me what is going to happen in Branga now? For now, King Chandraketu is going to concentrate on manufacturing the medicines that his people need, said Bhagirath. But at the same time, he has already started mobilizing for war. He will be ready and waiting in three months for the Lord Nilkant's orders. Ayurvati's eyes welled up with tears as she wistfully looked at Parvateshwar in the distance. She felt the anguish in his noble heart, for hers was just as heavy. My Lord! said Siamantak, the Ayodhyan Prime Minister, 
as he entered Emperor Dilipa's chambers. I have just received word that Maharishi Bhrigu is on his way. Lord Bhrigu? asked a surprised Dilipa. Here? The advance boat has just come in, Your Highness, said Siamantak. Lord Bhrigu should be here by tomorrow. Why wasn't I informed earlier? I did not know either, Your Highness. Malua should not have done this. They should have informed us in advance before sending Lord Brigu here. What can I say about Meluha, my lord? Typically disdainful. A nervous Dilipa ran his hands across his face. Is there any news from the shipyard? Are our ships close to completion? Siamantak swallowed anxiously. No, your highness. You'd asked me to pay attention to the pavement dweller issue and... I know what I'd asked you to do. Just answer my question with a simple yes or no. I'm sorry, Your Highness. No, the ships are nowhere near completion. Why, when will the job be done? If we stop doing everything else, then I guess we should be ready in another six to nine months. Dilipa seemed to breathe easier. That's not so bad. Nothing's going to happen in the next nine months. Yes, Your Highness. Emperor Dilipa was with Maharishi Bhrigu at the Ayodhya shipyard. The Meluhan brigadier, Prasanjit, stood at a distance. Declining the hospitality which awaited him on landing, Brigu had headed directly for the shipyard. A flustered Dilipa had perforce followed him, courtiers and all. He gestured for Siamantak and all his courtiers to maintain a distance. He knew that Brigu was angry and expected an earful. Your Highness, said Brigu slowly, keeping his temper on a tight leash. You had promised me that your ships would be ready. I know, my lord, said Dilipa softly. But honestly, a few months' delay is not going to hurt us. It has been many months since our attack on Panchavati. There has been absolutely no news of the Nilkant. I am sure we have succeeded. We don't really need to be nervous. I honestly think that the likelihood of a war is substantially reduced. Brigu turned to Dilipa. Your Highness, may I request that you leave the thinking to me? Dilipa immediately fell silent. Was it not your suggestion to commandeer your trade ships and refit them for war? Yes, it was, my lord, said Dilipa. I had suggested that we are not likely to fight naval battles on the Ganga. I had told you that we will only need transport ships for which your trade ships were good enough. Yes, you had, my lord. Yet, you had insisted that in the likelihood of there being river battles, it would be a good idea to have battleships. Yes, my lord. And I agreed on one condition alone, that the battleships would be ready in six months. Correct? Yes, my lord. It has been seven months now. You have stripped down the trade ships but have still not refitted them. So now, seven months later, not only do we not have any battleships, but we also don't have any trade transport ships. I know it looks very bad, my lord, said Dilipa, wiping his brow with his fingers. But the pavement dwellers here had gone on a hunger strike. A confused Brigo raised his hands in exasperation. What does that have to do with the ships? My lord, explained Dilipa patiently, in my benevolence, I had decreed that no Ayodhyan should be roofless. Of course, this onerous task was assigned to the Royal Committee of Internal Affairs, which looks after both housing as well as a royal shipyard. The committee has been seriously debating the execution of this grand scheme over the last three years. Following our last conversation, though, I thought it fit to direct the committee to focus on building ships. The resultant neglect of the free housing scheme angered the pavement dwellers to the point of mass agitation. Public order being paramount, I redirected the committee to concentrate on the housing scheme. I'm glad to say that the seventh version of the housing report, which judiciously takes into account the views of all the citizens, should be ready soon. Once accepted, obviously, the committee can then give its undiluted attention to the matter of building ships. Brigo was staring wide-eyed at Dilipa, stunned. So you see, my lord, said Dilipa, I know this is not looking good, 
But things will be set right very soon. In fact, I expect the committee to start debating the shipyard issue within the next seven days. Brigu spoke softly, but his rage was at boiling point. Your Highness, the future of India is at stake and your committee is debating? But my lord, debates are important. They help incorporate all points of view or else we may make decisions that are not in the name of Lord Ram, you are the king. Fate has placed you here so you can make decisions for your people. Dilipa fell silent. Brigo maintained silence for a few seconds, trying to control his anger, then spoke in a low voice. Your Highness, what you do within your own kingdom is your problem. But I want the refitting of these ships to begin today. Understand? Yes, Maharishiji. How soon can the ships be ready? In six months, if my people work every day. Make those imbeciles work day and night and have them ready in three. Am I clear? Yes, my lord. Also, please have your cartographers map the jungle route from Ayodhya to the upper Ganga. Um, but why should... Brigo sighed in exasperation. Your Highness, I expect Meluha to be the real battleground. Your Ayodhya is not likely to be at risk. These ships were needed to get your army to Meluha quickly if necessary. Since they are not going to be ready now, we need an alternative plan if war is declared within the next few months. I would need your army to cut through the jungles in a northwesterly direction and reach the upper Ganga close to Dharmaket. Further on, you can use the new road built by the Meluhans to reach Devagiri. Obviously, since you will be cutting through jungles, this route will be slow and could take many months. But it's better than reinforcements not getting to Maduha at all. And to ensure that your army does not get lost in the jungles, it would be good to have clear maps. I'm sure your commanders would want to reach Maluha in time to help your allies. Dilipa nodded. Also, I will be surprised if Ayodhya is attacked directly. Of course. Why should anyone attack Ayodhya directly? asked Dilipa. We have not harmed anyone. In truth, Brigu was not sure that Ayodhya would not be attacked, but he did not care. His only concern was the Somras. Meluha had to be protected in order to protect the Somras. Had it been possible to convince Dilipa to order the Ayodhyan army to leave for Devagiri right away, Brigu would not have hesitated to do so. I will order the cartographers to map the route through the jungles, my lord, said the Lipa. Thank you, your highness, smiled Brigo. By the way, I notice that even your wrinkles are disappearing. Has the blood in your cough reduced? Disappeared, my lord. Your medicines are miraculous. A medicine is only as good as a patient's responsiveness. All the credit is due only to you, your highness. You are being too kind. What you have done to my body is magical. But my lord, my knee continues to trouble me. It still hurts when I... We'll take care of that as well. Don't worry. Thank you. Brigo gestured behind him. Also, I have brought the Maluhan brigadier Prasenjit here. He will train your army on modern warfare. Um, but please ensure that your soldiers listen to him, your highness. Yes, my lord. The two ships carrying Parvateshwar and his team had just docked at the river port of Vaishali, the immediate neighbor of Branga. Shiva had asked Parvateshwar to speak to the king of Vaishali, Matali, and get his support for the Nilkant. However, keeping in mind his decision to oppose the Mahadev and protect Miluha, Parvateshwar was of the opinion that it would be unethical of him to approach the king. Therefore, he had requested Anandamai to carry out the mission. Bhagirath, Anandamai and Ayurvati were standing aft while they waited for the gangplank to be lowered onto the Vaishali port. Parvateshwar, having opted to stay back, had decided to practice his sword skills with Utanka on the lead ship. The waiting party gazed at the exquisite Vishnu temple dedicated to Lord Matsya built very close to the river harbour. They bowed low towards the first Lord Vishnu. 
You will have to excuse me, said Bhagirath, turning towards Anandamai. Are you planning on leaving for Ayodhya right away? asked Anandamai. Yes, why delay it? I intend to take the second ship and sail up the Sarayu to Ayodhya. The Vaishali king's allegiance is a given. He is blindly loyal to the Nilkant. Your meeting him is a mere formality. I may as well concentrate on the other task that the Lord Nilkant has given me. All right, said Anandamai. Go with Lord Ram's blessings, Bhagirath, said Ayurvati. You too, said Bhagirath. While the lead ships of Shiva's convoy berthed at the main Assi Ghat of Kashi, the others docked at the Brahma Ghat nearby. Along with a large retinue, King Atidhigva waited in attendance for the ceremonial reception. On cue, drummers beat a steady rhythm and conches blared as Shiva stepped onto the gangplank. Ceremonial artis and a cheering populace added to the festive air. Their living god had returned. King Atithigva bowed low and touched Shiva's feet as soon as he stepped onto the Assi Ghat. Ayushman Bhava, Your Highness, said Shiva, blessing King Atithigva with a long life. Atithigva smiled, his hands folded in a respectful namaste. A long life is not of much use if we are not graced with your presence here in Kashi, my lord. Shiva, always uncomfortable with such deference, quickly changed the subject. How have things been, Your Highness? Very well. Trade has been good. But rumours have been going around that the Nilkant is to make a big announcement soon. I is that so, my lord? Let us wait till we get to your palace, Your Highness. Of course, said Adithigva. I should also tell you that I have received word through a fast sailboat that Queen Kali is on her way to Kashi. She is just a few days' journey behind you. She should be here soon. With raised eyebrows, Shiva instinctively looked upriver from where Kali's ship would inevitably sail. Well, it will be good to have her here as well. We have a lot to plan for. Chapter 13 Escape of the Gunas A delighted Shiva embraced Veerbhadra as Sati hugged Kritika. The duo had just entered Shiva's private chamber in the Kashi palace. Veerbhadra and Kritika had had an uneventful journey through Meluha. Their reception at the village where the Gunas had been housed had taken them by surprise. There were no soldiers, no alarm, nothing out of the ordinary. Clearly, the Gunas were not being targeted as leverage against the Nilkant. The system-driven Meluhans had achieved what their system had conceived, everybody being treated in accordance with the law, with no special provisions for any particular people. Didn't you face any trouble? asked Shiva. None, said Virbhadra. The tribe lived just like everyone else, in comfortable egalitarianism. We quickly bundled them into a caravan and quietly escaped. We arrived in Kashi a few months later. That means they're not aware as yet of my escape at the Godavari, said Shiva, or else they would have arrested the Gunas. That is the logical conclusion. But it also means that if any Meluhan happens to check the Guna village and finds them missing, they will assume that I'm alive and I'm planning a confrontation. That is also a logical conclusion, but there's nothing we can do about that, can we? No, there isn't, agreed Shiva. Didi, smiled Kali as she embraced her sister. How are you doing, Kali? asked Sati. I'm tired. My ship had to race down the Chambal and Ganga to catch up with you. Nice to meet you after so many months, Kali, said Shiva. Likewise, said Kali. How was Ujjain? A city that is worthy of Lord Ram said Shiva. Is it true that some of the Vasudevs have accompanied you here? Yes, including the chief Vasudev himself, Lord Gopal. Kali whistled softly. I was not even aware of the chief Vasudev's name till just the other day. Hm. And now it looks like I will be meeting him soon. The scenario must be really grim for him to emerge from his seclusion like this. Change doesn't happen easily, said Shiva. I don't expect the supporters of the Somras to fade into the sunset. The Vasudevs, in fact, believe the war has already begun 
regardless of whether it has been declared or not. That it's just a matter of time before actual hostilities break out. I agree. Is that why my ship was dragged into the Assi River? asked Kali. I was worried that it might not make it into the harbour. This river is so small that it should actually be called a culvert. That is for the ship's protection, Kali, said Shiva. It was Lord Atitigwa's idea. The Kashi Harbour, just like the city, is not protected by any walls. Our enemies may hesitate to attack the city itself due to their faith in Lord Rudra's protective spirit over Kashi. But any ships anchored on the Ganga would be fair game. Hence the decision to move the ships into the Assi, which as you know, flows into the Ganga, said Sati. The channel at the mouth of the river is narrow. Thus, not more than one enemy ship can come through at a time. Our ships, therefore, can be easily defended. Also, the Assi flows through the city of Kashi. Most Chandravanshis would not want to venture within, believing that the spirit of Lord Rudra would curse them for harming Kashi, even by mistake. Kali raised her eyebrows. Using an enemy's own superstition against him. I like it. Sometimes, good tactics can work better than a sword edge, said Shiva, grinning. Ah, said Kali, smiling. You're only saying that because you haven't encountered my sword. Shiva and Sati laughed convivially. Shiva and his core group were in the main hall of the grand Kashi Vishwanath temple. Aditigva had stepped into the inner sanctum, along with the main pundit of the temple, to offer prasad to the idols of Lord Rudra and Lady Mohini. He returned thereafter with the ritual offerings made to the gods. May Lord Rudra and Lady Mohini bless our enterprise, said Aditigva, offering the prasad to Shiva. Shiva took the prasad with both hands, swallowed it whole and ran his right hand over his head thus offering his thanks to the Lord and Lady for their blessings. Meanwhile, the temple pandit distributed the prasad to everyone else. The ceremonies over, Aditigva sat down with the group to discuss the strategy for the war ahead. The pandit was led out of the temple by Kashi policemen and the entrance sealed. No one was to be allowed into the premises for the duration of the meeting. My Lord, my people are forbidden any acts of violence except if it is in self-defense, said Aditigva. So we cannot join the campaign actively with you. But all the resources of my kingdom are at your command. Shiva smiled. The peace-loving Kashi people would, in any case, not really make good soldiers. He had no intention of leading them into battles. I know, King Aditigva. I would not ask anything of your people that they would be honor-bound to refuse. But you must be able to defend Kashi if attacked, for we intend to house many of our war resources here. We will defend it to our last breath, my lord, said Aditigva. Shiva nodded. He did not really expect the Chandravanshis to attack Kashi. He turned towards Gopal. Panditji, there are many things that we need to discuss. To begin with, how do we keep the Chandravanshis out of the war theatre in Meluha? Secondly, what strategy should we adopt with Meluha? I think what Lord Ganesh and Karthik suggested is an excellent idea, said Gopal. Let us hope we can rope in Magad to our side. Easier said than done, said Kali. Surapadman would be compelled by his father to seek vengeance for his stupid brother Ugrasen. And I don't propose handing over Ganesh for what was, in fact, a just execution. So what are you suggesting, Kali? asked Sati. Well, I'm suggesting that we either fight Magad right away, or we tell them that we will investigate and hand over the Naga culprit as soon as we lay our hands on him. Sati instinctively held Ganesh's hand protectively. Kali laughed softly. Didi, all I'm suggesting is that we make Surapadman think that we are going to hand him over. That way, we can buy some time and attack Ayodhya. Are you saying that we lie to the Magadhans, Your Highness? asked Gopal. Kali frowned at Gopal. All I'm saying is that we be economical with the truth, Great Vasudev. The future of India is at stake. There are so many who are counting on us. If we have to taint our souls with a sin for the sake of greater good, 
then so be it. I will not lie, said Shiva. This is a war against evil. We are on the side of good. Our fight must reflect that. Baba, said Ganesh, you know I would agree with you under normal circumstances. But do you think the other side has maintained the standards that you are espousing? Wasn't the attack on us at Panchavati an act of pure deception and subterfuge? I don't believe it is wrong to attack an unprepared enemy. Yes, the using Devi Astras can be considered questionable. Even so, two wrongs don't make a right. I will not lie to win this war. We will win it the right way. Kartik remained silent. Whereas he agreed with the pragmatism of Ganesha's words, he was inspired by the moral clarity in Shiva's. Gopal smiled at Shiva. Satyam vada, asatyam mavada. What? asked Shiva. Kali spoke up. It's old Sanskrit. Speak the truth, never speak the untruth. Sati smiled. I agree. Well, I know some old Sanskrit too, said Kali. Satyam bruyat priyam bruyat na bruyat satyam apriyam. Shiva raised his hands in dismay. Can we cut out the old Sanskrit one-upmanship? I don't follow what you people are saying. Gopal translated for Shiva. What Queen Kali said means, speak the truth in a pleasing manner, but never speak that truth which is unpleasant to others. It's not my line, said Kali, turning to Shiva. It can be attributed to a sage of yore, I'm sure. But I think it makes sense. We don't have to reveal to Surapadman that we know who his brother's killer is. All we need to motivate him to do is to wait till after we have attacked Ayodhya before choosing his friends and his enemies. His ambition will guide him in the direction that we desire. The walls of Ayodhya are impregnable, warned Gopal, drawing attention to another factor. We might be able to bog them down, but we won't be able to destroy the city. I know, said Ganesh, but our aim is not to destroy Ayodhya. It is to ensure that their navy is unable to sail their forces over to Meluha. Our main battle will be in Meluha. But what if Surapadman attacks from the rear after we have laid siege on Ayodhya? asked Gopal. Caught between Ayodhya in front of us and Surapadman behind us, we could get destroyed. Actually, no, said Ganesh. Surapadman attacking us from behind would make things easier for us. It's when he moves out of Magad that we'll make our move. Shiva, Karthik and Sati smiled. They understood the plan. Brilliant, exclaimed Parshuram. The rest turned to Parshuram for a whispered explanation on the side. You don't have to lie, continued Kali to Shiva. Refrain from telling Surapadman the entire truth, except for those portions which will make him pause. Let his ambition play out the rest. We require him to allow our ships to pass through the confluence of the Sarayu and Ganga towards Ayodhya. Once that is done, we will achieve our objective one way or the other, either by holding Ayodhya back or by destroying the Magadhan army. Shiva's brief nod acknowledged his assent. But what about Maluha? Should we launch a frontal attack with all our might? Or should we adopt diversionary tactics to distract their armies while a small group searches for the secret Somra's facility and destroys it? Abranga and Vishali forces will battle in Magad and Ayodhya, leaving the Vasudevs and the Naga armies for the Meluhan campaign, said Sati. So we will have much smaller forces in Meluha. Of course, they will be exceptionally well trained and will have superb technological skills, like the fire-spewing elephant core that the Vasudevs have developed recently. But we have to respect the Maluhan forces. They're equally well trained and technologically adept. So are you suggesting that we avoid direct attack? asked Shiva. Yes, said Sati. Our main aim has to be to destroy the Somras manufacturing facility. It will take them years to rebuild it. That much time is more than enough for your word to prevail amongst the people. The average Meluhan is devoted to the legend of the Nilkant. The Somras will die a natural death. But if we attack directly, the war with Meluha will drag on for a long time. The more it drags on, the more innocent people will die. Also, 
the Maluhans will begin to look upon the war as an attack on their beloved country and not the Somras. I am sure there will be large numbers of Maluhans who will be willing to turn against the Somras. But if we challenge their patriotism, then we have no chance of winning. Kali was smiling. What? asked Sadi. I noticed that you said they instead of we when you referred to the Meluhans, said Kali. Sati seemed perplexed. She still believed Meluha was her own land. Um, that's unimportant. It's still my country. Sure it is, smiled Kali. Gopal cut in. Just for the sake of argument, let us imagine what would happen if there is a direct all-out war. That is something we will have to avoid, said Shiva. I see sense in what Sati is saying. Nevertheless, let us consider what Lord Bhrigu and Daksha might think, said Gopal. I agree. It is in our interest to not have a direct war. But it is in their interest to have one and a destructive one at that. They will want tensions to escalate so they can confuse the people. They will then say the Nilkant has betrayed Meluha. Like Lady Sati just pointed out, the patriotism of the Meluhans could drown out their faith in the Nilkant. I agree that Lord Brigu may want to escalate the situation, said Jeva. What I do not understand is how he will manage it once it has. I have seen the Meluhan army from up close. It's a centralized, well-drilled unit. But the problem with such armies is their utter dependence on a good commander. Their general, Parvateshwar, is with us. Trust me, they do not have another man like him. If Lord Brigo is as intelligent as you say he is, he would know that too. Ganesh and Karthik sighed at the same time. Shiva glared at his sons. Baba, said Karthik. Damn it, screamed Shiva. You will not doubt his loyalty. Am I clear? Ganesh and Karthik bowed their heads, their mouths pursed mutinously. Am I clear? asked Shiva once again. Kali frowned at Shiva before looking at Ganesh and Karthik, but remained silent. Shiva turned back to Gopal. We have to avoid provocation. Our military formations have to be solidly defensive so as to deter them from staging an open confrontation. The main task for our army is to keep them distracted so that a smaller unit can search the towns on the Saraswati for signs of the Somras manufacturing facility. Once we succeed in destroying that facility, we will win the war. Nandi, said Sati, turning to the Meluhan Major. Nandi immediately laid out a map of Meluha. Everyone peered at it. Look, said Sati, the Saraswati ends in an inland delta. The Maluhans will not be able to get their massive fleet from Karachapa into the Saraswati. Their defense doctrine covers just two possible threats, a naval attack via the Indus or a land-based army attack from the east. That is why they don't have a massive fleet on the Saraswati. Shiva grasped what Sati was alluding to. They are unprepared for a naval attack on the Saraswati. You have to understand that this is with good reason. They assumed that no enemy ships could enter the Saraswati. No enemy controlled rivers flow into it and the Saraswati does not open to the sea. But isn't that just the problem? asked a confused Atitigva. How will we get ships into the Saraswati? We won't, said Shiva. We will capture the Maluhan ships stationed in the Saraswati instead. Kali nodded. That is the last thing they would expect, which is the reason why it will work. Yes, said Sati. All we have to do is capture Mritikavati, which is where most of the Saraswati command of the Meluhan navy is stationed. Once we are in possession of those ships, we will control the Saraswati. We can quickly sail up unchallenged, even as we continue our search for the Somras manufacturing facility. That's correct, said Brahaspati. The manufacturing facility can only be on the banks of the Saraswati. It cannot possibly be anywhere else. This sounds like a good plan, said Gopal. But how do we capture their ships? 
Where do we enter that territory from? Mritikavati is not a border town. We will have to march in with an army. And we will obviously face resistance from the border town that falls on the way, Lothal. Lothal? asked Kartik. Lothal is a port of Maika, said Gopal. They are practically twin cities. Maika is where all the Meluhan children are born and raised, while Lothal is a local army base. Don't worry about Maika or Lothal, said Kali. They will be on our side. Gopal, Shiva and Sati seemed genuinely surprised. If there are any Meluhans who have sympathy for us, it will be the people of Maika, continued Kali. They have seen the Naga children suffer. They have tried to help us on many occasions, even breaking their own laws in the process. The present governor of Maika, Chenardhwaj, is also the administrator of Lothal. He was transferred from Kashmir a few years back. He is loyal to the institution of the Nilkant. Furthermore, I have saved his life once. Trust me, both Maika and Lothal will be with us when hostilities break out. I remember Chenardhwaj, said Shiva. All right then, we will utilize the support of Lothal to conquer Mrithikavati. Then we'll use their ships to search the towns on the Saraswati. But remember, we must try and avoid a direct clash. Chapter 14 The Reader of Minds do you believe we can convince him? asked Shiva. The Vasudev chief, Gopal, had just walked into Shiva's chamber. Sati and the Nilkant were preparing to leave for Magad with him. Ganesh and Kartik had come to say goodbye to their parents. I would have been worried had we been meeting Lord Bhriku, said Gopal. But it's only Surapadman. What is so special about Lord Bhrigu? asked Shiva. He's only human. Why are all of you so wary of him? He is a Maharishi, Shiva, said Sati. In fact, like Gopalji had mentioned, Lord Brigu is believed by many to be beyond a Maharishi. He is a Saptrishi Uttradhikari. You should respect a man, not his position, said Shiva, before turning to Gopal. Once again I ask, my friend, why are you so nervous about him? Well, for starters, he can read minds, said Gopal. So? asked Shiva. You and I can do that too. Every Vasudev Pandit can, in fact. True, but we can only do so while we're in one of our temples. Lord Brigu can read the mind of anyone around him, regardless of where he is. Ganesh looked genuinely surprised. How? Well, said Gopal, our brains transmit radio waves when we think. These thoughts can be detected by a trained person, provided he is within the range of a powerful transmitter. But it is believed that Maharishis can go a step further. They do not need to wait till our thoughts are converted into radio waves to be able to detect them. They can read our thoughts even as we formulate them. But how? Thoughts are nothing but electrical impulses in our brain, said Gopal. These impulses Make the pupils of our eyes move minutely. A trained person, like a Maharishi, can decipher this movement in our pupils and read our thoughts. Lord Ram, be merciful, whispered a stunned Karthik. I still do not understand how this is possible, remarked a sceptical Shiva. Are you saying all our thoughts are exposed by the movement of our pupils? What language would that communication be in? This makes no sense. My friend said Gopal. You are confusing the language of communication with the internal language of the brain. Sanskrit, for example, is a language of communication. You use it to communicate with others. You also use it to communicate with your own brain so that your conscious mind can understand your inner thoughts. But the brain itself uses only one language for its own working. This is a universal language across all brains of all known species. And the alphabet of this language has two letters or signals. Two signals? asked Sati. Yes, said Gopal. Only two. Electricity on and electricity off. Our brain 
has millions of thoughts and instructions running simultaneously within. But at any one point of time, only one of these thoughts can capture our conscious attention. This particular thought gets reflected in our eyes through the language of the brain. A Maharishi can read this conscious thought, so one has to be very careful about what one consciously thinks in the presence of a Maharishi. So, the eye is indeed the window to one's soul, said Ganesh. Gopal smiled. It appears that it is. Shiva grinned, his brows raised. Well, I'll make sure that I keep mine shut when I meet Lord Brigu. Gopal and Sati laughed softly. Nevertheless, we will win, said Gopal. Yes, said Ganesh. We're on the side of good. That is true without a doubt. But that is not the reason, Lord Ganesh. We will win because of your father, said Gopal. No, said Shiva. It cannot be only me. We will win because we're all in this together. It is you who brings us together, great Nilkant, said Gopal. Lord Brigo may be as intelligent as you are, maybe more. But he is not a leader like you. He uses, rather misuses his brilliance to cow down his followers. They don't idolize him. They are scared of him. You, on the other hand, are able to draw out the best in your followers, my friend. Don't think I did not understand what you did a few days back. You had decided upon your course of action already. But that did not stop you from having a discussion, allowing us to be a part of the decision. Somehow, you guided us all into saying what you wanted to hear. And yet, you made each one of us feel as if it was our own decision. That is leadership. Lord Brigo may have a bigger army than ours, but he fights alone. In our case, our entire army will fight as one. That, great Nilkant, is a supreme tribute to your leadership. Shiva, embarrassed as always when complimented, quickly changed the topic. You are being too kind, Gopalji. In, in any case, I think we should leave. Magad awaits us. Bhagirath is here? Siamanta nodded at his stunned emperor. Yes, my lord. But how did he... Prime Minister Siamantak, said Brigu, interrupting Dilipa. I would be delighted to meet him. Have Princess Anandamai and her husband accompanied him? No, my lord, said Siamantak. He has come alone. That is most unfortunate, said Brigu. Please show him in with complete honor into our presence. As you wish, my lord, said Siamantak, as he bowed to Brigu and Dilipa before leaving the room. As soon as he had left, Brigu turned towards Dilipa. Your Highness, you must learn to control yourself. Siamantak is unaware of the attack at the Godavari. I'm sorry, my lord, said Dilipa. It's just that I'm shocked. I am not. Dilipa frowned. Why, my lord? Did you expect this? I can't say that I expected this specifically, but I had strong suspicions that our attack had failed. The only question was, how would they be confirmed? I don't understand, my lord. Our ships could have got destroyed in so many ways. It wasn't only the destruction of our ships. There is something else. I had asked Kanakla to try and locate the Gunas. Who are the Gunas? They are the tribe of that fraud Nidkant. The Gunas were immigrants in Meluha. There are standard policies in Meluha for immigrants, one of them being that their records are kept strictly secret. This system ensures that they are not targeted or oppressed and are in fact treated well. But the upshot was that the royal record keeper was refusing to tell his own prime minister where the Gunas were settled. How can the record keeper do that? The Prime Minister's word would be the order of the Emperor, and his word is law. Well, smiled Brigo, Meluha is not like your empire, Lord Diliba. They have this irritating habit of sticking to rules. Brigo's sarcasm was lost on Diliba. So what happened, my lord? D did you find the Gunas? At first, Kanakla seemed quite sure that the Gunas were in Devagiri itself. When that initial search yielded nothing, 
she had no choice but to approach Emperor Daksh. He passed an order through the Rajya Sabha that would force the Meluhan record keeper to reveal the location of the Gunas. By the time we reached their village, they were gone. Gone where? I don't know. I was told this happens quite often. Many immigrants are not able to adapt to the civilized but regimented life in Maluha and choose to return to their homelands. So I was asked to believe that the Gunas must have gone back to the Himalayas. And did you believe that? Of course I didn't. I suspected the fraud Nilkant must have spirited his tribe away before declaring war. But what could I do? I didn't know where the Gunas were. But why is Bhagirath here? Why would the Nilkant reveal his hand? Fraud, Nilkant, your highness, said Brigo, correcting the Lipa. I'm sorry, my lord, said the Lipa. Brigo looked up at the ceiling. Yes, why has Shiva sent him here? My god, whispered the Lipa. Could he have been sent here to assassinate me? Brigu shook his head. That is unlikely. I don't think killing you, Your Highness, would serve any larger purpose. Dilipa opened his mouth to say something, but decided instead to remain silent. Yes, continued Briku, narrowing his eyes. We do need to know why Prince Bhagirath is here. I look forward to meeting him. Father, said Bhagirath, as he walked confidently into Dilipa's chamber, Dilipa smiled as best he could. He didn't really like his son. How are you, Bhagirath? I'm all right, father. How was your trip to Panchavati? Bhagirath glanced at Brigu, wondering who the old Brahmin was, before turning back to his father. It was an uneventful trip, father. Perhaps the Nagas are not as bad as we think. Some of us have returned early. The Lord Nilkant will join us later. Tilipa frowned, as if surprised, and turned towards Brigu. Bhagirath arched his eyebrows before turning towards Brigu as well, with a namaste and quick bow of his head. Please accept my apologies for my bad manners, Brahmin. I was overwhelmed with emotion on seeing my father. Brigu looked deep into Bhagirath's eyes. Bhagirath is consumed with curiosity about who I am. I better put this to rest so that his conscious mind can move on to more useful thoughts. Perhaps it is I who should apologize, said Brigu. I have not introduced myself. I am a simple sage who lives in the Himalayas and goes by the name of Brigu. Bhagirath straightened up in surprise. Of course he knew who Brigu was, although he hadn't met him. Bhagirath stepped forward and bent low, touching the sage's feet. Maharishi Brigu, it is my life's honor to meet you. I am fortunate to have the opportunity to seek your blessings. Ayushman, Bhava, said Brigu, blessing Bhagirath with a long life. Brigu then placed his hands on Bhagirath's shoulders and pulled him up, while once again looking directly into his eyes. Bhagirath has realized that his imbecile father is not the true leader. I am, and he's scared. Good. Now, all I have to do is make him think some more. I trust the Nilkant as well, asked Brigo. I have still not had the pleasure of meeting the man who commoners believe is a saviour of our times. He is well, my lord, said Bhagirath, and is worthy of the title he carries. In fact, there are those of us who believe that he even deserves the title of the Mahadev. So... Bhagirath volunteered to uncover the identity of the true leader. Interesting. That Tibetan barbarian understands that this fool Dilipa could not have been the one. He has more intelligence than I thought. Allow posterity to prevail upon the present in deciding the honor and title bestowed upon man, my dear Prince of Ayodhya, said Brigo. Duty must be performed for its own sake not for the power and pelf it might bring. I am sure that even your Nilkant is familiar with Lord Vasudev's nugget of wisdom, which encapsulates this thought. Karmanya vadika rastama phaleshu karachana. 
Oh, the nail cunt is the embodiment of that thought, Maharishi ji, said Bhagirath. He never calls himself the Mahadev. It is we who address him as such. Preku smiled. Your nail cunt must be truly great to inspire such loyalty, brave prince. By the way, how was Panchavati? I have never had the pleasure of visiting that land. It is a beautiful city, Maharishi ji. They were attacked at the outskirts of Panchavati. So our ships did make it through. And their devil boats got us. Well, at least our information about the location of Panchavati is correct. With Lord Ram's blessings, said Briko, I will visit Panchavati some day. I am sure that the Queen of the Nagas would be honoured, my lord, said Bhagirath. Briko smiled. Kali would kill me if she had half a chance. Her temper is even more volatile than Lord Rudra's legendary anger. But Prince Bhagirath, said Briko, I must complain about an iniquity that you have committed. An astonished Bhagirath folded his hands together in an apologetic namaste. I apologize profusely if I have offended you in any way, my lord. Please tell me how I can set it right. It's very simple, said Brigo. I was really looking forward to meeting the emperor's daughter and her new husband. But you have not brought Princess Anandamai along with you. Apologies for my oversight, my lord, said Bhagirath. I overlooked this only because I rushed here to pay obeisance to my respected father, whom I have not met for a long time. And Princess Anandamai has dutifully accompanied her husband, General Parvateshwar, to Kashi. Bhrigu suddenly held his breath as he read Bhagirat's thoughts. Parvateshwar wants to defect. He wants to return to Meluha. I guess I will only have the pleasure of meeting Princess Anandamai and General Parvateshwar, when the Almighty wills it, said Brigu. The smile on Brigu's face left Bhagirath with a sense of unease. Hopefully that will be soon enough, my lord, said Bhagirath. If I may now be excused, I'd like to meet up with some people and then head to Kashi for some unfinished tasks. Tilipa was about to say something when Brigu raised his hand and placed it on Bhagirath's head. Of course, brave prince, go with Lord Ram. Why did you let him go, my lord? said Dilipa as soon as Bhagirath had left. We could have arrested him. The interrogation would surely have revealed what happened in Panchavati. I am already aware of what happened, said Brigo. Our ships did reach Panchavati and even managed to kill a large number from amongst their convoy. But they did not kill the main leaders. Shiva! is still alive, and our ships were destroyed in the battle. Even so, we should not allow Bhagirath to leave. Why are we letting one of their main leaders go back unharmed? I have blessed him with a long life, your highness. I'm sure you don't want me to be proven a liar. Of course not, my lord. Brigu looked at Dilipa and smiled. I know what you're thinking, your highness. Trust me, in chess as in war, one sometimes sacrifices a minor piece for the strategic advantage of capturing a more important piece several moves later. Dilipa frowned. Let me make myself very clear, your highness, said Brigo. Prince Bhagirath must not be harmed in Ayodhya. I imagine he will leave your city within a day. He should leave safe and sound. I want them to think that we are none the wiser from Bhagirat's brief visit. Yes, my lord. Provision and ready a fast sailboat. I must leave for Kashi immediately. Yes, my lord. Please have the manifest of my ship state that I am going to Prayag. Bhagirat still has friends in Ayodhya. I don't want him to know that I am leaving for Kashi. Is that clear? Of course, my lord. I will have Siamantak take care of this immediately. Chapter 15 The Magadhan Issue Shiva, Sati and Gopal had just been led into the guest chambers 
of Surapadman's royal palace by Andak, the Magadan minister for ports. Gopal waited for him to leave and then remarked, It's interesting that we are being housed in Surapadman's private residence and not King Mahindra's palace. Surapadman wants to serve as the exclusive channel of information between us and his father, said Sati. Being the sole intermediary also allows him the discretion of passing on things selectively. It actually makes me more hopeful of success. I am far less hopeful, countered Shiva. No doubt it is actually Surapadman's writ that runs large in Magad. Besides being the prince, he is also the keeper of the king's seal. But even he would be wary of his father's reaction following the killing of Prince Ugrasen. Perhaps that is why he wants to talk to us in private here. Perhaps, said Gopal. Maybe that's the reason why we were received in Magad by Andhag and not King Mahindra's Prime Minister. Yes, said Shiva. I believe Andhak is loyal to Surapadman. Let us hope for the best, said Sati. As Shiva, Sati and Gopal entered the prince's court, Surapadman rose from his ceremonial chair. He walked up to the Nilkant and then went down on his knees. Surapadman placed his head on Shiva's feet. Bless me, great Nilkant. Sukhina Bhav, said Shiva, placing his hands on Surapadman's head, blessing him with happiness. Surapadman looked up at Shiva. I hope by the time this conversation ends, my lord, you will find it in your heart to bless me with victory along with happiness. Shiva smiled and placed his hands on Surapadman's shoulders as he rose. Please allow me to introduce my companions, Prince Surapadman. This is my wife, Sati. Surapadman bowed low towards Sati. She politely returned Surapadman's greetings. And this is my close friend and the chief of the Vasudevs, Gopal, said Shiva. Surapadman's hands came together in a respectful namaste as his eyes widened with surprise. Lord Ram, be merciful. Pray to him, said Gopal, and he will be. Surapadman smiled. My apologies, Gopalji. My informants have always assured me that the legendary Vasudevs are for real. But I believed they would not interfere with worldly affairs unless an existential crisis was upon us. Such a time is upon us, Surapadman, said Gopal. And all the true followers of Lord Ram must align themselves with the Nilkant. Surapadman remained silent. Let us make ourselves comfortable, brave prince of Bhagad, said Shiva. Surapadman led them to the center of the court where ceremonial chairs had been placed in a circle. Gopal noticed there was no official from the royal Magadan court except for Andak. Rumors suggesting that Andak would soon be taking over the command of the Magadan army were perhaps true. It could also be deduced that the rest of the Magadan court was not really aligned with the Nilkant. Considering Magad's traditional rivalry with Ayodhya, one would have imagined that they would choose to align with the Nilkant. But Ugrasen's murder seemed to have effectively queered the pitch. What can I do for you, my lord? asked Surapadman. I will come straight to the point, Prince Surapadman, said Shiva. Your elite intelligence officials would already have briefed you that a war is likely. Surapadman nodded silently. Perhaps you would also be aware that Ayodhya has not chosen wisely, said Gopal. Yes, I am aware of that, said Surapadman, allowing himself a hint of a smile. But given Ayodhya's penchant for indecision and confusion, few can be sure about which side they will eventually find themselves on. Sati smiled. And what do you intend to do, brave prince? My lady, said Surapadman, I am a believer in the legend of the Nilkant, and the Lord has shown that he is a worthy inheritor of the title of the Mahadev. Shiva shifted in his seat, awkwardly, still not comfortable with being compared to the great Lord Rudra. Furthermore, Ayodhya is a terrible overlord, continued Surapadman. It needs to be challenged in the interests of Swadweep, and only Magad has the ability to do that. I can see that only mighty Magad has the strength to confront Ayodhya, said Sati. There you have it, said Surapadman. I have given you two good reasons why I should choose to stand with the army of the Nilkant. Shiva, Gopal and Sati remained silent 
waiting for the inevitable but. And yet, said Surapadman, circumstances have made my situation a little more complex. Turning towards Shiva, Surapadman continued, My lord, you must already be aware of my dilemma. My brother Ugrasen was killed in a Naga terrorist attack and my father is hell-bent on seeking vengeance. Keeping the sensitivity of the issue in mind, Shiva spoke softly. Surapadman, I think the incident... My lord, said Surapadman, please forgive me for interrupting you, but I know the truth. I'm not sure you do, Prince Surapadman, or else your reaction would have been different. Surapadman smiled, looked briefly at Andhak, and then continued. My lord, Andhak and I have investigated the case personally. We visited the spot where my brother and his men were killed. We're aware of the incident. Sati couldn't help inquiring. Then why? What can I do, my lady? asked Surapadman. My father is a grieving old man who has convinced himself that his favorite son was a noble and valiant Kshatriya who died while defending his kingdom from a cowardly Naga attack. How can I tell him the truth? How do I tell him that Ugrasen was in fact a compulsive gambler who was trying to kidnap a hapless boy rider so he could win some money? Should I tell my father that my great brother tried to murder a mother who was protecting her own child? That the apparently wicked Nagas were actually heroes who saved a subject of his own kingdom from his son's villainy? Do you think he will even listen to me? There is nobility in truth, said Sati even if it hurts. Surapadman laughed softly. This is not Meluha, my lady. Meluhan's devotion to the truth is seen by many here as nothing but rigidity of thought. Chandravanshi is preferred to choose from several alternative truths which may simultaneously coexist. Sati remained silent. Surapadman turned to Shiva. My lord, my father thinks that I am an ambitious warmonger was impatient to ascend the throne. He preferred my elder brother, who was more tuned to my father's views. I think he suspects that I engineered the death of Ograsen in pursuit of my goals. I'm sure that's not true, said Shiva. You are his capable son. It takes a very self-assured man to appreciate the talents of another, my lord, said Surapadman, even when it comes to one's own progeny. Ironically, the Nagas have in fact helped me, for my path to the throne is clear. All I have to do is wait for my father to pass on, and desist from doing anything that will make him disinherit me and offer the throne to some relative. Given this, if I were to tell my father that his favorite son's murder by the evil Nagas was absolutely justified, I would probably go down in history as the stupidest royal ever. Gopal smiled slightly. It appears that we are at an impasse, Prince Surapadman. What do we do? Surapadman narrowed his eyes. Just give me a Naga. I can't, said Shiva. I'm not asking for the one who actually killed Ugrasen, my lord, said Surapadman. I guess he is someone important. All I'm asking for is a random Naga. I will present him to my father as Ugrasen's killer and will have him executed forthwith. My father will then happily retire and go into sannyas to pray for my brother's soul. And I, along with all the resources of Magad, will stand beside you. I know the Brangas are with you. Victory is assured if Magad and Branga are on the same side. You will win the war, my lord, and evil will be destroyed. All you need to do is sacrifice an insignificant Naga who is suffering for the sins of his past lives in any case. We will actually be giving him an opportunity to earn good karma. What do you say? Shiva did not hesitate even for a second. I cannot do that. My lord, I will not do that. But no. Surapadman leaned back in his chair. We indeed seem to be at an impasse, great Vasudev. My father will not allow me to fight in an army that includes the Nagas unless we can assuage his thirst for vengeance. Shiva spoke up before Gopal could respond. What if you did not pick any side at all? Surapadman frowned, intrigued. Convince your father to remain neutral, continued Shiva. Allow my ships to proceed to battle with the Yodhya. If we are able to beat them, then your primary enemies are weakened. 
If they beat us, our army, including the Nagas, would be in retreat. Your imagination can fill in the rest. You win both ways. Surapadman smiled. That does have an attractive ring to it. Parvateshwar and Anandamai were housed in a separate wing of the massive Kaji Palace, having arrived in the city recently. Anandamai and Ayurvati had gone to meet Veer Bhadra and the Gunas. The Meluhan general was sitting in his chamber balcony, looking out towards the Ganga flowing in the distance. My lord, called out the doorman. Parvateshwar turned. Yes? A messenger has just delivered a note for you. Hand it to me. Yes, my lord. As the doorman came in, Parvateshwar asked, Who brought the message? The main palace doorkeeper, my lord. Parvateshwar raised his brows. An outsider would not be allowed in, would he? What I wanted to know was who gave the message to the palace doorkeeper. The doorman looked lost. How would I know, my lord? Parvateshwar sighed. These Swadvipans had no sense of systems and procedures. It's a wonder that an enemy didn't just stroll into their key installations. He took the neatly sealed papyrus scroll from the doorman and dismissed him. Parvateshwar couldn't recognize the symbol on the seal. It appeared to be a star, the kind used in ancient astrological charts. He shrugged and broke it open. The script surprised him. It was one of the standard Meluhan military codes. This one was used exclusively by senior Suryavanshi military officers. It was meant for top-secret messages during times of war. For all others, the words in the scroll would have been absolute gibberish. Lord Parvateshwar, it's time to prove your loyalty to Meluha. Meet me in the garden behind the Sankat Mochan temple at the end of the third Prahar. Come alone. Parvateshwar caught his breath. He instinctively looked towards the door. He was alone. He tucked the scroll into the pouch tied to his waistband. He knew what he had to do. The sound of bells, drums and prayer chants rent the morning air day after day at the Sankat Mochan temple. Having thus awoken Lord Hanuman, the devotees then sing bhajans as Lord Hanuman would do to gently wake his master, Lord Ram. At the end of this elaborate puja, the great seventh Vishnu proceeds to grant darshan, the divine pleasure of beholding him. The silence at dusk, however, belied the exuberance of the dawn. This was the time when Parvateshwar strode into the great temple. Parvateshwar looked back to ensure that nobody was following him. Then he walked swiftly towards the garden behind the temple. It was quiet. Parvateshwar approached a tree at the far end of the garden and sat leaning against it. How are you, General? asked a soft, polite voice. Parvateshwar looked up. I'll do a lot better when I see you. Are you alone? I wouldn't have come had I not been alone. There was silence for some time. Parvateshwar got up to leave. If you are a true Meluhan, you would know that Meluhans don't lie. Wait, General, said Brigu as he emerged from the shadows. Parvateshwar was stunned. He recognized the Saptrishi Uttradhikari. He knew that despite wielding tremendous influence, Brigu had never interfered in the workings of Meluha. He found it hard to believe that Brigu could involve himself in mundane matters of the material world. I am taking a huge risk in meeting you face to face, smiled Brigu. I had to be sure that you were alone. What are you doing here, Maharishiji? asked Parvateshwar, bowing to the great sage. I am doing my duty, as you are doing yours. But you have never interfered in earthly matters. I have, said Brigu, but only on rare occasion. And this is one such. Parvateshwar remained silent. So Brigu is a true leader. He was the one who had sent the joint Meluha Ayodhya fleet to attack Lord Shiva's convoy by stealth outside Panchavati. Parvateshwar's respect for Brigu went down a notch. The great sage was human after all. You already know what you have to do, said Brigu. I know that you will not support the fraud Nilkant in attacking your beloved motherland. Parvateshwar bristled with anger. Lord Shiva is not a fraud. He's the finest man to have walked the earth since Lord Ram. Brigu stepped back, astonished. Perhaps I was wrong. Perhaps 
You do not love Meluha as much as I thought you did. Lord Brigo, I would die for Meluha, said Parvateshwar, for it is my duty to do so. But please, don't make the mistake of thinking that I despise the Lord Nilkant. He is my living God. Brigo frowned, even more surprised. He looked into Parvateshwar's eyes. The normally restrained sage's mouth fell open ever so slightly. He realized that he was looking at a rare man who spoke exactly what he thought. Brigu's tenor changed and became respectful. My apologies, great general. I can see that your reputation does you justice. I misunderstood you. Sometimes the hypocritical nature of the world makes us immune to a rare, sincere man. Parvateshwar remained silent. Will you fight for Meluha? asked Brigu. To my last breath, whispered Parvateshwar. But I will fight according to Lord Ram's laws. Of course, we will not break the rules of war. Brigu nodded silently. I suggest, Maharishiji, said Parvateshwar, that you return to Meluha. I will follow in a few weeks. It would not be wise to remain here, General, said Brigu. If anything were to happen to you, the consequences for Meluha would be disastrous. Your army needs a good leader. I cannot leave without taking my lord's permission. Brigo thought he hadn't heard right. Excuse me? Did you say that you wanted to take permission from the Nilkant before leaving? He was careful not to say fraud Nilkant. Yes, answered Parvateshwar. But why would he allow you to leave? I don't know if he will. But I know I cannot leave without his permission. Brigu spoke carefully. Ah, uh, Lord Parvateshwar, I don't think that you realize the gravity of the situation. If you tell the Nilkant that you are going to lead his enemies, he will kill you. No, he won't. But if he chooses to do so, then that will be my fate. My apologies for sounding rude, but this is foolhardy. No, it's not. This is what a devotee does if he chooses to leave his lord. But, Lord Brigo, this sounds peculiar to you because you haven't met Lord Shiva. His companions don't follow him out of fear. They do so because he is the most inspiring presence in their lives. My fate has put me in a position where I am being forced to oppose him. It's breaking my heart. I need his blessings and his permission to give me the strength to do what I have to do. Brigu's slow nod revealed a glimpse of grudging respect. The Nilkant must be a special man to inspire such loyalty. He is not just a special man, Maharishiji. He is a living god. Chapter 16 Secrets Revealed I think we've achieved what we came here for, said Sati. Gopal, Sati and Shiva had retired to their chambers in Surapadman's palace. As a mark of goodwill, Surapadman had persuaded them to stay on for a few days and allow him to ready a few weapons for Shiva's army. Yes, I agree, said Gopal. Surapadman's offer of weapons, though token in nature, is symbolic of his having allied with us. Not one other person from the Magadhan court has visited us, though, said Shiva. I hope that King Mahindra doesn't prevail upon Surapadman to do something unwise. Do you think he may prevent our ships from passing through to Ayodhya? asked Gopal. I can't be sure, said Shiva. It's most likely he will cooperate, but it depends on how his father reacts. Let's hope for the best, said Sati. What about my proclamation, Pandaji? It will be ready and distributed in a few weeks from now, said Gopal. Vasudev pundits from across the country will give us constant updates as to the reaction of the people as well as the nobility. But what if the Vasudev pundits are discovered? No, they won't. The royals may know that the Vasudev tribe has allied with the Nilkant, but they will never know the identity of the Vasudevs within their kingdoms. Shiva let out a long-drawn breath. And so it shall begin. 
Bhagirath arrived in Kashi late in the evening and proceeded directly to the palace. On reaching there, he was informed that Shiva had gone to Magad to explore an alliance with Surapadman. Bhagirath, therefore, met Ganesh and Karthik to share his news with them. The Yodhians seem to have a backup plan, said Bhagirath. They expect Magad to block their ships from carrying their soldiers onwards up the Ganga and towards Meluha. Hence, they intend to cut through the forests and have their army move northwest right up to Dharmaket. From there, they can cross the Ganga and then use the newly built road to march to Meluha. That's logical, said Ganesh, but it will be slow. It will be many months before they can cut through the dense forests and reach Meluha. The war may actually be over by that time, Bhagirath agreed. True, Ganesh leaned forward. But I can see that there is more. Bhagirath could hardly contain himself. I know the identity of the one who leads our enemies. Maharishi Bhrigu? suggested Karthik. Bhagirath was amazed. How did you know? Baba's friends, the Vasudevs, told us, answered Ganesh. Bhagirath had heard stories about the legendary Vasudevs. Do the Vasudevs really exist? Yes, they do, brave prince, said Karthik. Bhagirath smiled. With friends like them, Lord Shiva doesn't need followers like me. Ganesh laughed. He could not have known when he agreed to your suggestion that the Vasudevs would reveal the identity of the main conspirator. Of course, said Bhagirath. But at least we know now about their backup plan of marching through the impenetrable forests to the northwest of Ayodhya. Yes, that is useful information, Bhagirath, said Ganesh. Karthik suddenly sat up. Prince Bhagirath, did you meet Maharishi Bhrigu personally? Yes. Karthik looked at Ganesh with concern. What's the matter? asked Bhagirath. Did he look into your eyes while speaking with you, Bhagirath? asked Ganesh. Where else would he be looking if he was talking to me? Karthik looked up at the ceiling. Lord Ram, be merciful. What happened? asked a confused Bhagirath. We've been told that Lord Bhrigu can read your mind by looking into your eyes, said Karthik. What? That's impossible. He is a Saptarishi Uttradhikari Bhagirath, said Ganesh. Very few things are impossible for him. If he was distinctly looking into your eyes, chances are he has read your conscious thoughts. So he may have some very sensitive information about our plans. Good Lord, whispered Bhagirath. I want you to carefully recall what you were thinking about while speaking with Lord Bhrigu, said Ganesh. I spoke about... Karthik interrupted Bhagirath. It doesn't matter what you spoke. What matters is what you thought. Bhagirath closed his eyes and tried to remember. I thought that my imbecile father could not have been the true leader of the conspiracy. That's no secret, said Ganesh. What else did you think about? I remember a feeling of dread when I realized that Lord Bhrigu is the true leader. I would have ideally not let him know your fears, said Karthik, but this too cannot harm us. I recall thinking that Lord Shiva had sent me to Ayodhya to discover the identity of the true leader. Again, said Ganesh, this is not very harmful information for an enemy to have. Bhagirath continued, I thought about being attacked by the joint Meluha Ayodhya ships at Panchavati and how we repelled the attack. Ganesh cursed under his breath. Bhagirath looked at Ganesh apologetically. So Maharishi Bhrigu knows about the Panchavati defenses. I'm so sorry, Ganesh. Karthik patted Bhagirath reassuringly on his arm. You did not intend this to happen, Prince Bhagirath. Was there anything else? Oh, Lord Rudra, whispered Bhagirath. Ganesh's eyes narrowed. What? I thought about Parvateshwar wanting to defect to Maluha, said Bhagirath. Ganesh stopped breathing while Karthik held his head. What now, Dada? Get Mossy here, Karthik, said Ganesh, asking his brother to fetch the queen of the Nagas, Kali. We know what we have to do, but Baba's wrath will be terrible. Mossy can stand up to him. We need to know if she agrees with us. Karthik immediately left the room. A shocked Bhagirath stared at Ganesh. I hope you're not thinking what I fear. Do we have a choice, Bhagirath? Maharishi Bhrigo will try and contact Parvateshwar at the first opportunity and whisk him away. Ganesh, Parvateshwar is my sister's husband. We cannot kill him. Ganesh raised his hands in exasperation. Kill him? What are you talking about, Bhagirath? Bhagirath remained silent. I only want to arrest General Parvateshwar so that he cannot escape. Bhagirath was about to say something when Ganesh interrupted him. 
We have no choice. If Parvateshwar goes over to their side, it would be disastrous for us. He is a brilliant strategist. Bhagirat sighed. I am not contradicting you. What needs to be done has got to be done. But we cannot kill him. I will not be responsible for making my sister a widow. I wouldn't dream of killing a man like Parvateshwar. But we've got to arrest him. For all we know, Maharishi Bhrigu may already be attempting to make contact with him. A moonless night hung over an eerily quiet Asighat in Kashi. The normally busy port of 80 did receive a small number of ships at night. But the darkness had kept away even the few brave captains who attempted night dockings. A silent and pensive Parvateshwar was walking back from the ghat. He had just dropped a shrouded Brigo to a waiting rowboat, which would take him to a ship anchored in the middle of the river. Brigo intended to stop at Prayag for a short while and then proceed to Maluha. General Parvateshwar! Parvateshwar looked up to see Kali. The flickering light from the torches revealed that she was accompanied by Ganesh, Karthik, and about 50 soldiers. Parvateshwar smiled. You've brought 50 soldiers to down one man, asked Parvateshwar, his hand resting on his sword hilt. You think too highly of me, Queen Kali. Were you planning to escape, General? asked Kali. The soldiers rapidly surrounded Parvateshwar, making escape impossible. Parvateshwar was about to answer when he saw a familiar figure next to Karthik. Bhagirat? Yes, answered Bhagirat. This is a sad day for me. I'm sure it is, said Parvateshwar sarcastically, before turning to Kali. So, what do you plan on doing, Queen Kali? Kill me straight away, or wait till the Lord Nilkant returns? So, you admit that you're a traitor, said Kali. I admit to nothing since you haven't asked anything. I did ask you if you were attempting an escape. If that were the case, I wouldn't be walking away from the Asighat, Your Highness. Have you met Maharishi Bhrigu? asked Ganesh. Parvateshwar never lied. Yes, Kali sucked in a sharp breath, reaching for her sword. Mossi, said Ganesh, pleading with the Naga queen to keep her temper in check. Where is the Maharishi, General? He's back on a boat, said Parvateshwar, probably on his way to Maluha. You know what comes next, don't you? asked Kali. Do I get a soldier's death? asked Parvateshwar. Will you all attack me one by one, so I have the pleasure of killing a few of you? Or will you just pounce on me like a pack of cowardly hyenas? Nobody's getting killed, General, said Ganesh. We Nagas have a justice system. Your treachery will be proven in court, and then you will be punished me. No Naga is going to judge me, said Parvateshwar. I recognize only two courts, the one sanctioned by the laws of Meluha and the other of the Lord Nilkant. Then you shall receive justice from the Nilkant when he returns, said Kali, before turning to the soldiers. Arrest the general. Parvateshwar didn't argue. He stretched out his hands as he looked at the crestfallen face of the man handcuffing him. It was Nandi. Shiva, Sati and Gopal were dining in the Nilkant's chambers at Magad. The captain of the ship met me in the evening, said Sati. All the weapons have been loaded. We can sail for Kashi tomorrow morning. Good, said Shiva. We can begin our campaign within a few weeks. Gopal had anticipated this. I have already sent a message to the Pandit of the Narsimha temple in Magad. He will relay it to King Chandraketu, who will then set sail with an armada and await further instructions at the port of Vaishali. Bhagirat, Ganesh and Karthik will travel with them to Ayodhya, said Shiva. Ganesh will lead the Eastern Command. A wise choice, said Gopal. The Western Army, comprising of the Vasudevs, the Nagas and those Brangas who have been assigned to the Nagas, will attack Maluha under my command. We will set sail along with Kali and Parvateshwar within a week of reaching Kashi. I have already sent a message to Ajayan, said Gopal. The army has marched out with dismantled sections of our ships, which will be reassembled under Narmada. We will sail together to the Western Sea and further up the coast to Lothal. What about your war elephants, Panditji? asked Sati. How will they reach Meluha? Our elephant corps will set out from Ujjain, through the jungles, and meet us at Lothal, answered Gopal. Gopalji, can the Narsimha Temple Pandit send out a message to Suparna in Panchavati as well? asked Shiva. 
Kali has appointed her the commander of the Naga army in her absence. They should rejoin us at the Narmada. I shall do that, Nilkant, said Gopal. Chapter 17 Honor Imprisoned An underground chamber beneath the royal palace had been converted into a temporary prison for General Parvateshwar. Though the public prisons of peaceful Kashi were humane, it would have been a slight to a man of Parvateshwar's stature to be imprisoned along with common criminals. The spacious chamber, though luxuriously appointed, was windowless. Not taking any chances, Parvateshwar's hands and legs had been securely shackled. While a platoon of crack Naga troops guarded the sole exit, two senior officers watched over Parvateshwar at all times. Nandi and Parshuram kept first watch. My apologies, General, said Parshuram. Parvateshwar smiled. You don't need to apologize, Parshuram. You are following orders. That is your duty. Nandi sat opposite Parvateshwar, but kept his face averted. Are you angry with me, Major Nandi? asked Parvateshwar. What right do I have to be angry with you, General? If there's something about me that's troubling you, then you have every right to be angry. Lord Ram had asked us to always be true to ourselves. Nandi remained silent. Parvateshwar smiled ruefully and then looked away. Nandi gathered the courage to speak. Are you being true to yourself, General? Yes, I am. Forgive me. But you are not. You are betraying your living God. With visible effort, Parvateshwar kept his temper in check. It is only the very unfortunate who must choose between their God and their Swadharm. Are you saying that your personal dharm is leading you away from good? I am saying no such thing, Major Nandi. But my duty towards Maluha is most important to me. Rebelling against your God is treason. Some may hold that rebelling against your country is a greater treason. I disagree. Of course, Meluha is important to me. I would readily die for it, but I wouldn't fight my living God for the sake of Meluha. That would be completely wrong. I'm not saying that you're wrong, Major Nandi. Then you admit to being wrong yourself. I didn't say that either. How can that be, General? asked Nandi. We're talking about polar opposites. One of us has got to be wrong. Parvateshwar smiled. It is such a staunch Surya Vanshi belief. The opposite of truth has to be untruth. Nandi remained silent. But Anandamai has taught me something profound, said Parvateshwar. There is your truth, and there is my truth. As for the universal truth, it does not exist. The universal truth does exist, though it has always been an enigma to human beings, smiled Parshuram. And it will continue to remain an enigma for as long as we are bound to this mortal body. Anandamai stormed into Bhagirath's chambers in the Kashi palace, brushing the guard aside. What the hell have you done? she shouted. Bhagirath immediately rose and walked towards his sister. Anandamai, we had no choice. Damn it, he is my husband. How dare you? Anandamai, it's very likely he will share our plans with... Don't you know, Parvateshwar? Do you think he will ever do anything unethical? He used to walk away whenever you spoke about the Lord Nilkant's directives. He's not aware of any of your confidential military plans. You're right. I'm sorry. Then why is he under arrest? Anandamai, it wasn't my decision. That's rubbish. Why is he under arrest? He might escape if... Do you think he couldn't have escaped had he wanted to? He was waiting to meet the Lord Nilkant. Only then will he leave for Meluha. That's what he said, but... But? What the hell do you mean, but? Do you think Parvateshwar can lie? Do you think he is even capable of lying? No. If he has said that he will not leave till Lord Shiva returns, then believe me, he is not going anywhere. Bhagirath remained silent. Anandamai stepped out to her brother. Are you planning to assassinate him? No, Anandamai, cried a shocked Bhagirath. How can you even think I would do such a thing? Don't pull this injured act on me, Bhagirath. If anything were to happen to my husband, even an accident, you know that the Lord Nilkant's anger will be terrible. You and your allies may discount me, but you are scared of him. Remember his rage before you do something stupid. 
Anandamai, we are not. The Lord Nilkant will be back in a week. Until then, I'm going to keep a constant vigil outside the chamber where you have imprisoned him. If anyone wants to harm him, they have to contend with me first. Anandamai, nobody is going to... She turned and strode away swiftly, causing Bhagirath to trail off mid-sentence. She pushed aside the diminutive Kashi soldier standing in her path and slammed the door behind her, even as a soldier fell. Ayurvadi placed a hand on Anandamai's shoulders. The Ayodhyan princess was sitting outside the chamber where Parvateshwar had been imprisoned. She had refused to move for the last few days. Why don't you go to your room and sleep? said Ayurvadi. I'll sit here. A determined Anandamai shook her head. Wild horses couldn't drag her away. Anandamai? They aren't even letting me meet him, Ayurvati, sobbed Anandamai. Ayurvati sat down next to Anandamai. I know. Anandamai turned towards the Naga soldier standing guard at the door. My husband is no criminal! Ayurvati took Anandamai's hand in hers. Calm down. These soldiers are only following orders. He's no criminal. He's a good man. I know. Anandamai rested her head on Ayurvati's shoulders and began to cry. Calm down, said Ayurvati soothingly. Anandamai raised her head and looked at Ayurvati. I don't care if the entire world turns against him. I don't care even if the Nilkan turns against him. I will stand by my husband. He's a good man, a good man. Have faith in the Nilkant. Have faith in his justice. Speak to him the moment he arrives in Kashi. The sun was directly overhead as Shiva's ship prepared to dock at Asigharth. Shiva, Sati and Gopal were at the balustrade. I do not understand why King Atithigva has to organize a grand reception every time I come here, said Shiva as he looked at the giant canopy and vast throngs of people waiting. Gopal smiled. I don't think the Lord Atithigva orders his people to assemble, my friend. The people gather of their own accord to welcome their Nilkant. Yes, but it's so unnecessary, said Shiva. They shouldn't be taking a break from their work to welcome me. If they really want to honor me, they should work even harder at their jobs. Gopal laughed. People have a tendency to do what they want to do rather than what they should be doing. The ship was now close enough for them to see the expressions of the people on the dock, even the nobility standing further away on higher ground. Something is not right, said Sati. Why is everyone looking troubled? asked Gopal. Shiva studied the crowds carefully. You're right, something's wrong. King Aditigva seems disturbed, said Sati. Kali, Ganesh, Kartik and Bhagirath are in a heated discussion, said Shiva. What's troubling them so much? Sati tapped Shiva lightly. Look at Anandamai. Where? asked Shiva, not finding her in the area cordoned off for the nobility. She's in the crowd, said Sati, gesturing with her eyes, right where the ship's gangplank will land. Perhaps she wants to talk to you the moment you step off, my friend, said Gopal. She looks deeply agitated, Shiva said Sati. Shiva scanned the entire port area and he softly asked, Where's Parvateshwar? The guards stepped aside as the Nilkant stormed into the temporary prison. Sati, Gopal, Anandamai and Kali could hardly keep pace. He encountered Veerbhadra, Parshuram and Nandi in deep conversation with a fettered Parvateshwar. What the hell is the meaning of this? shouted a livid Shiva. My lord, said Parvateshwar as he rose, the chains clinking. Nandi, Veerbhadra and Parshuram rose too. Remove his chains! Shiva, said Kali softly, I don't think that's wise. Remove his chains now! Nandi and Parshuram immediately set to work. The chains were removed with great haste. Parvateshwar rubbed his wrists, helping the blood flow freely. Leave me alone with Parvateshwar. Shiva, said Veerbhadra, have I not made myself clear, Bhadra? Everybody leave, right now! Kali shook her head disapprovingly, but obeyed. The others stepped out without any sign of protest. Shiva turned to Parvateshwar, his eyes blazing with fury. Parvateshwar was the first to speak. My lord! Shiva raised his hand, signaling for him to keep quiet. 
Palateshwar obeyed immediately. Shiva looked away as he walked back and forth, breathing deeply to calm his mind. He remembered his uncle Monubhu's words. Anger is your enemy. Control it. Control it. Much as he tried, Shiva could feel the fury welling up within him like a coiled snake waiting to strike. But his mind also told him that the issue at hand was far too important to allow anger to cloud his judgment. Once he had breathed some calm into his mind and heart, Shiva turned to Parvateshwar. Tell me, this is not true. Just say it and I will believe you, regardless of what anyone else says. My lord, this is the most difficult decision I have ever made in my life. Do you intend to fight me, Parvateshwar? No, my lord, but I am duty-bound to protect Meluha. I hope some miracle ensures that you and Meluha are not on opposite sides. Miracle? Miracle? Are you a child, Parvateshwar? Do you think it's possible for me to compromise with Meluha where the Somras is concerned? No, my lord. Do you think that the Somras is not evil? No, my lord. The Somras is evil. I have stopped using it from the moment you said that it was evil. Then why would you fight to protect the Somras? I will only fight to protect Meluha. But they're on the same side. That is my misfortune, my lord. You stubborn... Shiva checked himself in time. Parvateshwar remained silent. He knew that Nilkant's anger was justified. Is Brigu forcing you to do this? Has he captured somebody who is important to you? We can take care of that. No one important to you will get hurt as long as I am alive. Maharishi Brigu is not forcing me in any way, my lord. Then who in Lord Rudra's name is making you do this? My soul, I have no choice. This is what I must do. That does not make any sense, Parvateshwar. Do you actually believe that your soul is forcing you to fight for evil? My soul is only making me fight for my motherland, my lord. This is a call that I cannot refuse. It is my purpose. Your soul is taking you down a dangerous path, Parvateshwar. Then so be it. No danger should distract one from walking one's path. What nonsense is this? Do you think Brigu cares about you? All he cares for is the Somras. Trust me, once your purpose is served, you will be killed. All of us die when we have served our purpose. That is the way of the universe. Shiva covered his face with his hands in sheer frustration. I know you're angry, my lord, said Parvateshwar. But your purpose is to fight evil, and you must do all that you can to accomplish it. Shiva continued to stare at Parvateshwar silently. All I am asking is for you to understand that just like you have to serve your purpose, I must serve mine. Your soul will not allow you to rest till you have destroyed evil. My soul will not allow me to rest till I have done all that I can to protect Maluha. Shiva ran his hands over his face, trying desperately to maintain his calm. Do you think I am wrong, Parvateshwar? Please, my lord, how can I ever think that? You would never do anything that is wrong. Then can you please explain the strange workings of your mind? You will not walk with me, although you admit that my path is right. Instead, you insist on walking a path which leads to your death. In the name of Lord Rudra, why? Svadharma nidhanam shreya paradharma bhavaya, said Parvateshwar. Death in the course of performing one's duty is better than engaging in another's path, for that is truly dangerous. Shiva stared hard at Parvateshwar for what seemed like an eternity, then turned around and bellowed, Nandi, Bhadra, Parshuram. They rushed in. General Parvateshwar will continue to remain our prisoner. As you command, my lord, said Nandi, saluting Shiva. And Nandi, the general will not be chained. Chapter 18 Honor of Victory I say that we have no choice, said Kali. I agree we cannot kill him, but he must remain our prisoner here till the end of the war. Shiva and his family, along with Gopal, were assembled in the Nilkant's private chambers at the Kashi Palace. Ganesh glanced at the seething Sati and decided to hold his counsel. Karthik, however, had no such compunctions. I agree with the Mossi. 
Shiva looked at Kartik. I know that it is a difficult decision, continued Kartik. Parvateshwarji has behaved with absolute honor. He was not privy to any of our strategy discussions. He could have escaped on multiple occasions, but did not. He waited till you returned, so he could take your permission to leave. But you're the Nilkant Baba. You have the responsibility for India on your shoulders. Sometimes, for the sake of the larger good, one has to do things that may not appear right at the time. Perhaps a laudable end can justify some questionable means. Sati glared at her younger son. Karthik, how can you think that a great end justifies questionable means? Ma, can we accept a world where the Somras continues to thrive? Of course we can't, said Sati. But do you think that this struggle is only about the Somras? Ganesh finally spoke up. Of course it is, Ma. No, it is not, said Sati. It is also about the legacy that we will leave behind, of how Shiva will be remembered. People from across the world will analyze every aspect of his life and draw lessons. They will aspire to be like him. Didn't we all criticize Lord Brigu for using the Devi Astras in the attack on Panchavati? The Maharishi must have justified what he did with arguments similar to what you're advocating. If we behave in the same way, then what will differentiate us from him? People only remember victors, Didi, said Kali. For history is written by victors. They can write it however they want. The losers are always remembered in the way that the victors portray them. What is important right now is for us to ensure our victory. Please, allow me to disagree, Your Highness, said Gopal. It is not true that only victors determine history. Of course it is, said Kali. There is a Deva version of events and an Asura version of events. Which version do we remember? If you talk about the present-day India, then yes, the Deva version is remembered, said Gopal. But even today, the Asura version is well known outside of India. But we live here, said Kali. Why should we bother about the beliefs that prevail elsewhere? Perhaps I have been unable to make myself clear, Your Highness, said Gopal. It's not just about the place, but also about the time. Will the Deva version of history always be remembered the way it is? Or is it possible that different versions will emerge? Remember, if there's a victor's version of events, then there's a victim's narrative that survives equally. For as long as the victors remain in command, their version holds ground. But if history has taught us one thing, it is that communities rise and fall in eminence just as surely as tides ebb and flow. There comes a time when victors do not remain as powerful, when the victims of old become the elite of the day. Then one will find that narratives change just as dramatically. This new version becomes the popular version in time. I disagree, dismissed Kali. Unless the victims escape to another land, like the Asuras, they will always remain powerless, their experiences dismissed as myths. Not quite, said Gopal. Let me talk about something that is close to your heart. In the times that we live, the Nagas are feared and cursed as demons. Many millennia ago, they were respected. After winning this war, they will become respectable and powerful once again as loyal allies of the Nilkant. Your version of history will then begin to gain currency once again, won't it? An unconvinced Kali chose to remain silent. An interesting factor is the conduct of the erstwhile victims in the new era, said Gopal. Armed with fresh empowerment, will they seek vengeance on the surviving old elite? Obviously, the victims will nurse hatred in their hearts. Would you expect them to be filled with the milk of human kindness? asked Kali sarcastically. You hate the Maluhans, don't you? Yes, I do. But how do you feel about the founding father of Meluha? Lord Ram. Kali was quiet. She held Lord Ram in deep reverence. Why do you revere Lord Ram, but reject the people he left behind? asked Gopal. Sati spoke up on her sister's behalf. That is because Lord Ram treated even his enemies honorably, quite unlike the present-day Meluhans. Shiva observed Sati 
with quiet satisfaction. A man becomes God when his vision moves beyond the bounds of victors and losers, said Sati. Shiva's message has to live on forever, and that can only happen if both the victors and the losers find validation in him. That he must win is a given, but equally critical is his winning the right way. Gopal was quick to support Sati. Honor must beget honor, that is the only way. Shiva walked to the balcony and gazed at the massive Kashi Vishwanath temple on the sacred avenue and beyond it at the holy Ganga. Everyone was poised for his decision. He turned and whispered, I need some time to think. We will meet again tomorrow. Sati looked down. The clear waters of the lake lay below her. The fish swam rapidly, keeping pace with her as she flew over the water towards the banks in the distance. She looked up towards a massive black mountain different in hue from all the surrounding mountains, topped by a white cap of snow. As she drew close, her vision fell upon a yogi on the banks of the lake. He wore a tiger skin shirt. His long matted hair had been tied up in a bun. His muscular body was covered by numerous battle scars. A small halo, almost like the sun, shone behind his head. A crescent moon was lodged in his hair, while a snake slithered around his neck. A massive trident stood sentinel beside him, half buried in the ground. The face of the yogi was blurred though. And then the mists cleared. Shiva, said Sati. Shiva smiled at her. Is this your home, Kailash? Shiva nodded, never once taking his eyes off her. We shall come here one day, my love. When it's all over, we shall live together in your beautiful land. Shiva's smile broadened. Where are Ganesh and Karthik? Shiva didn't answer. Shiva, where are our sons? Suddenly, Shiva started aging. His handsome face was rapidly overrun by wrinkles. His matted hair turned white almost instantaneously. His massive shoulders began to droop, his taut muscles dissolving before Sati's very eyes. Sati smiled. Will we grow old together? Shiva's eyes flew wide open, like he was looking at something that did not make sense. Sati looked down at her reflection in the waters. She frowned in surprise. She hadn't aged a day. She still looked as young as always. She turned back towards her husband. But I've stopped using the Somras. What does this mean? Shiva was horror-struck. Tears were flowing fiercely down his wrinkled cheeks as his face was twisted in agony. He reached out with his hand, screaming loudly, Sati! Sati looked down. Her body was on fire. Sati! He screamed once again, getting up and running towards the lake. Don't leave me! Still facing Shiva, Sati began to fly backwards, faster and faster, the wind fanning the flames on her body. But even through the blaze, she could see her husband running desperately towards her. Sati! Sati woke up with a start. The beautifully carved Kashi Palace ceiling looked ethereal in the flickering torchlight. The only sound was that of the water trickling down the porous walls, cooling the hot dry breeze as it flowed in. Sati instinctively reached out to her left. Shiva wasn't there. Alarmed, she was up in a flash. Shiva! She heard him call out from the balcony. I'm here, Sati. Walking across, she could make out Shiva's silhouette in the darkness as he leaned back in an easy chair, focused on the Vishwanath temple in the distance. Nestling comfortably against him on the armrest, she reached out her hand and ran it lovingly through her husband's locks. It wasn't a full moon night, but there was enough light for Shiva to clearly see his wife's expression. What's the matter? asked Shiva. Sati shook her head. Nothing. Something's wrong. You look disturbed. I had a strange dream. Hmm? I dreamt that we were separated. Shiva smiled and pulled Sati close to him, embracing her. You can dream all you want, but you're never getting away from me. Sati laughed. I don't intend to. Shiva held his wife close, turning his gaze back to the Vishwanath temple. What are you thinking? asked Sati. 
I'm just thinking that marrying you was the best thing I ever did. Sati smiled. I'm not going to disagree with that. But what specifically brought that up at this time? Shiva ran his hand along Sati's face. Because I know that for as long as you're with me, you will always keep me centered on the right path. So, you've decided to do the right thing with... Yes, I have. Sati nodded in satisfaction. We will win, Shiva. Yes, we will. But it has to be the right way. Absolutely, said Sati, and quoted Lord Ram. There is no wrong way to do the right thing. A select assembly awaited the arrival of Parvateshwar, who was to be produced in the court of Kashi during the second Prahar. The Kashi nobility was represented by Atithigva alone. Shiva sat impassively, his closest advisors around him in a semicircle. Gopal, Sati, Kali, Ganesh and Kartik. Bhagirath and Ayurvati stood at a distance. Anandamai was missing. Shiva nodded towards Atithigva. Atithigva called out loudly, Bring the general in! Parshuram, Virbhadra and Nandi escorted Parvateshwar into the hall. The Meluhan general was unchained, keeping in mind Shiva's explicit orders. He glanced briefly at Sati before turning to look at Shiva. The Nilkant's rigid face was inscrutable. Parvateshwar expected to be put to death. He knew Shiva would not have wanted to do it, but the others would have convinced him of the necessity of getting rid of the general. Parvateshwar also knew that regardless of what happened to him, he would treat the Nilkant with the honor that the Lord deserved. The general clicked his heels together and brought up his bald right fist up to his chest. And then, completing the Meluhan military salute, he bowed low towards the Nilkant. He did not bother with anyone else. Parvateshwar, said Shiva. Parvateshwar immediately looked up. I do not want to drag this on for too long, said Shiva. Your rebellion has shocked me. But it has also reinforced my conviction that we are fighting evil and it will not make things easy for us. It can lead even the best amongst us astray, if not through inducements, then through dubious calls of honor. Parvateshwar continued to stare at Shiva, waiting for the sentence. But when one fights against evil, one has to fight with good, said Shiva. Not just on the side of good, but with good in one's heart. Therefore, I have decided to allow you to leave. Parvateshwar couldn't believe his ears. Go now, said Shiva. Parvateshwar was only half listening. This magnificent gesture from the Nilkant had brought tears to his eyes. But let me assure you, continued Shiva coldly, the next time we meet, it will be on a battlefield, and that will be the day I will kill you. Parvateshwar bowed his head once again, his eyes clouded with tears. That will also be the day of my liberation, my lord. Shiva stayed stoic. Parvateshwar looked up at Shiva, but for as long as I live, my lord, I shall fight to protect Meluha. Go, said Shiva. Parvateshwar smiled at Sati. She brought her hands together in a polite but expressionless namaste. Parvateshwar mouthed the words, Vijaya Bhav, silently, blessing his goddaughter with victory. As he turned around to leave, he saw Ayurvati and Bhagirath standing by the door. He walked up to them. My apologies, Parvateshwar said Bhagirath. I understand, replied Parvateshwar impassively. Parvateshwar looked at Ayurvati. Ayurvati just shook her head. Do you realize that you are leaving one of the most magnificent men ever born? I do, said Parvateshwar. But I will have the good fortune of dying at his hands. Ayurvati breathed deeply and patted Parvateshwar on his shoulder. I will miss you, my friend. I will miss you too. Parvateshwar scanned the room quickly. Where's Anandamai? She's waiting for you at the port, said Bhagirath, beside the ship that will take you away. Parvateshwar nodded. He looked back one last time at Shiva and then walked out. The harbour master came up to him just as Parvateshwar reached the Asi Ghat. General, 
your ship is berthed in that direction. He began walking in the direction indicated. Parvateshwar saw Anandamai by the gangplank of a small vessel, obviously a merchant ship. Did you know that I would be allowed to leave honorably? asked a smiling Parvateshwar as soon as he reached her. When they told me this morning to arrange a ship to sail up the Ganga, said Anandamai, I could surmise it was not to carry your corpse all the way to Meluha and display it to the Surya Vanshis. Parvateshwar laughed. Also, I never lost faith in the Nilkant, said Anandamai. Yes, said Parvateshwar. He is the finest man born since Lord Ram. Anandamai looked at the ship. It's not much, I admit. It will not be comfortable, but it's quick. Parvateshwar suddenly stepped forward and embraced Anandamai. It took a surprised Anandamai a moment to respond. Parvateshwar was not a man given to public displays of affection. He knew that it was deeply uncomfortable for him, so she never tried to embrace him in public. Anandamai smiled warmly and caressed his back. It's all over now. Parvateshwar pulled back a little, but kept his arms around his wife. I will miss you. Miss me, said Anandamai. You have been the best thing that ever happened to me, said an emotional Parvateshwar, tears in his eyes. Anandamai raised her eyebrows and laughed. And I will continue to happen to you. Let's go? Yes. Where? Meluha. You're coming to Meluha? Yes. Parateshwar stepped back. Anandamai, the path ahead is dangerous. I honestly don't think that Meluha can win. So? I cannot permit you to put your life in danger. Did I seek your permission? Anandamai, you cannot. Parateshwar stopped speaking as Anandamai held his hand, turned around and started walking up the gangplank. Parvateshwar followed quietly with a smile on his face and tears in his eyes. Chapter 19 Proclamation of the Blue Lord I have a brilliant plan, said Daksha. Daksha and Virini were dining at the royal palace in Devagiri. A wary Virini put the morsel of roti and vegetables back on her plate. She stole a quick glance towards the attendant standing guard at the door. What plan? asked Virini. Believe me, said an excited Daksh. If we can implement it, the war will be over before it has begun. But Lord Brigu, even Lord Brigu would be impressed. We would be rid of the Nilkant problem once and for all. Wasn't it the Nilkant opportunity some years ago? asked a sarcastic Virini. Don't you understand what is happening? asked an irritated Daksh. Do I have to explain everything to you? War is about to break out. Our soldiers are training continuously. Yes, I am aware of that. But I think we should keep out of this and leave the matter entirely to Lord Brigu. Why? Lord Brigu is not the Emperor of India. I am. Have you told Lord Brigu that? Don't irritate me, Virini. If you're not interested in what I have to say, just say so. I'm sorry, but I think it's better to leave all the decision-making to Lord Brigu. All we should be concerned about is our family. There you go again, said Daksh, raising his voice. Family, family, family. Don't you care about how the world will see me? How history will judge me? Even the greatest men cannot dictate how posterity will judge them. Daksha pushed his plate away, shouting, You are the source of all my problems. It is because of you that I haven't been able to achieve all that I could have. Virini looked at the attendants and turned back towards her husband. Keep your voice down, Daksha. Don't make a mockery of our marriage. Ha! This marriage has been a mockery from the very beginning. Had I a more supportive wife, I would have conquered the world by now. Daksha got up angrily and stormed out. This is a huge mistake, said Kali. In its obsession for the right way, your father may end up losing the war. Ganesh and Karthik were in her chamber in the Kashi palace. I disagree, Mousi, said Karthik. I think Baba did the right thing. We have to win, but we must do it the right way. I thought you were in agreement with us, said a frowning Kali. I was, but Ma's words convinced me otherwise. In any case, Morsi, said Ganesh, 
It has happened. Let us not fret over it. We should focus on the war instead. Do we have a choice? asked Kali. Baba told me that I will lead the war effort in Ayodhya, said Ganesh. Karthik, you will be with me. We'll destroy them, Dada, said Karthik, raising his clenched right fist. That we will, said Ganesh. Mossy, are you sure about Lothal and Micah? I have already asked Soparna to send ambassadors to Governor Chinadhwaj, said Kali. Trust me, he is a friend. Karthik bent and touched his mother's feet. Vijay above, my child, said Sadi, as she applied the red tilak on Karthik's forehead for good luck and victory. Sadi, Ganesh and Karthik were in the Nilkant's chamber. Ganesh, whose forehead already bore the tilak, looked at his brother with pride. Karthik was still a child, but was already universally respected as a fearsome warrior. The two sons of Shiva were to set sail down the Ganga and meet their allies in Vaishali. From there, they were to turn back, sail up the Sarayu and attack Ayodhya. Ganesh turned towards his father and touched his feet. Shiva smiled as he pulled Ganesh up into an embrace. My blessings are not as potent as those that emerge from your mother's heart. But I know that you will make me proud. I'll try my best, Baba, smiled Ganesh. Karthik turned and touched Shiva's feet. Shiva embraced his younger son. Give them hell, Karthik. Karthik grinned. I will, Baba. You should smile more often, Karthik, said Sati. You look more handsome when you do. Karthik smiled broadly. The next time we meet, I will certainly be grinning from ear to ear, for our army would have defeated Ayodhya by then. Shiva patted Karthik on his back before turning to Ganesh. If Ayodhya is willing to break ranks with Maluha after my proclamation is made public, then I would rather we don't attack them. I understand, Baba, said Ganesh. This is why I am taking Bhagirath along with me. His father may hate the Ayodhyan prince, but Bhagirath still has access to many members of the nobility. I am hoping he will be able to convince them. When will the proclamation come out, Baba? asked Karthik. Next week, answered Shiva. Stay in touch with the Vaishali Vasudev Pandit for the reactions from across different kingdoms in Swadeep. You will know then what to expect in Ayodhya also. Yes, Baba, said Karthik. Shiva turned to Ganesh. I've been told that you have recruited Divodas and the Branga soldiers into the army. Yes, said Ganesh. We'll leave on board five ships and meet the combined Branga Vaishali army at Vaishali. I'm told they have 200 ships. Fifty of them have been deputed to the Western Army under your command and are on their way to Kashi. The remaining 150 ships will be with me. We will attack Ayodhya with 150,000 men. That won't be enough to conquer them, said Sati. But we should be able to tie them down. Yes, answered Ganesh. We'll hold them back, Baba, said Karthik. I promise you. Shiva smiled. How is she now? asked Kali. Kali was at the river gate of the eastern palace of the Kashi king Atithigva. The palace had been built on the eastern banks of the Ganga, which was considered inauspicious for any permanent construction. The kings of Kashi had bought this land to ensure that no Kashi citizen lived on that side. It was in this palace that Atithigva had housed his Naga sister, Maya. Ganesh and Kali's open presence had given Atithigva the courage to let his sister come out of hiding. Your medicines have helped, Your Highness, said Atithigva. At least, she is not in terrible pain anymore. The Paramatma has sent you as an angel to help my sister. Kali smiled sadly. She knew it was a matter of time before Maya, a singular name for conjoined twins who were fused into one body from the chest down, would die. It was a miracle that Maya had lived for so long. On discovering her presence, Kali had immediately supplied Naga medicines to lessen her suffering. Since she was to leave with the Western Army the next day, she had come over to leave the rest of her medicines with Maya. I am no angel, said Kali. If the Paramatma had any sense of justice, he wouldn't make an innocent person like Maya suffer so much. I am doing all I can to set right his injustices. Atitigva shrugged in resignation but was too pious to curse God. Kali's gaze turned towards the Ganga, where the fifty ships of the Branga Armada had dropped anchor just the previous day. 
the mighty fleet covered the width of the river, stretching to the opposite bank. A nervous excitement was palpable throughout Kashi. The smell of war was in the air. The flotilla's initial progress would be slow, for they would first sail west against the current and then southwards up the Chambal. After disembarking, the soldiers would then march towards the Narmada. The second voyage would take them along the course of the Narmada, out to the western sea, and then north towards Meluha. Let's go in, said Kali. I'd like to see Maya before I leave. Your Highness, said Kanakla, running into Daksha's private office. Daksha looked up at his Prime Minister as he slipped the papyrus he was reading back into the drawer of his desk. Where's the fire, Kanakla? Your Highness, said a frantic Kanakla, obviously carrying something within the folds of her Angavastram. You need to see this. Kanakla placed a thin stone tablet on her Emperor's desk. What's this? asked Daksha. You need to read it, Your Highness. Daksha bent over to read. To all of you who consider yourselves the children of Manu and followers of the Sanatan Dharm, this is a message from me, Shiva, your Nilkant. I have travelled across our great land, through all the kingdoms we are divided into, met with all the tribes that populate our fair realm. I have done this in search of the ultimate evil, for that is my task. Father Manu had told us evil is not a distant demon. It works its destruction close to us, with us, within us. He was right. He told us evil does not come from down below and devour us. Instead, we help evil destroy our lives. He was right. He told us good and evil are two sides of the same coin. That one day, the greatest good will transform into the greatest evil. He was right. Our greed in extracting more and more from good turns it into evil. This is the universe's way of restoring balance. It is the Paramatma's way to control our excesses. I have come to the conclusion that the Somaras is now the greatest evil of our age. All the good that could be wrung out of the Somaras has been wrung. It is time now to stop its use before the power of its evil destroys us all. It has already caused tremendous damage, from the killing of the Saraswati River, to birth deformities, to the diseases that plague some of our kingdoms. For the sake of our descendants, for the sake of our world, we cannot use the Somras anymore. Therefore, by my order, the use of the Somras is banned forthwith to all those who believe in the legend of the Nilkant. Follow me. Stop the Somras. To all those who refuse to stop using the Somras, know this, you will become my enemy, and I will not stop till the use of the Somras is stopped. This is the word of your Nilkant. Daksha looked completely stunned. What the hell? I do not understand what this means, Your Highness, said Kanakla. Do we stop using the Somras? Where did you find this? I didn't, Your Highness, said Kanakla. It was hung on the outer wall of the temple of Lord Indra, near the public bath. Half the citizens have seen this already, and they would be talking to the other half by now. Where is Maharishi Bhrigu? My lord, what about the Somras? Should I... Where is Maharishi Bhrigu? But if the Nilkant has issued this order, we have no choice. Damn it, Kanakla! screamed Daksha. Where is Maharishi Bhrigu? Kanakla was silent for an instant. She did not like the way her emperor had spoken to her. Maharishi Bhrigu had left Prayag a little more than a month back. That was the last I heard of him, Your Highness. It will take him at least two more months to reach Devagiri. Then we will wait for him before deciding on a course of action, said Daksh. But how can we oppose a proclamation from the Nilkant, Your Highness? Who is the Emperor, Karakla? You are, Your Highness. And have I taken a decision? Yes, Your Highness. Then, that is the decision of Meluha. But the people have already read this. I want you to put up a notice, stating that this proclamation is fraudulent. It cannot have been made by the true Nilkant, for he would never go against the greatest invention of Lord Brahma, the Somras. But is that true, Your Highness? Daksha's eyes narrowed, his temper barely in check. Kanakla, just do what I tell you to do, or I will appoint someone else as Prime Minister. Kanakla brought her hands together in a formal, 
but icy namaste, then turned to leave. She couldn't resist a final parting shot, though. What if there are other notices like this? Daksha looked up. Send bird couriers across the empire. If they see such a notice anywhere, it must be pulled down and replaced with what I have asked you to put up instead. This notice is bogus. Do you understand? Yes, your highness, said Kanakla. As she closed the door behind her, Daksha angrily flung the tablet on the floor. Mine is the only practical way to stop this. Maharishi Bhrigu has to listen to me. Chapter 20 The Fire Song Gopal was shown into Shiva's private chamber the moment he arrived. He joined Shiva and Sati in the balcony and seated himself in an empty chair beside them. What news do you have, Panditji? asked Shiva. It had been a week since Shiva's proclamation banning the Somras had been released simultaneously across Maluha and Swadweep. He was hoping that the people would follow his edict. My pundits across the country have sent in their reports. And the reactions in Maluha are very different from those in Swadeep. I expected that. It appears that the Swadweepan public has embraced the proclamation. It feeds into their bias against Maluha. It is seen as yet another instance of the Maluhans unfairly conspiring to stay ahead of the rest. And remember, none of them use the Somras anyway, so it's no real sacrifice for them. But how have the kings reacted? asked Sati. They are the ones in control of the armies. It's too early to say, Satiji, said Gopal. But I do know that all the kings across with Weep are in intense consultations with their advisers even as we speak. But, said Shiva, the Maluhans have rejected my proclamation, haven't they? Gopal took a deep breath. It's not so simple. My pundits tell me that the Maluhan public seemed genuinely disturbed by your proclamation initially. There were serious discussions in city squares and a lot of them believed that they needed to follow their Nilkant's words. Then what happened? The Maluhan state is supremely efficient, my friend. The notices were taken down within the first three days, at least in all the major cities. They were replaced by a Maluhan royal order stating that they had been put up by a fraud Nilkant. And the people believed it? The Maluhans have learned to trust their government completely over many generations, Shiva, said Sati. They will always believe everything that their government tells them. Also, said Gopal, you have been missing from Maluha for many years, my friend. There are some who genuinely beginning to wonder if the Nilkant has forgotten Maluha. Shiva shook his head. It looks like a war is inevitable. Daksh, and most importantly, Lord Brigo, will ensure that, said Gopal. But at least our message has reached most Meluhans. Hopefully, some of them will start asking questions. Shiva looked at the ships of the Brangas, Vasudevs and Nagas, anchored on the Ganga. We set sail in two days. No, no! Shiva shook his head in dismay. You've got it all wrong. Light and shadows from the bonfire danced on the faces of Brahaspati, Virbhadra, Nandi and Parshuram as they looked at Shiva suitably chastened. It was a moonless night and a cold wind swept in from the river. The Ganga's waters shimmered in the reflected light of the torches from the Branga fleet. In keeping with ancient tradition, the Gunas sang pians to the five holy elements ahead of major war campaigns to invoke their protection and as a mark of manhood in the face of danger. The friends of the great Guna, Shiva, had gathered to honor this custom, but they would set sail at the crack of dawn tomorrow. Shiva passed his chillam to Parshuram and decided to teach his friends the fine art of singing. The real trick is in here, said Shiva, pointing towards his diaphragm. I thought it was in here said Veerbhadra playfully, pointing to his throat. Shiva shook his head. Bhadra, the vocal cords are basically a wind instrument. Your skill depends on the control over your breath, which means, essentially, the lungs. And lungs can be regulated through the diaphragm. Try to sing from here, 
and you will find that you can project and modulate your voice with much greater ease. Nandi sang a note and then asked, Am I doing it right, my lord? Yes, said Shiva, looking at Nandi's immense stomach. If you can feel the pressure of your diaphragm on your stomach, then you're doing it right. The other thing to know is when to take a breath. If you time it right, you will not have to struggle towards the end of the line. And if you don't struggle, then you'll be able to finish your tune without having to rush through the last few notes at the end. Brahaspati, Parshuram and Nandi listened with rapt attention. Virbhadra, however, was sarcastically nodding, his eyes mirthful. He didn't much care for tuneful singing. Shiva, you're taking it too seriously. It's the thought that counts. So long as I sing it with my heart, I don't think anybody should object even if I murder the song. Parshuram waved his hand at Virbhadra before turning to Shiva. My lord, why don't you sing and show us how it's done? As everyone pinned their eyes on him, Shiva looked up at the sky, rubbed his cold neck and cleared his throat. Enough of the theatrics, said Virbhadra. Start singing now. Shiva slapped Virbhadra playfully on his arm. All right now, said Shiva with a genial grin. Silence. Virbhadra lightheartedly put his finger on his lips as Brahaspati glared at him. Virbhadra reached out, took the chillam from Bhashuram and inhaled deeply. Shiva closed his eyes and went within himself. A sonorous hum emerged from within his very being as he hit the perfect note right away. A lilting melody of words followed and the enraptured audience understood their significance. It was the prayer of a warrior to Agni or fire imploring it for a blessing. The warrior would repay this honor by feeding his enemies in combat to the hungry flames of a cremation pyre. The listeners intrinsically understood that Shiva's Prakriti was closest to fire rather than the other four elements, each of which had Guna war songs dedicated to them. It was a short song, but the audience was spellbound. Shiva ended his performance to a robust round of applause. You still have it in you, smiled Virbhadra. That cold throat hasn't thrown your voice off. Shiva smiled and took the chillam from Virbhadra. He was about to take a drag when he heard someone cough softly near the entrance of the terrace. All the friends turned to find Sati standing there. Shiva put the chillam down as he smiled. Did we wake you? Sati laughed as she walked up to Shiva. You were loud enough to waken the entire city, but the song was so beautiful that I didn't mind being woken up. Sati took a seat next to Shiva as everyone laughed. Shiva smiled. It's a song from back home. It steals a warrior's heart for battle. I think the singing was more beautiful than the song, said Sati. Yeah, right, said Shiva. Why don't you try to sing it, my lady? asked Nandi. No, no, said Sati. Of course not. Why not? asked Vibhadra. I would love to hear you sing, my child, said Brahaspati. Come on, pleaded Shiva. All right, said a smiling Sati. I'll try. Shiva picked up the chillam and offered it to Sati. She shook her head. Sati had been paying close attention to Shiva's singing. The song, its melody and lyrics, had already been committed to memory. Sati closed her eyes, drew in a deep breath and entrusted herself to the music. The song began on a very low octave. She reproduced his earlier performance precisely, allowing the words to flow out in a flood when needed and letting them hang delicately when required. She quickened her breathing as she approached the end and took the notes higher and higher into a crescendo, but the song finished in a flourish. Even the bonfire seemed to respond to the call of the elemental fire song from Sati. Wow! exclaimed Shiva, embracing her as she finished. I didn't know you could sing so beautifully. Sati blushed. Was it really that good? My lady, said a stunned Virbhadra, it was fantastic. I always thought that Shiva was the best singer in the universe. But you are even better than him. Of course not, said Sati. Of course, yes, said Shiva. It almost seemed like you had pulled all the surrounding fire into yourself. And I shall keep it within me, said Sati. We're going to be fighting the war of our lives. We need all the fire that we can get. Ganesh and Karthik had been housed in the private chambers of King Matali of Vaishali. They were accompanied by the Ayodhyan prince Bhagirath and the Branga king Chandraketu. 
their information was that Magad was not preparing a blockade to stop their ships from sailing to Ayodhya. But the Magadhan army had been put on alert and training sessions had been doubled. Either this was a precautionary step taken by Surah Padman or the Magadhans planned on attacking them once they had exhausted themselves against the Ayodhyans. We cannot afford to lose either men or ships as we pass Magad, said Ganesh. We've got to be prepared for the worst. The way I see it, said Bhagirath, pointing to the river map on the table, their primary catapults will be in the main fort on the west bank of the Sarayu. They have a small battlement on the east side as well, from where they can load catapults and throw fire barrels at us. But considering the size of this battlement, I don't think that the range will be long. So my suggestion is that we sail our ships closer to the eastern bank of the Sarayu. But not too close though, said Chandraketu. Of course, said Bhagirath. We don't want to be the casualties of the smaller catapults from the east either. Also, we can make sure that we don't just depend on our sails, but also have our oarsmen in position to row the ships rapidly, said the Vaishali king, Matali. But no matter which side of the river we sail, and how quickly we row, we will still lose people if they decide to attack, said Ganesh. Remember, we are on ships, so we cannot get our men to disembark fast enough to retaliate. Why don't we increase their risks? asked Karthik. How? asked Ganesh. Have half the soldiers from every ship go ashore before Magad. We could get them to march on the eastern banks alongside our ships. The reduced load will make our ships move faster. Also, the Magadan battlement on the eastern bank would know. There's a massive contingent of enemy soldiers marching just outside their walls. They would have to think twice before doing anything stupid. I like the idea, said Bhagirath. I've thought of something even simpler, said Chandraketu. Ganesh looked at the Branga king. The Magad royalty is amongst the poorest in Swadweep, said Chandraketu. It's a powerful kingdom, but King Mahindra has lost a considerable part of his fortune, owing to both his son Ugrasen's as well as his own gambling addiction. Do you want to bribe them? asked Bhagirath. Why not? For one, we would need massive amounts of money. A few thousand gold coins will not suffice. We won't be negotiating with some army officers, but the royalty itself. Will one million gold coins be enough? Bhagirath was stunned. One million? Yes. Just to make it through unharmed? Yes. Lord Rudra be praised. That will be nearly six months of tax collections for the Magad and royalty. Exactly. I'll dispatch Devadas to Magad with half the amount in the first ship. The other half can be handed over once our last ship has passed by safely. But they could use this wealth to buy weapons, said Karthik. They will not be able to do that quickly enough, said Chandraketu. And what they do with the money after the war is over is not my concern. Can you really afford to give away so much gold, your highness? asked Ganesh. Chandraketu smiled. We have more than enough, Lord Ganesh, but it means nothing to us. I would give away all the gold that we have to stop the Somras. All right, said Ganesh. I see no reason why it won't work. Chapter 21 Siege of Ayodhya The cool northerly wind was a welcome relief for Shiva as he sat on the deck of the lead ship with Gopal, Sati and Kali clustered around him. As the 56-vessel armada made steady progress upriver, he knew that in just a few weeks they would reach close to the headwaters of the Chambal from where the soldiers would disembark and march to the Narmada. Panditji, do your ships that wait for us at the Narmada have the additional capacity to carry the 55,000 soldiers who accompany us? asked Kali. Yes, your highness, said Gopal. Our ships have been specially designed to handle this additional load since we knew that we would not be able to use the ships we are currently on. Judging by the maps we've seen, said Sati, we should reach Lothal in three months, right Panditji? Yes, Satiji, said Gopal. If the winds favor us, we may even make it earlier. Have you received word from the Lothal governor, Kali? asked Shiva. My ambassador will be waiting with the information at the Narmada, answered Kali. Trust me, we will gain easy entry into Lothal. But don't expect a huge addition of troops into our army. Lothal doesn't have more than two or three thousand soldiers. 
We don't really need their soldiers, said Shiva. We have enough troops of our own, along with the Vasudev army that waits for us at the Nadmada, your own Naga army, and the Zbranga force. We have more than a hundred thousand men. That's equal to the strength of the Maluhan army. We can easily defeat them, said Kali. I do not intend to attack, said Shiva. I think you should. All we need to do is destroy the Somras manufacturing facility, Kali. But you have the Nagas with you. You shouldn't be afraid of a direct confrontation. I'm not afraid. I just don't see the sense in it. It will distract us from our main purpose, the destruction of the Somras. We do not want to destroy Meluha. Don't forget that. I'll count on you to remind me of that every time I forget, said Kali. Shiva smiled and shook his head. The voyage up the Sarayu had been surprisingly uneventful. The Magadans did not attack Ganesha's ship. The massive convoy was so long that the guards on the Magadan towers spent an entire day watching ships go by. A little over a week later, Ganesh ordered his ships to drop anchor. Kartik, Bhagirath, Chandraketu and Ganesh got into a small boat and rowed ashore. The forest had been cleared up to a fair distance. Devadas, the leader of the Branga immigrants in Kashi, waited there along with twenty men. Ganesh jumped off as soon as the boat beached and waded through the shallow water to the river bank. The others followed. He touched his head to the ground as he reached the shore. He looked deep into the forest, remembering a time long ago when he had hidden behind the trees and observed his mother. Kartik, this is the Bal Atibal Kund. This is where Saptrishi Vishwamitra taught Lord Ram his legendary skills. Kartik's eyes were wide open in awe. He bent down and touched the ground with his hand and whispered, Jai Shri Ram. The others around him repeated it. Jai Shri Ram. Kartik, said Ganesh, this ground was blessed by Saptrishi Vishwamitra and Lord Ram. But its greatness has been forgotten by many. We may have to redeem the honor of this land with blood. Karthik took a moment to understand. Do you think Surapadman might chase us? Ganesh smiled. He will chase us. Trust me, I see the siege of Ayodhya as a bait to draw Surapadman out of Magad. Once he's out, we will destroy his army and capture his city. We'll be able to stop Ayodhyan ships easily with Magad blockading the Ganga. And the battle to decide the fate of Magad should be fought here. For this is where I would like you to attack him. I would have thought that Surapadman would prevail on his father. He's a clever man, Karthik. From what I've understood, his instinct was to support us, but in the face of so much opposition, he will do what is now in his best interest. And he does have much to gain. He'll win the favor of his father and his countrymen by taking revenge for his brother's death. He will come as a savior for Ayodhya, albeit a little late so that Ayodhya has weakened. And who knows, he may even capture the sons of the Nilkant. Wouldn't that make him a strong ally of Brigu? asked Ganesh with an ironic smile. Yes, brother, he will attack and he will learn that clever men should always listen to their instincts. Karthik took a deep breath and looked up at the sky before turning back to Ganesh with resolve writ large in his eyes. We will turn the river red with blood, Dada! Bhagirath looked at Karthik with a familiar sense of fascination and fear. Why this ground, Lord Ganesh? asked Chandraketu. Your Highness, answered Ganesh. As you can see, this stretch is long and narrow. That will lure Surapadman into anchoring his ships along the banks, thus stretching his army thin. The forest is not too far from the shore, which means our main army can remain hidden behind the trees. We leave only a small contingent on the beach. Bhagirat smiled. That will be a very juicy bait. Surapadman will probably imagine that this is a small brigade that has deserted the siege of Ayodhya. He'll want to kill them to give his soldiers a taste of victory. Right, said Ganesh. But the main battle will not be on land. We just have to pin him down here, which will, in all honesty, take a lot of courage, since he will have a large force. That is why I want Karthik here. But Surapadman will be defeated in the river itself. How? asked Chandraketu. I'll move back from Ayodhya and ram his ships from the front, said Ganesh. I've also asked King Mathali to wait in the Sharda River along with 30 ships. The Sharda meets the Sarayu downriver. 
the Vishali fleet will sail up the Sarayu once Surapadman's ships have passed, placing them behind the Magadans. My contingent will attack from in front while the Vaishali forces will hit them from behind. Karthik has to hold Surapadman in position for long enough to make his fleet of ships immobile. He'll be sandwiched between King Matali's ships and yours, said Chandraketu. He won't stand a chance. Exactly. Sounds like a good plan, said Bhagirath. The success of the battle hinges on two points, said Ganesh. Firstly, Karthik has to entice Surapadman to anchor his ships and attack our soldiers on shore. In the absence of that, he will keep moving and his larger boats will ram through my smaller ships and possibly turn the tide in his favor. Our ships are light, maneuverable and built for speed. The Magadhan ships are bigger and have been built for strength. If Karthik fails to lure Surapadman ashore, my side of our fleet may face heavy casualties. I must be in command to take care of that possibility. And the second point? asked Bhagirath. King Matali must be positioned to block Surapadman's escape back to Magad. That will close the pincer trap. Chandraketu doubted neither Karthik's courage nor his strategic mind. His words to the young warrior bespoke respect. You're on your own, Karthik. It's all up to you now. Karthik narrowed his eyes, his hand on his sword hilt. I'll draw him in, King Chandraketu. And once I do, I assure you I'll obliterate his entire army myself. Our ships won't even be required to join the battle. Ganesh smiled at his brother. Ganesh reached for another document from the stack on the desk and began to read, then paused to rub his tired eyes. He was seated in his private cabin, surrounded by messages from his informants about the progress of the assault. There were dozens of missives telling him every aspect from the mood of the Ayodhyan populace to the progress of the armorers in meeting the archer's demand for arrows. He had hardly slept in the weeks since the battle had begun, and his body ached for rest. But these reports could not wait. It appeared that Ayodhya stood poised on the brink of surrender, and any misstep now could spell disaster. Karthik and Chandraketu sat patiently by his side, assisting Ganesh with the endless stream of messages. The three sat together in silence as they awaited Bhagirath's return to hear news of his mission. The siege of Ayodhya had begun over a month ago. Ganesha's navy had assaulted the city in the classical manner of the ancient war manuals. A large part of the fleet had been anchored along the west banks of the Sarayu in a double line, out of the range of the catapults on the fort walls of the eastern banks. The line ships had extended up to the north of Ayodhya, just shy of the sheer cliff upriver where the Sarayu descended in a waterfall. Small lifeboats had been tied to the right of the ships in Ganesha's convoy, with guards present round the clock. This was to prevent devil boats from attempting to set fire to the vessels from the Ayodhya end. A section of the army had camped to the left of the ships, on the shore itself, to thwart guerrilla action from the Ayodhyans. Further to the south, Ganesh had anchored his ships and tied them together, across the river in rows of ten. Another lineup was just behind the first level of the blockade ships. Behind these, five fast-moving cutters would patrol the river further downstream to attack any Ayodhyans who attempted to escape. Thus, any Ayodhyan ship attempting to run the river blockade had to battle through a thick line of twenty enemy ships and five quick cutters. The forest around Ayodhya had been cleared by the defending army to give it a clear line of sight in case of an attack. Prasanjit, the Maluhan brigadier, who had been left behind by Brigu, had tried hard to convince the Ayodhyans to extend the clearing area further, but he had been unsuccessful. Ganesh had got his troops to cut a second line of trees beyond the clearing as a precautionary fire line. Once the outer fire line had been established, Ganesh had ordered that the trees within the two clearings be set aflame. The intense heat generated would have resulted in the collapse of any tunnels around Ayodhya, that could have served as passages for food to be smuggled into the city. The fire had burned for four continuous days and had had a demoralizing effect on the citizens of the impenetrable city, establishing the steely resolve of their blockaders. A cataract on a sheer cliff to the north of Ayodhya served as a natural barrier, which prevented ships from navigating further north on the Sarayu. The Ayodhyans had built a channel into their walled shipyard just short of the cataract, the singular narrow channel of entry had been designed to be easily defendable. While this channel, passing through a gated wall, protected the Ayodhyan shipyard, 
It also allowed the enemy to block the exit route of their ships. Ganesh had used the leftover logs from the forest clearing to block this channel, effectively extending the siege of the city to the shipyard as well. All he had wanted was to box them in, and blocking the channel had ensured that he did not have to divert too many ships to blockade the shipyard. Ganesh had known that the Maluhans had set up a bird courier system for the Ayodhyans. He had hit upon a very simple strategy to destroy this. He had placed 600 archers on various treetops outside Ayodhya and along the Sarayu. These archers worked in eight-hour shifts, changing three times a day, maintaining a continuous 24-hour vigil. The orders had been very simple. Shoot any and every bird that they saw in the sky. Most of these dead birds were retrieved by trackers. In doing so, not only did they retrieve messages exchanged between Meluha and Ayodhya, but the dead pigeons and other game birds were also a source of fresh meat for the soldiers. Ayodhya drew fresh drinking water from the Sarayu through channels that extended from the river to within the city walls. The channels were fed by ingeniously designed giant water wheels constructed along the Sarayu. These wheels used the flow of the river to rotate. A series of buckets tied around the diameter would fill up with water and disgorge into the channels as they reached the top. Tall walls had been built around the wheels to protect them from any attack. However, there was a breach in the wall just below the water surface from where the buckets filled up with water. This opening was fortified with bronze bars that were wide enough to allow water to run through, but not so wide as to allow a man to swim in between. But that hadn't stopped Ganesh. Ganesh had deployed soldiers to swim across the Sarayu at night, pulling small floating wooden barrels. Within these barrels were smaller iron cans filled with oil, water in the space between the wooden barrel and the iron can, and a slow fuse made of hemp completed the device. Once lit, the fuse would ignite the oil, bringing the water to a boil. The consequent pressure of escaping steam would cause an explosion with the iron and wood themselves serving as shrapnel. The task of the skilled swimmers had been to strategically place the devices within the buckets of water wheels, thus destroying them. The existing wells of Ayodhya could never quench the thirst of its innumerable residents. Ganesh had allowed a small number of non-combatant women and priests to come out of the city every day to draw small amounts of water for personal use. He had also ordered that this number be progressively reduced every day until the Ayodhyan surrendered. It was a slow squeeze designed to ultimately make the people rise against their leaders. Ganesha's soldiers had added to the psychological warfare by berating the emerging Ayodhyans for going against the wishes of their Nilkant and siding with Meluha. They had been informed that the only reason why Ganesh had refrained from shooting missiles into Ayodhya was so as not to harm innocent citizens who had nothing to do with the decision of their emperor, Dilipa. The daily two-way traffic of some Ayodhyans had also served another important purpose. It had enabled the hidden Vasudev Pandit of the Ram Janabhumi temple to send an emissary to Ganesh with information collected from all the Vasudev Pandits from across the temples of India. After a couple of weeks, Ganesh had offered to send Bhagirath to meet with the nobles of his father's kingdom to reach a mutually acceptable compromise. The opportunity had been instantly grabbed by the Ayodhyans. Ganesh stretched his tired muscles and glanced at Kartik and Chandraketu seated beside him in the cabin. They also had hardly slept, but masked their exhaustion and continued to peruse the documents. Ganesh smiled to himself. When this is done, he thought, we're all going to lock ourselves in our cabins and sleep for a week. There was a sound of footsteps and a brief knock at the cabin door before it was pushed open. Bhagirath bowed slightly to Ganesh, his hair slightly ruffled from the wind, before entering to take a seat with the three men. What news, Bhagirath? asked Ganesh, pushing the pile of messages to one side. I'm afraid it's not good. Really? asked Chandraketu. I thought the Ayodhyan army must be deeply divided. I cannot think of any other reason why we were able to lay siege on the city so easily. No skirmishes, no guerrilla attacks, nothing. It could only mean that the army doesn't intend to fight. Bhagirath shook his head. You don't know Ayodhya, King Chandraketu. It was not the cowardice of their army, but the indecisiveness of their nobility which worked in our favor. They have not been able to agree on the best way to attack us. Furthermore, Maharishi Bhrigu had brought in a Maluhan brigadier, Prasanjit, to oversee the Ayodhyan war preparations. 
All it achieved was further divisions within the city. By the time they agreed upon a strategy, we were already in control of the river. There was not much that they could do after that. So, asked Ganesh, haven't their troubles opened the eyes of some at least? No, said Bhagirath. There is tremendous confusion within the city. Many Ayodhyans are fanatical devotees of Lord Shiva and are certain that the Nilkant will not harm them. They refuse to believe that he has ordered this attack. This blind devotion seems to be working against us. So who do they think has ordered this attack? asked Chandraketu. Seeing the number of Brangas in the army, they think that it's you, said Bhagirath. Chandraketu raised his hands. Why would I attack Ayodhya? They believe that Branga wants to be the overlord of Swadeep, said Bhagirath. In the absence of Lord Shiva, there's nothing we can do to convince them otherwise. There are a few who do believe in the proclamation that was put up, but they are in a minority. They are outshouted by a very simple logic. We have never used a Sombra, so why would the Nilkant attack us? He should attack Meluha. Of course, a few members of the nobility do use the Somras, but the people do not know that. It is the opinion of the nobility that is more important right now, said Karthik. The people do not need to control the army. So what do the nobles think? The nobility is sharply divided. Some of them actually want us to succeed, which would give them a plausible reason to refuse to help Meluha. Others believe surrendering will mean terrible loss of face. These people want the army to gallantly strike out and sail to Maluha, if only to prove to the rest of Swadeep that Ayodhya has the strength to do what it chooses to do. How do we assist those who do not want to come to the aid of Maluha? asked Ganesh. It's difficult, said Bhagirath. My father made a brilliant move last week. He promised all of them a lifetime supply of the Somras. What? Yes. He told them that Lord Bhriku has promised to supply the Somras powder to Ayodhya in massive quantities. But how can Maharishi Bhriku promise that? asked Karthik. Where will it come from? Is the manufacturing facility capable of producing so much more? It clearly must be, said Bhagirath. In any case, this offer is open only to the nobility, so the numbers will be small. Damn, said Ganesh. My thoughts precisely, said Bhagirath. This will allow them to remain alive for a hundred more years. No amount of gold can compete with that. What do we do now? asked Chandraketu. Prepare for war, said Ganesh. They will make earnest attempts to break the siege. Chapter 22 Magad mobilizes. Shiva, along with Sati, Gopal and Kali, watch the massive army board the Vasudev and Naga ships on the banks of the Narmada. The Vasudevs had tied some logs together to create floating platforms for the army to reach the anchored ships. A viewing platform had been built on a banyan tree near the banks. The leaves had been shorn off to afford a panoramic view of the boarding operations. The line of ships stretched as far as the eye could see. Over 100,000 soldiers, comprising the Brangas, Vasudevs and Nagas, were boarding the vessels in an orderly manner. The voyage would be uncomfortable with 2,000 men on every ship, but fortunately, the journey to Lothal would be short. We should be ready to sail out by tomorrow, Shiva, said Kali. Has Suparna boarded? asked Shiva. Suparna, a fearsome warrior, was the leader of the Garuda Nagas. Not yet, said Kali. May I meet her? I'd like to exchange some thoughts on the Nagas under her command. Kali raised her eyebrows. She had expected to lead the Nagas into the war. I'd like you to be with me, Kali, said Shiva, mollifying her. I trust you. I'm going to be leading the search party into Meluhan cities to try and locate the Somras manufacturing facility. We'll have to work quietly and anonymously while our army outside the city keeps the Meluhans busy. You are very tactful, Shiva, Shiva frowned. You know how to get your own way, without making one feel that one has been cut down to size," said Kali. Shiva smiled, once again silent. But I understand that the search for the Somras facility is crucial, said Kali. So it will be my honor to accompany you. Excellent, said Shiva, turning to Gopal. Any news from the Vasudev's Pandaji? The siege of Ayodhya 
has been surprisingly easy, said Gopal. The Ayodhyans have not fought back. Ganesh has a stranglehold over the city. But has King Dilipa changed his stance? Not yet, and Ganesh is, very wisely, not resorting to violence, since that may rally the citizens around their king. We will have to be patient. As long as the Ayodhyan army doesn't come to Maluha's aid, I'm happy. What about Magad? His ships are ready, said Gopal. But Surapadman's army has not been mobilized as yet. Shiva raised his brows, clearly surprised. I didn't think that Surapadman would let go of an opportunity like this. I would also imagine that his father, King Mahindra, would pressure him to attack us. Let us see, said Sati. Maybe Surapadman wants Ayodhya and our army to battle first. He would then be attacking a weakened enemy. Shiva nodded. Perhaps. Look, Bhagirath, said Ganesh. The prince had just entered Ganesh's cabin. One of the soldiers had left a note from Maluha that was recovered from an injured bird. It was coded, but Bhagirath knew the encryption codes of Maluha Ayodhya communication and had already trained Ganesh's soldiers on how to decrypt the messages. Bhagirath read aloud. Prime Minister Siamantak, has Lord Brigu returned to Ayodhya? It has been months since he left Prayag, but he has still not reached Maluha. Should you have the knowledge, we would like to be informed about the location of Lord Shiva and General Parvateshwar. Ganesh didn't say anything, waiting for Bhagirath's reaction. It's been signed by Prime Minister Kanakla, said Bhagirath. Interesting. Interesting indeed, said Ganesh. Where is Lord Brigu? And why is the Maluhan Prime Minister inquiring about General Parvateshwar? Has he not reached us yet? Do they not know he has defected to their side? Where do you think they are? asked Bhagirath. They're most certainly not in Maluha, said Ganesh. That makes things easier for my father. Do you think Lord Shiva has reached Maluha by now? I think he's still a few weeks away. And the Ayodhya army has not been able to leave, said Bhagirath. The news just keeps getting better. Karthik suddenly rushed in. Dada! What's the matter, Karthik? Magad is mobilizing. Who told you? The Vasudev Pandit? asked Bhagirath. Yes, said Karthik, turning back to Ganesh. I believe armaments are being loaded onto the ships. Soldiers have been asked to be on standby. Ganesh smiled. How many soldiers? Seventy-five thousand. Seventy-five thousand? asked a surprised Bhagirath. Is Surapadman committing everything? Magad will be left defenseless. When are they expected to set sail? asked Ganesh. Probably in two weeks' time, said Karthik. At least, that's what the Vasudev Pandit surmised. You should leave in the next few days, said Ganesh. Take one hundred thousand men. Why so many, Dada? asked Karthik. Don't you need some men here with you? I just need enough to be able to sail ships and shoot fire arrows, said Ganesh. If you do not succeed in holding Surapadman off at the Bal Atibal Kund, he will just ram into us with his larger ships and drown us all. Our soldiers will be put to better use at your end, not mine. I'll prepare to leave right away, said Karthik. A hundred thousand well-motivated soldiers reached the forests near the Bal Atibal Kund in the early afternoon. The Ayodhyan prince had accompanied the army as a chief advisor to Karthik. King Chandraketu had stayed back with Ganesh to ensure that the Branga soldiers in Karthik's army would not be confused about the chain of command. Immediately upon arrival, Karthik ordered the construction of waterproof coracles which would serve as devil boats to set the Magad fleet on fire. A thousand soldiers constructed them and then hid them on the eastern banks on the opposite side of the Kund. They would destroy the enemy ships from the other side, even as the battle ensued in the area around the Kund. Hidden platforms had been constructed atop the trees to facilitate the relay of information back and forth between the two sides. A simple communication tool had been manufactured for these soldiers. Small metallic pipes fitted on top of earthen pots containing anthracite, which burns with a short but more importantly smokeless flame. The caps on these metallic pipes could be easily lifted open and then shut, allowing light out in a controlled manner. The apertures were small enough to give the impression of a collection of fireflies. For Karthik soldiers, though, the light signals would carry coded messages from both sides of the river. Karthik wanted the area around the Bal Atibal Kund to be left undisturbed. 
The army was to stay strictly within the forested area. I don't understand, Karthik. We do want our men on the beach if they're to serve as bait, don't we? At least that's what Ganesh had in mind. I would hesitate to underestimate Sura Padman, Prince Bhagirath. And I dare say, he will not underestimate us either. If he sees a small number of our soldiers casually stationed in an area visible from the river, he may smell a trap. After all, if we were deserting our army, we wouldn't be stupid enough to camp where we could be seen, would we? Fair enough. So what do you suggest? We are on the west bank. Magad is further to our south, also on the west bank of the Sarayu. If we were to march along the river, where the forest is not too dense, Magad would not be more than two or three weeks from here. Bhagirath smiled. You want Surapatman to guess our actual strategy, that the Ayodhyan siege was a feint to try to draw him out. You will realize that by conquering Magad, we will have much more effective control over Ayodhyan ships sailing by, as compared to besieging Ayodhya itself. Exactly. And if he's smart enough to suspect that, as I am sure he is, he will have scouts looking out towards the forests running along the river. And when he gets reports of our massive army, he will draw the obvious conclusion that we have marched out to conquer Magad while he is wasting his time sailing to Ayodhya. Leave your home defenses to conquer another land and you may find your own home getting conquered instead. You got it, said Karthik. Also, it will have credibility in Surapadman's eyes for that's what he would expect a smart enemy to do. I do not see him underestimating us. But what would stop him from just turning around and sailing back to Magad? Turning a large fleet of ships around in a river is easier said than done, especially if one is short of time. But even if Surapadman manages to do so and speeds down the river to reach Magad before us, he would know that our army could simply stop marching and not appear at the gates of his city. His own Magadans may then believe that Surapadman ran away from the battle at Ayodhya using the false pretext of Magad itself being in danger. Crown Prince cannot afford to be perceived as a coward, so he would have no choice but to attack us here itself. What do you think? I like the plan, said Bhagirath. It should work with a good general like Surapadman, for he will have scouts riding along the riverbanks to keep him informed of what's going on. We have to be sure to attack those scouts, but allow some of them to escape with information about the signs of our army. Also, our camp in the forest stretches up to two kilometers. When the ships pass our position, we should have soldiers disturb the birds on top of the trees at the beginning of our camp. Also, we could have some fires left carelessly aflame towards the end of our camp. Judging the vast distance between these two signals, Surapadman will assume that there is a massive enemy army marching south along the riverbank. He would be forced to attack. Right. Let's have some devil boats on the western bank as well. But the battle will be fought here on the west bank, said Karthik frowning. Their men would engage in battle here and our fire coracles would be clearly visible. Devil boats can set fire to ships only when they have an element of surprise. If they are visible, then they can be easily sunk. That's why I have set up the devil boats on the eastern banks. The fighting would happen on our side, said Bhagirath, but Sura Padman would be forced to land his men on the sands of the Bal Atibal Kund and nowhere else on the western side. It's almost impossible to land men in large numbers in the dense forest which runs along the river further north. So, if we keep our coracles up north, they would remain hidden from enemy eyes. As soon as his ships anchor to investigate our position, we'll attack them at the north end of his convoy. Good point. I'll issue those orders. Karthik's army was ready and poised for action as they heard the sounds of a massive navy rowing up the Sarayu. Judging by the dull drum beats of the timekeepers and the faint sound of the oars negotiating the waters, it was fair to assume that the Magadan ships would reach the Bal Atibal Kund within the next hour or two. Soldiers were immediately ordered to take battle positions, weapons were checked, defenses were tested. Karthik walked up to the edge of the forest and surveyed the sands of the Bal Atibal Kund as well as the river beyond. A crescent moon had failed to lift the darkness of the late hour of the night, which suited his strategy. A light seasonal fog had begun to spread along the river. Perfect. With a practiced eye, he checked whether the communication pots were still visible in the fog and was pleased with what he saw. Karthik turned to Bhagirath and then looked further ahead towards Devadas and the other commanders of the Branga army. My friends, said Karthik, unlike my father, I'm not good with words. So I will keep this short. 
The Magadans will be fighting only for conquest and glory. Those are weak motivations. You are fighting for vengeance and retribution, for your families and for the soul of your nation. You are fighting to stop the Somras that has killed your children and crippled your people. You are fighting to stop the scourge of this evil. You have to fight to the end until they are finished. I don't want prisoners. I want them dead. If anyone takes a sign of evil, they forfeit the right to live. Remember, remember the pain of your children. The Branga commanders roared together. Death to the Magadans. This land that we stand upon, continued Karthik, has been blessed by the feet of Lord Ram. We shall honor him today with blood. Jai Shri Ram. Jai Shri Ram. To your positions, ordered Karthik. The Branga commanders hurried away. As soon as the men were out of earshot, Bhagirath spoke. Karthik, why do you want them all dead? Prince Bhagirath, if there are too many Magadhan prisoners, we will have to leave behind a large force to keep watch over them. Our eventual purpose is to get as many soldiers as possible to Meluha. If the Magadhan army is decimated, we will not need to keep too many of our own soldiers in Magad. Just a few thousand of them would be enough to control the city. Also, the killing of all the Magadans would send a message to Ayodhya. It might make them reconsider their alliance with Meluha. Bhagirath was forced to accept Karthik's brutal but effective line of thought. Chapter 23 Battle of Bal Atibalkund the lead ship of the Magadan army passed the Bal Atibalkund. Karthik's army had heard the low monotonous sounds of rowing and the drum beats of the timekeepers long before they had sighted the Magadan ships. Karthik motioned for a signal to be relayed by hand over a line of men who had been positioned for this purpose till the message reached the southern end of the camp more than a kilometer away. A group of soldiers pulled a rope quietly, releasing a net that had been tightly cast over a flock of birds. The birds took off suddenly, startled by their unexpected freedom. Karthik detected some movement in the Magadan ships. They had clearly heard the birds. Karthik strained his eyes. The Magadan soldiers had their eyes pinned towards the top of the main masts. Shit! whispered Bhagirath as he realized the implications. A small, wry smile of appreciation for a worthy enemy flickered on Karthik's face. He turned to Devadas, who stood right behind him. Devadas, send messages to our treetop soldiers that the Magadans have lookouts stationed on their crow's nests. Our soldiers should remain low to avoid detection. A crow's nest is built on top of the main mast head of the ship, where sailors would be stationed as lookouts to survey far and wide, so as to report to the captain below on deck. This was a common practice on seafaring ships but was rarely used in river ships. Surapadman was obviously a cautious man, for he had built crow's nests on his ships. Devadas left quietly to carry out Karthik's orders. The ships are pulling back their oars, said Bhagirath, pointing forward. As they were sailing against the natural flow of the river current, the Magadan ships slowed down quickly. The sails were readjusted to bring the ships to a halt. Their earlier speed was such, though, that at least ten ships past the area where Karthik stood before Surapadman's fleet came to a standstill. The soldiers on the ships stared hard into the dense forests on the western banks. Now we wait, said Karthik. Bhagirath leaned over to Karthik. Their scout is a short distance behind us, close to the water's edge. Karthik stretched his arms in an exaggerated manner and then spoke to Devadas loud enough for the Magadan scout to hear. Check if their ship have started moving up ahead. Devadas moved towards the river, making the scout fall back silently. He returned almost instantaneously. Lord Karthik, their scout is swimming back to the ship. Karthik immediately rose and crept to the edge of the forest. He could see the Magadan scout swimming noiselessly away. I expect the attack soon, said Bhagirath. We should fall back to our positions. Let's wait a few moments, said Karthik. I want to see which ship he boards. It'll tell us where Surapadman is. It 
It's been almost half an hour, said Bhagirath. What is he waiting for? Karthik and his army remained behind the forest line. They wanted to give Surapadman the impression that the Brangas did not wish to engage in a battle. They hoped he would be lulled into believing that he could launch a surprise attack. Karthik suddenly exclaimed, Son of a bitch! Lord Karthik? asked Devadas. Send a message to our lookouts, said Karthik. Tell them to communicate with those on the other side. I want to know what is happening there. Bhagirath slapped his forehead. Oh my God, we'd asked our lookouts to stay low. Devadas rushed off and messages were soon relayed across the Sarayu using light signals. He was back in no time with worrying news. They're mobilizing on the other side, hidden by their massive vessels. Rowboats are being lowered quietly into the river and soldiers are boarding it even as we speak. It looks like they're preparing to row down river. That cunning son of a flea-bitten dog, said Bhagirath. He intends to row down river, hidden by his own ships, and attack us from the south. What do we do, Lord Karthik? asked Devadas. Ask our lookouts if the Magadans are disembarking from their tenth ship. That's where Surapadman is. Turning to Bhagirath, Karthik continued. Prince Bhagirath, I suspect he will launch a two-pronged attack. There will be one at Balati Balkund. Surapadman would want to keep us busy here. In the meantime, another contingent of Magadans would row down south, flank our southern side and aim to enter our camp from behind. We would be sandwiched between two sections of his army. Which means we need to break up, said Bhagirath. One of us will stay here at Balati Balkund and the other will ride out to meet their southern force. Exactly, said Karthik. Meanwhile, Divadas returned. Lord Karthik, they are disembarking from Surapadman's ship. Prince Bhagirath, said Karthik, you will lead our main force here. We have to ensure the Magadans don't get past Balatibal. I want this to be a death trap for them. It'll be so, Karthik, I assure you. But do not leave too many from our forces with me. You will need a large number of soldiers to battle Surapadman in the south. No, I won't, said Karthik. He's rowing down river. He will not have any horses. I will. Bhagirath understood immediately. A single mounted cavalry warrior was equal to ten foot soldiers. He had the advantage of height as well as his horse's fearsome kicks. All right. Karthik snapped orders to Devadas even as he rose. Ride down south. Inform our forces to expect a Magadan charge soon. You will be leading them. I'm going to ride out with 2,000 cavalrymen in a giant arc from the west. I intend to attack Surapadman's forces from behind. Between my horses and your troops, we will crush them. Devadas smiled. That we will. You bet, said Karthik. Har Har Mahadev. Har Har Mahadev, said Devadas. Devadas ran to his horse, swung into the saddle and rode away. Karthik appeared to be running over the instructions in his mind, not wanting to miss out a single detail. I have fought many battles, Karthik, said Bhagirath with an amused look. Go fight yours. Let me take care of mine, Karthik smiled. We'll give my father a famous victory. That we shall, said Bhagirath. Karthik walked up to his horse, stretched up to put his left foot into the stirrup, for he was still quite short and swung his right leg over to the other side, mounting his horse. Bhagirath, who had followed Karthik, saw the same steely look in the boy's eyes that he had seen many times during the animal hunts. A familiar sense of fear and fascination entered Bhagirath's heart. He smiled nervously and whispered, God have mercy on Surapadman. Karthik heard the remark and chuckled softly. He will have to be the one, for I won't. The son of the Nilgand turned his horse and galloped away into the dark. The slender moon was now cloaked in clouds, its faint light hidden in the mist. Bhagirath could barely make out the lines of men in the wood beside him. He sensed them now by the sound of their breath rasping in the darkness. The metallic smell of sweat hung heavy in the air. Bhagirath could feel the perspiration beading on his upper lip, trickling into the corner of his mouth. Whispers came floating back up to his ears from up and down the line. Harar Mahadev! Harar Mahadev! Like a prayer as the men braced to face Surapadman's army. Suddenly, the moon burst through the clouds and Bhagirath could see men running up and down the length of the enemy ships carrying fire torches. They were lighting the arrows for the archers. Shields up! screamed Bhagirath. Bhagirath's soldiers, primarily Brangas, immediately prepared for the volley of arrows that would soon descend upon them. 
The sky lit up as the archers shot their fire arrows. They flew out in a great arc before descending into the jungle. Bhagirath had kept his men strictly within the forest line, so the trees worked as their first line of defense. The few that got through were easily blocked by the raised shields. The Magadans had hoped that their fire arrows would set the forest aflame, causing chaos and confusion amongst the Brangas. But mist and the cold of the night had ensured due formation on the leaves. The trees simply did not catch fire. As the arrows stopped, Bhagirath roared loudly, Har Har Mahadev! His soldiers followed him as their cry rent the air, Har Har Mahadev! The Magadans quickly lit another line of arrows and shot. Once again, the trees and the Branga shields ensured that Bhagirath's soldiers suffered no casualties. The Brangas put their shields aside and let out their war cry, taunting their enemies, Har Har Mahadev! Bhagirath could see the rowboats being lowered from the ships. The attack was about to begin. The fire arrows were just a cover. As he watched the arrows being loaded again, he turned to his men. Shields! The Brangas effortlessly defended themselves against another volley of fire arrows. Send a message to our men on the other side to launch their fire coracles. Now! As his aide rushed away, Bhagirath saw his enemies rowing out towards the Kund, and yet another shower of arrows was fired. Don't move! shouted Bhagirath, keeping his men in check. Let them land first! In order to inflict maximum casualties, Bhagirath would allow a large contingent of enemy soldiers to land ashore before launching a three-pronged attack from the adjoining forest. An impregnable phalanx of his infantry, standing shoulder to shoulder, shields in front, would advance and push at the front-line Magadan soldiers with unstoppable force. The enemy soldiers bringing up the rear would inevitably be forced into the water. Weighed down by their weapons and armor, they would drown. The front line, hopelessly outnumbered, would then be decimated. Shields! ordered Bhagirath once again as he saw the arrows being lit. His gut feel was that this would be the last volley. Enemy soldiers were jumping off their boats onto the sands of Bal Atibal. Brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat was moments away. Bhagirath could feel the adrenaline rushing through his veins. He could almost smell the blood that was about to be shed. Charge! bellowed Bhagirath. Kartik rode furiously with his 2,000 strong cavalry. Even through the dense foliage, he could see fire arrows being shot from the Magadan ships. They had commenced battle, which meant that the southern contingent of the Magadan army was in position. Faster! roared Kartik to his horsemen. They could see that the ships at the center of the fleet had already caught fire. The devil boats had struck. Bhagirath was obviously hurting the Magadan army. What was surprising, though, was that the southern end was also aflame. The Vishali forces must have arrived and were attacking the Magadan navy from behind. Kartik was distracted by the din up ahead. It was a sound of a fierce battle between the southern contingent of the Magadans and Devadas's Brangas. Tried harder! Surapadman's men had probably shot fire arrows here as well, for parts of the camp were on fire. But this served as a beacon for Kartik's horsemen. They kicked their horses hard, spurring them on. The Brangas at the southern end were hard at work, holding almost 20,000 soldiers at bay. The Magadans, who had expected to decimate an unprepared enemy, were shocked by the fierce resistance they were facing. Things would get a lot worse though, for the Magadans did not expect danger from the back as well. Har Har Mahadev! yelled Karthik as he drew his long sword. Har Har Mahadev! roared the Branga horsemen as they charged. The last rows of the Magadan foot soldiers, completely unprepared for a cavalry charge from the rear, were ruthlessly butchered within minutes. Karthik and his cavalry cut a wide swath through the Magadan units, their horses trampling hapless soldiers, their swords slicing all those who stood in their path. Initially, the rear attack of the Branga cavalry went unnoticed due to the massive size of the rival armies and the brutal din and clamor of a battle well joined. Quickly overcoming their surprise, many brave Magadan soldiers leapt at the horsemen, stabbing at the beasts and even fearlessly holding onto the stirrups, hoping to bring them down. Sensing that he led the cavalry charge, a clutch of infantrymen tripped Karthik's steed, bringing them both down in a crash. They would soon wish that they hadn't. 
with cat-like reflexes, Kartik sprang to his feet, viciously drawing his second sword as well, and cutting at the first of the soldiers pressing onto him. The Magadan crumpled in mid-step and fell silently to the ground, his windpipe severed, a gush of air bursting from his slit throat, splattering blood on those around him. A second soldier charged and was cut down before he'd taken two steps, a single stroke of Kartik's blade slicing through his torso, almost to his spine. The remaining soldiers paused, cautious now of this boy who could kill with such ease. They spread out in a circle around him, swords at the ready. Kartik knew they would charge together from all sides and waited for them to make their move. The charge came, two from the front, one from the back and a fourth from the left. Kartik crouched and with near inhuman speed, sidestepped to the left and swung fiercely. Generating fearful blade speed through his swinging strikes, he brutally sliced limb, sinew, head and trunk all around him. Blood and entrails were splattered all over. He paused, panting, the swords in his hand dripping red with blood. He looked around him, selected an opponent and charged again. As the Bhagavad Gita would say, Kartik had become death, the destroyer of worlds. The fighting raged for half an hour as the tide of the battle tipped more and more against the Magadans. But they fought on as no quarter was given either by Kartik or his army. Slowly, the screams of the dying lessened and then were silenced as Surapadman's army perished. Soldiers stopped their slaughter and stood quietly on the battlefield, leaning exhausted on their swords and panting. But Kartik did not slacken, pressing attack after attack on all those that remained standing. Devadas tried to run as he approached Kartik, but his legs were weak and trembling, and he could scarcely manage more than a stumbling trot. He was covered in blood from a dozen small cuts, and a deep gash in his shoulder left his right arm dangling limply to his side. My lord, he called out, breathless and hoarse. My lord! Kartik swung viciously, the speed of his movement building formidable power in his curved blade. Devadas took the blow on his shield as his hand reverberated with the shock of blocking the brutal blow, numbing his left arm to the shoulder. My lord! he pleaded in desperation. It is I, Devadas! Kartik suddenly stopped, his long sword held high in his right hand, his curved blade held low in his left, his breathing sharp and heavy, his eyes bulging with bloodlust. My lord! shrieked Devadas, his fear palpable. You have killed them all! Please stop! As Karthik's breathing slowed, he allowed his gaze to take in the scene of destruction all around him. Hacked bodies littered the battlefield. A once proud Magadan army completely decimated. Devadas's frontal attack, combined with the rear cavalry charge, had achieved Karthik's plan. Karthik could still feel the adrenaline coursing furiously through his veins. Devadas, still afraid of Karthik, whispered, You have won, my lord. Kartik raised his long sword high and shouted, Har Har Mahadev! The Brangas roared after him, Har Har Mahadev! Kartik bent down and flipped a Magadan's decapitated head with his sword and then turned to Devadas. Find Surapadman! If there's life left in him, I want him brought to me alive! Yes, my lord, said Devadas and rushed to obey. Kartik wiped both his swords and the clothing of a fallen Magadan soldier and carefully caged the blades in the scabbard tied across his back. The Branga soldiers maintained a respectful distance from him, terrified of the brutal violence they had just witnessed. He walked slowly towards the river, bent down, scooped some water in his palms and splashed it on his face. The river had turned red due to the massive bloodletting that had just occurred. He was covered with blood and gore, but his eyes were clean. Still, the bloodlust had left him. Later in the day, when the dead were counted, it would emerge that 70,000 of the Magadan army from amongst 75,000 had been slaughtered, burned or drowned. Karthik, on the other hand, had lost only 5,000 of his 100,000 men. This was not a battle. It had been a massacre. Karthik looked up at the sky. The first rays of the sun were breaking on the horizon, heralding a new day. And on this day, a legend had been born. The legend of Karthik, the Lord of War. Chapter 24 The Age of Violence 
the golden orb of a rising sun peaked from the mainland to the right as a strong southerly wind filled their sails, racing them towards the port of Lothal. Shiva, with Sati at his side, stood poised on the foredeck, eyes transfixed northwards, wishing their ship all speed. I wonder how the war has progressed in Swadeep, said Sati. Shiva turned to her with a smile. We do not know if there has been a war at all, Sati. Maybe Ganesha's tactics have worked. I hope so. Shiva held Sati's hand. Our sons are warriors. They are doing what they are supposed to. You don't need to worry about them. I'm not worried about Ganesh. I know that if he can avoid bloodshed, he will. Not that he's a coward, but he understands the futility of war. But Karthik, he loves the art of war. I fear he will go out of his way to court danger. You're probably right, said Shiva. But you cannot change his essential character. And in any case, isn't that what being a warrior is all about? But every other warrior goes into battle reluctantly. He fights because he has to. Karthik is not like that. He is enthused by warfare. It seems that his swadharm is war. That worries me, said Sati, expressing her anxieties about what she felt was Karthik's personal dharm. Shiva drew Sati into his arms and kissed her on the lips, reassuringly. Everything will be all right. Sati smiled and rested her head on Shiva's chest. I must admit, that helped a bit. Shiva laughed softly. Let me help you some more then. Shiva raised Sati's face and kissed her again. <clears throat> Shiva and Sati turned around to find Veer Bhadra and Kritika approaching them. This is an open deck, said a smiling Veer Bhadra, teasing his friend. Find a room. Kritika hit Veer Bhadra lightly on his stomach, embarrassed. Shut up. Shiva smiled. How are you, Kritika? Very well, my lord. Kritika, said Shiva. How many times do I have to tell you? You are my friend's wife. Call me Shiva. Kritika smiled. I'm sorry. Shiva rested his hand on Veer Bhadra's shoulder. What did the captain say, Bhadra? How far are we? At the rate we are sailing, just a few more days. The winds have been kind. Hmm. Have you ever been to Lothal or Maika, Kritika? Kritika shook her head. It's difficult for me to get pregnant, Shiva. And that is the only way that an outsider can enter Maika. Shiva winced yet touched a raw nerve. Veer Bhadra did not care that Kritika could not conceive, but it still distressed her. I'm sorry, said Shiva. No, no, smiled Kritika. Veer Bhadra has convinced me that we are good enough for each other. We don't need a child to complete us. Shiva patted Veer Bhadra's back. Sometimes we barbarians can surprise even ourselves with our good sense. Kritika laughed softly. But I have visited the older Lothal. Older Lothal? Didn't I tell you? asked Sati. The seaport of Lothal is actually a new city. The older Lothal was a river port on the Saraswati. But when the Saraswati stopped reaching the sea, there was no water around the old city, ending its vibrancy. The locals decided to recreate their hometown next to the sea. The new Lothal is exactly like the old city, except that it's a seaport. Interesting, said Shiva. So what happened to the old Lothal? It's practically abandoned, but a few people continue to live there. So why didn't they give the new city a different name? Why call it Lothal? The old citizens were very attached to their city. It was one of the greatest cities of the empire. They didn't want the name to disappear in the sands of time. They also assumed most people would forget old Lothal. Shiva looked towards the sea. New Lothal, here we come! The sun had risen high over Bal Atibal Kund. It was the third hour of the second Prahar. The bodies of the fallen Magadans and Brangas were being removed to a cleared area in the forest where, to the drone of ritual chanting, their mortal remains were being cremated. Considering the massive number of Magadan dead, this was back-breaking work. But Karthik had been very insistent. Valor they got respect, whether in life or in the aftermath of death. Has Surapadma not been found yet? asked Bhagirath, his eyes scanning the sands of the Kund. Yesterday they were pristine white. Today they were a pale shade of pink, discolored by the massive quantities of blood. Not as yet, said Karthik. Initially 
I thought he was fighting on the southern front. We were unable to find him there, so I assumed he'd be over here. Matali, the Vishadi king, had proved his naval acumen by destroying the rear guard of the Magadan fleet. Having heard of Karthik's valor and ferocity, he now viewed him with a newfound respect. Gone were the last traces of indulgence for the son of the Nilkant. How far is my brother's fleet, King Matali? asked Karthik. I've sent some of my rowboats upriver. It is clogged with the debris of the Magadan ships. Our boats are trying to clear up the mess, but it will take time. And Lord Ganesh is moving carefully so the ships don't sustain any damage. So he will take some time to get here. Karthik nodded. But he has been informed about your great victory, Lord Karthik, said Matali. He is very proud of you. Karthik frowned. It's not my victory, Your Highness. It's our victory. And it would not have been possible without my elder brother, who destroyed the northern end of the Magadha navy. That he did, said Matali. My lord, hailed Devadas, crossing over from the dense forests to the sands of the Bal Atibalkund. Still weak from injuries and bandaged across his shoulder, he was being assisted by five men as they together dragged something with ropes. It took Karthik a moment to recognize what they were dragging. Devadas, treat him with respect! Devadas stopped at once. Karthik ran towards them, followed by Bhagirath and Matali. The corpse they had been dragging was that of a tall, well-built, swarthy man. His clothes and armor were soaked dark with blood, and his body was covered with wounds, some dried and black, others still fresh, red and wet. His skull had been split open near his temple, showing how he had died. His injuries were too numerous to be counted, clearly indicating the valor of this combatant. All the wounds were in front, not one on the back. It had been an honorable death. Surapadman, whispered Bhagirath. He was on the southern front, my lord, said Devadas. Karthik pulled out his knife, bent down to cut the ropes tied around Surapadman's shoulders, and then gently lowered the fallen prince back onto the ground. He noticed Surapadman's right hand still tightly gripping his sword. He touched the sword, its blade caked with dried blood. Devadas tried to pry open Surapadman's fingers. Stop, commanded Karthik. Surapadman will carry his sword into the other world. Devadas immediately withdrew his hand and fell back. Surapadman's mouth was half open. The ancient Vedic hymns on death claim that the soul leaves the body along with the last breath. Therefore, the mouth is open at the point of death. But there is a superstition that the mouth should be closed quickly after death, lest an evil spirit enters a soulless body. Karthik closed Surapadman's mouth gently. Find the chief Brahmin, said Karthik. Prepare Surapadman's body. He shall be cremated like the prince that he was. Devadas nodded. Karthik turned to Bhagirath. We shall wait till my brother returns. Surapadman will then be cremated with full state honors. Ganesh stood at the ramparts of the Magadan fort, watching the great Sarayu merge into the mighty Ganga. The setting sun had tinged the waters a brilliant orange. King Mahindra and the citizens of Magad, stunned by the complete annihilation of their army and the death of their prince Surapadban, had surrendered meekly when Ganesha's forces had entered the city. He did not expect any rebellion, since there were practically no soldiers left in Magad. Ganesh planned to leave a small force of 10,000 soldiers to man the fort and blockade any Ayodhya ships. He would sail out with his other soldiers to meet with his father's army in Meluha. They were to leave the next day. The war in Swadweep had worked perfectly for Ganesh. He was now able to block the movements of the Ayodhyan army with far less soldiers than would have been required if he was besieging Ayodhya itself. What are you thinking, Dada? asked Karthik. Ganesh smiled at his brother as he pointed at the confluence. Look at the Sangam where the Sarayu meets the Ganga. Even before he turned his gaze, Karthik could hear the swirling waters of the Sangam. What he saw was a young, impetuous Sarayu crashing into the mature, tranquil Ganga, jostling for space within her banks. Though she sometimes relented, the Ganga would often push aside the waters of the Sarayu with surprising ease, creating eddies and currents in its wake. This jostling continued till Ganga, the Eternal Mother, eventually drew their boolean tributary into her bosom till they could be distinguished no more in the calm flow. 
There is always unity at the end, said Ganesh, and it brings a new tranquility. But the meeting of two worlds causes a lot of temporary chaos, Karthik smiled, bemused. This could not have been avoided, said Ganesh, but the stricken visage of King Mahindra was heartbreaking. Every single house in Magadh has lost a son or a daughter in the battle of Balatibal. But King Mahindra was the one who had forced Prince Surapadman to attack. He can only blame himself, said Karthik. I've heard reports that Prince Surapadman had really wanted to remain neutral. That may be true, Karthik, but that still doesn't take away from the fact that we have killed half the adult population of Magadh. We had no choice, Tada, said Karthik. I know that, said Ganesh, turning back to look at the Sangam of the Ganga and the Sarayu. The rivers fight with each other with the only currency that they know. Water. We humans fight with the only currency that we know in this age. Violence. But how else does one establish one's standpoint, Dada? asked Karthik. There are times when reason does not work and peaceful efforts prove inadequate. Violence is ultimately the last resort. That is the way it has always been. The world will, perhaps, never be any different. Ganesh shook his head. It will be one day. We live in the age of the Kshatriya. That's why we think that the only currency to bring about change is violence. Age of the Kshatriya? I've never heard of that. You would have heard of the four yugs, psychical eras that time traverses repeatedly through a never-ending loop. The Satyug, Tretayug, Dwaparyug and Kalyug. Yes? Within each of these yugs, there are smaller cycles dominated by different caste professions. There is the age of the Brahmin, of the Kshatriya, of the Vaishya and of the Shudra. Age of the Brahmin, Dada. I haven't heard of that either. Sure you have. All of us have been told stories of the Prajapati, of a time of magic, Karthik smiled. Of course, knowledge seems like magic to the ignorant. Yes, the main currency of the age of the Brahmin was knowledge. And in our age, it is violence. Some philosophers believe that after our epoch will be the age of the Vaishya. And the people in that age will not use violence to establish their writ? Violence will never die, Karthik. Neither will knowledge. But they will not be the determining factors, since it will be an age dominated by the age of the Vaishya, which is profit. They will use money. I can't imagine a world like that, Tata. It will come. I pray that it doesn't take too long. Not that I'm afraid of violence, but it leaves too many grieving hearts in its wake. Dada, even if I do believe that such a time will come, are you saying that money will cause less devastation than violence? Will there not be winners and losers even then? Will sadness disappear? Ganesh raised his eyebrows, surprised. He smiled and patted his brother on his back. You're right. There will always be winners and losers. But that is the way of the world. Karthik put his arm around his brother's waist as Ganesh put his arm around Karthik's shoulders. But that still doesn't take away from the grief of knowing that we have caused suffering to others. This may sound strange to you, said Shiva, reclining in the comfort of the Lothal governor's residence. But I feel as if I've come home. Meluha is where my journey began. Just as Kali had expected, the Lothal governor, Janadhwaj, had broken ranks with Maluhan nobility and opened the doors of his city for Shiva's army, pledging loyalty to the Nilkant. And this is where it'll end, said Sati. Then we can all go and live in Kailash. Shiva smiled. Kailash is not as idyllic as you imagine. It's a difficult, barren land. But you will be there. That'll make it heaven for me. Shiva laughed, bent forward and kissed his wife lovingly, holding her close. But first, we need to deal with those who defend the evil Somras, said Sati. That has already begun with the defeat of the Magadans. Hmm, that's true. We can easily blockade the Ayodhya navy, now that Magad is firmly in our control. When will Ganesh and Karthik leave for Meluha? They have left already. And when do we leave for Nitikavati? In a few days. Sati had learned to recognize the resolute expression Shiva now wore and couldn't help feeling a twinge of anxiety for her homeland. For their own sake, I hope they surrender. I hope so too.
Chapter 25 God or Country